Chapter Thirteen of the Old Regime in Canada by Francis Parkman, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section Third, The Colony and the King, Chapter Thirteen, sixteen sixty one to sixteen sixty five, Royal Intervention. Leave Canada behind, cross the sea, and stand on an evening in June by the edge of the forest at Fontainebleau. Beyond the broad gardens, above the long ranges of moonlit trees, rise the walls and pinnacles of the vast chateau, a shrine of history, the gorgeous monument of lines of vanished kings, haunted with memories of Capet, Valois, and Bourbon. There was little thought of the past at Fontainebleau, in june 1661 the present was too dazzling and too intoxicating the future too radiant with hope and promise it was the morning of a new reign the son of louis the fourteenth was rising in splendor and the rank and beauty of france were gathered to pay it homage a youthful court a youthful king a pomp and magnificence such as Europe had never seen, a delirium of ambition, pleasure, and love. All this wrought in many a young heart an enchantment destined to be cruelly broken. Even old courtiers felt the fascination of the scene, and tell us of the music at evening by the borders of the lake, of the gay groups that strolled under the shadowing trees floated in gilded barges on the still water or moved slowly in open carriages around its borders here was anne of austria the king's mother and marie therese his tender and jealous queen his brother the duke of orleans with his bride of sixteen henriette of england and his favorite that vicious butterfly of the court the Count de Quiche. Here, too, were the humbled chiefs of the civil war, Beaufort and Condé, obsequious before their triumphant master, Louis the Fourteenth, the centre of all eyes in the flush of health and vigour, and the pride of new-fledged royalty, stood, as he still stands on the canvas of Philippe de Champagne, attired in a splendor which would have been effeminate but for the stately port of the youth who wore it fortune had been strangely bountiful to louis the fourteenth the nations of france exhausted by wars and dissensions looked upon him with respect and fear among weak and weary neighbors he alone was strong the death of mazarin had released him from tutelage feudalism in the person of conde was abject before him he had reduced his parliaments to submission and in the arrest of the ambitious prodigal fouquet he was preparing a crushing blow to the financial corruption which had devoured france nature had formed him to act the part of king even his critics and enemies praised the grace and majesty of his presence, and he impressed his courtiers with an admiration which seems to have been to an astonishing degree genuine. He carried airs of royalty even into his pleasures, and while his example corrupted all France, he proceeded to the apartments of Montespan or Fontange, with the majestic gravity of olympian jove he was a devout observer of the forms of religion and as the buoyancy of youth passed away his zeal was stimulated by a profound fear of the devil mazarin had reared him in ignorance but his faculties were excellent in their way and in a private station would have made him an efficient man of business the vivacity of his passions and his inordinate love of pleasure were joined to a persistent will and a rare power of labor 
the vigorous mediocrity of his understanding delighted in grappling with details his astonished courtiers saw him take on himself the burden of administration and work at it without relenting for more than half a century great as was his energy his pride was far greater as king by divine right he felt himself raised immeasurably above the highest of his subjects but while vindicating with unparalleled haughtiness his claims to supreme authority he was at the outset filled with a sense of the duties of his high place and fired by an ambition to make his reign beneficent to france as well as glorious to himself above all rulers of modern times louis the fourteenth was the embodiment of the monarchical idea the famous words ascribed to him i am the state were probably never uttered but they perfectly express his spirit it is god's will he wrote in sixteen sixty six that whoever is born a subject should not reason but obey and those around him were of his mind the state is in the king said bossuet the great mouthpiece of monarchy the will of the people is merged in his will o kings put forth your power boldly for it is divine and salutary to humankind for a few brief years this king's reign was indeed salutary to france his judgment of men when not obscured by his pride and his passion for flattery was good and he had at his service the generals and statesmen formed in the freer and bolder epoch that had ended with his accession among them was jean baptiste colbert formerly the intendant of mazarin's household a man whose energies matched his talents and who had preserved his rectitude in the midst of corruption it was a hard task that colbert imposed upon his proud and violent nature to serve the imperious king morbidly jealous of his authority and resolved to accept no initiative but his own he must counsel while seeming to receive counsel and lead while seeming to follow the new minister bent himself to the task and the nation reaped the profit a vast system of reform was set in action amid the outcries of nobles financiers churchmen and all who profited by abuses the methods of this reform were trenchant and sometimes violent and its principles were not always in accord with those of modern economic science but the good that resulted was incalculable the burdens of the laboring classes were lightened the public revenues increased and the wholesale plunder of the public money was arrested with a strong hand laws were reformed and codified feudal tyranny which still subsisted in many quarters was repressed agriculture and productive industry of all kinds were encouraged roads and canals opened trade was stimulated a commercial marine created and a powerful navy formed as if by magic it is in his commercial industrial and colonial policy that the profound defects of the great minister's system are most apparent it was a system of authority monopoly and exclusion in which the government and not the individual acted always the foremost part upright incorruptible ardent for the public good inflexible arrogant and domineering he sought to drive france into paths of prosperity and create colonies by the energy of an imperial will he feared and with reason that the want of enterprise and capital among the merchants would prevent the broad and immediate results at which he aimed and to secure these results he established a series of great trading corporations in which the principles of privilege and exclusion were pushed to their utmost limits prominent 
among them was the company of the west the king signed the edict creating it on the twenty fourth of may sixteen sixty four any person in the kingdom or out of it might become a partner by subscribing within a certain time not less than three thousand francs france was a mere patch on the map compared to the vast domains of the new association western africa from cape verde to the cape of good hope south america between the amazon and the orinoco cayenne the antilles and all new france from hudson's bay to virginia and florida were bestowed on it forever to be held of the crown in the simple condition of faith and homage as according to the edict the glory of god was the chief object in view the company was required to supply its possessions with a sufficient number of priests and diligently to exclude all teachers of false doctrine it was empowered to build forts and warships cast cannon wage war make peace establish courts appoint judges and otherwise to act as sovereign within its own domains a monopoly of trade was granted it for forty years sugar from the antilles and furs from canada were the chief source of expected profit and africa was to supply the slaves to raise the sugar scarcely was the grand machine set in motion when its directors betrayed a narrowness and blindness of policy which boded the enterprise no good canada was a chief sufferer once more bound hand and foot she was handed over to a selfish league of merchants monopoly in trade monopoly in religion monopoly in government nobody but the company had a right to bring her the necessaries of life and nobody but the company had a right to exercise the traffic which alone could give her the means of paying for these necessaries moreover the supplies which it brought were insufficient and the prices which it demanded were exorbitant it was throttling its wretched victim the canadian merchants remonstrated it was clear that if the colony was to live the system must be changed and a change was accordingly ordered the company gave up its monopoly of the fur trade but reserved the right to levy a duty of one-fourth of the beaver skins and one-tenth of the moose skins and it also reserved the entire trade of tadoussac that is to say the trade of all the tribes between the lower st lawrence and hudson's bay it retained besides the exclusive right of transporting furs in its own ships thus controlling the commerce of canada and discouraging or rather extinguishing the enterprise of canadian merchants on its part it was required to pay governors judges and all the colonial officials out of the duties which it levied yet the king had the prosperity of canada at heart and he proceeded to show his interest in her after a manner hardly consistent with his late action in handing her over to a mercenary guardian in fact he acted as if she had still remained under his paternal care he had just conferred the right of naming a governor and intendant upon the new company but he now assumed it himself the company with a just sense of its own unfitness readily consenting to this suspension of one of its most important privileges daniel de remy sieur de courcelles was appointed governor and jean baptiste talon intendant the nature of this duplicate government will appear hereafter but before appointing rulers for canada the king had appointed a representative of the crown for all his american domains the marechal d'estrade had for some time held the title of viceroy for america as he could not fulfil the duties of that office being at that time ambassador in holland 
the marquis de tracy was sent in his place with the title of lieutenant-general canada at this time was an object of very considerable attention at court and especially in what was known as the parti de vote the relations of the jesuits appealing equally to the spirit of religion and the spirit of romantic adventure had for more than a quarter of a century been the favourite reading of the devout and the visit of laval at court had greatly stimulated the interest they had kindled the letters of argenson and especially of avogour had shown the vast political possibilities of the young colony and opened a vista of future glories alike for church and king so when tracy set sail he found no lack of followers a throng of young nobles embarked with him eager to explore the marvels and mysteries of the western world the king gave him two hundred soldiers of the regiment of carignan salieres and promised that a thousand more should follow after spending more than a year in the west indies where as mother mary of the incarnation expresses it he performed marvels and reduced everybody to obedience he at length sailed up the st lawrence and on the thirtieth of june sixteen sixty five anchored in the basin of quebec the broad white standard blazoned with the arms of france proclaimed the representative of royalty and point levy and cape diamond and the distant cape torment roared back the sound of the saluting cannon all quebec was on the ramparts or at the landing-place and all eyes were strained at the two vessels as they slowly emptied their crowded decks into the boats alongside the boats at length drew near and the lieutenant-general and his suite landed on the quay with a pomp such as quebec had never seen before tracy was a veteran of sixty-two portly and tall one of the largest men i ever saw writes mother mary but he was sallow with disease for fever had seized him and it had fared ill with him on the long voyage the chevalier de chaumont walked at his side and young nobles surrounded him gorgeous in lace and ribbons and majestic in leonine wigs twenty-four guards in the king's livery led the way followed by four pages and six valets and thus while the frenchmen shouted and the indians stared the august procession threaded the streets of the lower town and climbed the steep pathway that scaled the cliffs above breathing hard they reached the top passed on the left the dilapidated walls of the fort and the shed of mingled wood and masonry which then bore the name of the castle of st louis passed on the right the old house of coillard and the site of laval's new seminary and soon reached the square betwixt the jesuit college and the cathedral the bells were ringing in a frenzy of welcome laval in pontificals surrounded by priests and jesuits stood waiting to receive the deputy of the king and as he greeted tracy and offered him the holy water he looked with anxious curiosity to see what manner of man he was the signs were auspicious the deportment of the lieutenant-general left nothing to desire a prix dieu had been placed for him he declined it they offered him a cushion but he would not have it and fevered as he was he knelt on the bare pavement with a devotion that edified every beholder te deum was sung and a day of rejoicing followed there was good cause canada it was plain was not to be wholly abandoned to a trading company louis the fourteenth was resolved that a new france should be added to the old soldiers settlers horses sheep cattle young women for wives were all sent out in abundance by his paternal benignity before the season was over 
about two thousand persons had landed at quebec at the royal charge at length writes mother juchereau our joy was completed by the arrival of two vessels with monsieur de courcelles our governor monsieur talon our intendant and the last companies of the regiment of carignan more state and splendor more young nobles more guards and valets for courcelles too says the same chronicler had a superb train and monsieur talon who naturally loves glory forgot nothing which could do honour to the king thus a sunbeam from the court fell for a moment on the rock of quebec yet all was not sunshine for the voyage had been a tedious one and disease had broken out in the ships that which bore talon had been a hundred and seventeen days at sea and others were hardly more fortunate the hospital was crowded with the sick so too were the church and the neighbouring houses and the nuns were so spent with their labours that seven of them were brought to the point of death the priests were busied in converting the huguenots a number of whom were detected among the soldiers and emigrants one of them proved refractory declaring with oaths that he would never renounce his faith falling dangerously ill he was carried to the hospital where mother catherine de saint augustin bethought her of a plan of conversion she ground to a powder a small piece of a bone of father brebeuf the jesuit martyr and secretly mixed the sacred dust with the patient's gruel whereupon says mother juchereau this intractable man forthwith became gentle as an angel begged to be instructed embraced the faith and abjured his errors publicly with an admirable fervour two or three years before the church of quebec had received as a gift from the pope the bodies or bones of two saints saint flavian and saint felicite they were enclosed in four large coffers or reliquaries and a grand procession was now ordered in their honour tracy courcelles talon and the agent of the company bore the canopy of the host then came the four coffers on four decorated litters carried by the principal ecclesiastics laval followed in pontificals forty-seven priests and a long file of officers nobles soldiers and inhabitants followed the precious relics amid the sound of music and the roar of cannon it is a ravishing thing says mother mary to see how marvellously exact is monsieur de tracy at all these holy ceremonies where he is always the first to come for he would not lose a single moment of them he has been seen in church for six hours together without once going out but while the lieutenant-general thus edified the colony he betrayed no lack of qualities equally needful in his position in canada as in the west indies he showed both vigour and conduct first of all he had been ordered to subdue or destroy the iroquois and the regiment of carignan salieres was the weapon placed in his hands for this end four companies of this corps had arrived early in the season four more came with tracy more yet with salieres their colonel and now the number was complete as with slouched hat and plume bandolier and shouldered firelock these bronzed veterans of the turkish wars marched at the tap of drum through the narrow street or mounted the rugged way that led up to the fort the inhabitants gazed with a sense of profound relief tame indians from the neighbouring missions wild indians from the woods stared in silent wonder at their new defenders their numbers their discipline their uniform and their martial bearing filled the savage beholders with admiration carignan salieres was the first regiment of regular troops ever sent to america by the french government it was raised in savoy by the prince of carignan in 1644 but was soon employed in the service of france 
where in 1662 it took a conspicuous part on the side of the king in the battle with Condé and the Fronde at the Port Saint Antoine. After the peace of the Pyrenees, the Prince of Carignan, unable to support the regiment, gave it to the king, and it was for the first time incorporated into the French armies. In 1664, it distinguished itself as part of the Allied force of France in the Austrian war against the Turks. In the next year, it was ordered to America, along with the fragment of a regiment formed of Germans, the whole being placed under the command of Colonel de Salieres, hence its double name. Fifteen heretics were discovered in its ranks and quickly converted. Then the new crusade was preached. The crusade against the Iroquois, enemies of God and tools of the devil. The soldiers and the people were filled with a zeal half warlike and half religious. They are made to understand, writes Mother Mary, that this is a holy war, all for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. The fathers are doing wonders in inspiring them with true sentiments of piety and devotion. Fully five hundred soldiers have taken the scapulary of the Holy Virgin. It is we, the Ursulines, who make them. It is a real pleasure to do such work and she proceeds to relate a beau miracle by which God made known his satisfaction at the fervour of his military servants. The secular motives for the war were in themselves strong enough, for the growth of the colony absolutely demanded the cessation of Iroquois raids, and the French had begun to learn the lesson that in the case of hostile Indians no good can come of attempts to conciliate unless respect is first imposed by a sufficient castigation. It is true that the writers of the time paint Iroquois hostilities in their worst colours. In the innumerable letters which Mother Mary of the Incarnation sent home every autumn by the returning ships, she spared no means to gain the sympathy and aid of the devout, and with similar motives the Jesuits in their printed relations took care to extenuate nothing of the miseries which the pious colony endured. Avogor, too, in urging the sending out of a strong force to fortify and hold the country, had advised that, in order to furnish a pretext and disarm the jealousy of the English and Dutch, exaggerated accounts should be given of danger from the side of the savage confederates, Yet with every allowance, these dangers and sufferings were sufficiently great. The three upper nations of the Iroquois were comparatively pacific, but the two lower nations, the Mohawks and the Oneidas, were persistently hostile, making inroads into the colony by way of Lake Champlain and the Richelieu, murdering and scalping, and then vanishing like ghosts. Tracy's first step was to send a strong detachment to the Richelieu to build a picket fort below the rapids of Chambly, which take their name from that of the officer in command. An officer named Sorel soon afterwards built a second fort on the site of the abandoned palisade work built by Montmagny at the mouth of the river where the town of Sorel now stands and Salieres, colonel of the regiment, added a third fort, two or three leagues above Chambly. These forts could not wholly bar the passage against the nimble and wily warriors who might pass them in the night, shouldering their canoes through the woods. A blow, direct and hard, was needed, and Tracy prepared to strike it. Late in the season, an embassy from the three upper nations the Onondagas, Cayugas, and Senecas arrived at Quebec, led by Garaconti, a famous chief whom the Jesuits had won over, and who proved ever after a staunch friend of the French. They brought back the brave Charles Le Moyne of Montreal, whom they had captured some three months before, and now restored as a peace offering, taking credit to themselves that not even one of his nails had been torn out nor any part of his body burnt. 
Garaconti made a peace speech, which, as rendered by the Jesuits, was an admirable specimen of Iroquois eloquence. But while joining hands with him and his companions, the French still urged on their preparations to chastise the contumacious Mohawks. End of chapter 13「1619 1667 The Mohawks Chastised The governor, Courcel, says Father Le Mercier, breathed nothing but war, and was bent on immediate action. He was for the present subordinate to Tracy, who, however, forbore to cool his ardor and allowed him to proceed. The result was an enterprise bold to rashness. Courcel, with about five hundred men, prepared to march in the depth of a Canadian winter to the Mohawk towns, a distance estimated at three hundred leagues. Those who knew the country vainly urged the risks and difficulties of the attempt the adventurous governor held fast to his purpose and only waited till the st lawrence should be well frozen early in january it was a solid floor and on the ninth the march began officers and men stopped at sillery and knelt in the little mission chapel before the shrine of st michael to ask the protection and aid of the warlike archangel. Then they resumed their course, and, with their snowshoes tied at their backs, walked with difficulty and toil over the bare and slippery ice. A keen wind swept the river, and the fierce cold gnawed them to the bone. Ears, noses, fingers, hands, and knees were frozen, some fell in torpor and were dragged on by their comrades to the shivering bivouac when after a march of ninety miles they reached three rivers a considerable number were disabled and had to be left behind but others joined them from the garrison and they set out again ascending the richelieu and passing the new forts at sorel and chambly they reached at the end of the month the third fort, called St. Therese. On the 30th they left it and continued their march up the frozen stream. About 200 of them were Canadians, and of these 70 were old Indian fighters from Montreal, versed in woodcraft, seasoned to the climate, and trained among dangers and alarms. Courcel, quickly learned their value, and his blue coats, as he called them, were always placed in the van. Here, wrapped in their coarse blue capotes, with blankets and provisions strapped at their backs, they strode along on snowshoes, which recent storms had made indispensable. The regulars followed as they could. They were not yet the tough and experienced woodsmen that they and their descendants afterwards became, and their snowshoes embarrassed them, burdened as they were with the heavy loads which all carried alike, from Courcel to the lowest private. Lake Champlain lay glaring in the winter sun, a sheet of spotless snow, and the wavy ridges of the Adirondacks bordered the dazzling landscape with the cold grey of their denuded forests. The long procession of weary men crept slowly on under the lee of the shore, and when night came they bivouacked by squads among the trees, dug away the snow with their snowshoes, piled it in a bank around them, built their fire in the middle, and crouched about it on beds of spruce or hemlock, while as they lay close-packed for mutual warmth, the winter sky arched them like a vault of burnished steel, sparkling with the cold diamond luster of its myriads of stars. 
this arctic serenity of the elements was varied at times by heavy snowstorms and before they reached their journey's end the earth and the ice were buried to the unusual depth of four feet from lake champlain they passed to lake george and the frigid glories of its snow-wrapped mountains thence crossed to the hudson and groped their way through the woods in search of the mohawk towns they soon went astray for thirty algonquins whom they had taken as guides had found the means of a grand debauch at fort st therese drunk themselves into helplessness and lingered behind thus courcel and his men mistook the path and marching by way of saratoga lake and long lake found themselves on saturday the twentieth of february close to the little dutch hamlet of corlaire or schenectady here the chief man in authority told them that most of the mohawks and oneidas had gone to war with another tribe they however caught a few stragglers and had a smart skirmish with a party of warriors losing an officer and several men half frozen and half starved they encamped in the neighboring woods where on sunday three envoys appeared from albany to demand why they had invaded the territories of his royal highness the duke of york it was now that they learned for the first time that the new netherlands had passed into english hands a change which boded no good to canada the envoys seemed to take their explanations in good part made them a present of wine and provisions and allowed them to buy further supplies from the dutch of schenectady they even invited them to enter the village but courcel declined partly because the place could not hold them all and partly because he feared that his men once seated in a chimney corner could never be induced to leave it their position was cheerless enough for the vast beds of snow around them were soaking slowly under a sullen rain and there was danger that the lakes might thaw and cut off their retreat ye mohawks says the english report of the affair were all gone to their castles with resolutions to fight it out against the french who being refreshed and supplied with the aforesaid provisions made a show of marching towards the mohawks castles but with faces about and great silence and diligence returned towards canada surely observes the narrator so bold and hardy an attempt hath not happened in any age the end hardly answered to the beginning the retreat which began on sunday night was rather precipitate the mohawks hovered about their rear and took a few prisoners but famine and cold proved more deadly foes and sixty men perished before they reached the shelter of fort st therese on the eighth of march courcel came to the neighboring fort of st louis or chambly here he found the jesuit albanel acting as chaplain and being in great ill humor he charged him with causing the failure of the expedition by detaining the algonquin guides this singular notion took such possession of him that when a few days after he met the jesuit fremin at three rivers he embraced him ironically saying at the same time my father i am the unluckiest gentleman in the world and you and the rest of you are the cause of it the pious tracy and the prudent talon tried to disarm his suspicions and with such success that he gave up an intention he had entertained of discarding his jesuit confessor and forgot or forgave the imagined wrong unfortunate as this expedition was it produced a strong effect on the iroquois by convincing them that their forest homes were no safe asylum from french attacks in may the senecas sent an embassy of peace and the other nations including the mohawks soon followed tracy on his part sent the jesuit bechefer to learn on the spot the real temper of the savages 
and ascertain whether peace could safely be made with them the jesuit was scarcely gone when news came that a party of officers hunting near the outlet of lake champlain had been set upon by the mohawks and that seven of them had been captured or killed among the captured was lerolles a cousin of tracy and among the killed was a young gentleman named chezy his nephew on this the jesuit envoy was recalled twenty-four iroquois deputies were seized and imprisoned and sorel captain in the regiment of carignan was sent with three hundred men to chastise the perfidious mohawks if as it seems he was expected to attack their fortified towns or castles as the english called them his force was too small this time however there was no fighting at two days from his journey's end sorel met the famous chief called the flemish bastard bringing back lerolles and his fellow captives and charged as he alleged to offer full satisfaction for the murder of chezy sorel believed him retraced his course and with the bastard in his train returned to quebec quebec was full of iroquois deputies all bent on peace or pretending to be so on the last day of august there was a grand council in the garden of the jesuits some days later tracy invited the flemish bastard and a mohawk chief named agriata to his table when allusion was made to the murder of chezy on this the mohawk stretching out his arm exclaimed in a braggart tone this is the hand that split the head of that young man the indignation of the company may be imagined tracy told his insolent guest that he should never kill anybody else and he was led out and hanged in presence of the bastard there was no more talk of peace tracy prepared to march in person against the mohawks with all the force of canada on the day of the exaltation of the cross for whose glory says the chronicler this expedition is undertaken tracy and courcel left quebec with thirteen hundred men they crossed lake champlain and launched their boats again on the waters of saint sacrament now lake george it was the first of the warlike pageants that have made that fair scene historic october had begun and the romantic wilds breathed the buoyant life of the most inspiring of american seasons when the blue jay screams from the woods the wild duck splashes along the lake and the echoes of distant mountains prolong the quavering cry of the loon when weather-stained rocks are plumed with the fiery crimson of the sumac the claret hues of young oaks the amber and scarlet of the maple and the sober purple of the ash or when gleams of sunlight shot aslant through the rents of cool autumnal clouds chase fitfully along the glowing sides of painted mountains amid this gorgeous euthanasia of the dying season the three hundred boats and canoes trailed in long procession up the lake threaded the labyrinth of the narrows that sylvan fairyland of tufted islets and quiet waters and landed at length where fort william henry was afterwards built about a hundred miles of forests swamps rivers and mountains still lay between them and the mohawk towns there seems to have been an indian path for this was the ordinary route of the mohawk and oneida war parties but the path was narrow broken full of gullies and pitfalls crossed by streams and in one place interrupted by a lake which they passed on rafts a hundred and ten blue coats of montreal led the way under charles le moyne repentigny commanded the levies from quebec in all there were six hundred canadians six hundred regulars and a hundred indians from the missions who ranged the woods in front flank and rear like hounds on the scent red or white canadians or regulars all were full of zeal 
it seems to them writes mother mary that they are going to lay siege to paradise and win it and enter in because they are fighting for religion and the faith their ardor was rudely tried officers as well as men carried loads at their backs whence ensued a large blister on the shoulders of the chevalier de chaumont in no way used to such burdens tracy old heavy and infirm was inopportunely seized with the gout a swiss soldier tried to carry him on his shoulders across a rapid stream but midway his strength failed and he was barely able to deposit his ponderous load on a rock a huron came to his aid and bore tracy safely to the farther bank courcelle was attacked with cramps and had to be carried for a time like his commander provisions gave out and men and officers grew faint with hunger the montreal soldiers had for chaplain a sturdy priest dolier de casson as large as tracy and far stronger for the incredible story is told of him that when in good condition he could hold two men seated on his extended hands now however he was equal to no such exploit being not only deprived of food but also of sleep by the necessity of listening at night to the confessions of his pious flock and his shoes too had failed him nothing remaining but the upper leather which gave him little comfort among the sharp stones he bore up manfully being by nature brave and light-hearted and when a servant of the jesuits fell into the water he threw off his cassock and leapt after him his strength gave out and the man was drowned but a grateful jesuit led him aside and requited his efforts with a morsel of bread a wood of chestnut trees full of nuts at length stayed the hunger of the famished troops it was saint Teresa's day when they approached the lower mohawk towns a storm of wind and rain set in but anxious to surprise the enemy they pushed on all night amid the moan and roar of the forest over slippery logs tangled roots and oozy mosses under dripping boughs and through saturated bushes this time there was no want of good guides and when in the morning they issued from the forest they saw amid its cornfields the palisades of the indian stronghold they had two small pieces of cannon brought from the lakes by relays of men but they did not stop to use them their twenty drums beat the charge and they advanced to seize the place by coup de main luckily for them a panic had seized the indians not that they were taken by surprise for they had discovered the approaching french and two days before had sent away their women and children in preparation for a desperate fight but the din of the drums which they took for so many devils in the french service and the armed men advancing from the rocks and thickets in files that seemed interminable so wrought on the scared imagination of the warriors that they fled in terror to their next town a short distance above tracy lost no time but hastened in pursuit a few mohawks were seen on the hills yelling and firing too far for effect repentini at the risk of his scalp climbed a neighbouring height and looked down on the little army which seemed so numerous as it passed beneath that writes the superior of the ursulines he told me that he thought the good angels must have joined with it whereat he stood amazed the second town or fort was taken as easily as the first so too were the third and the fourth the indians yelled and fled without killing a man and still the troops pursued following the broad trail which led from town to town along the valley of the mohawk it was late in the afternoon when the fourth town was entered and tracy thought that his work was done but an algonquin squaw who had followed her husband to the war and who had once been a prisoner among the mohawks told him that there was still another above 
the sun was near its setting and the men were tired with their pitiless marching but again the order was given to advance the eager squaw showed the way holding a pistol in one hand and leading courcelle with the other and they soon came in sight of andarac the largest and strongest of the mohawk forts the drums beat with fury and the troops prepared to attack but there were none to oppose them the scouts sent forward reported that the warriors had fled the last of the savage strongholds was in the hands of the french god has done for us says mother mary what he did in ancient days for his chosen people striking terror into our enemies insomuch that we were victors without a blow certain it is that there is miracle in all this for if the iroquois had stood fast they would have given us a great deal of trouble and caused our army great loss seeing how they were fortified and armed and how haughty and bold they are the french were astonished as they looked about them these iroquois forts were very different from those that jogues had seen here twenty years before or from that which in earlier times set champlain and his hurons at defiance the mohawks had had counsel and aid from their dutch friends and adapted their savage defences to the rules of european art andarac was a quadrangle formed of a triple palisade twenty feet high and flanked by four bastions large vessels of bark filled with water were placed on the platforms of the palisade for defence against fire the dwellings which these fortifications enclosed were in many cases built of wood though the form and arrangement of the primitive bark lodge of the iroquois seems to have been preserved some of the wooden houses were a hundred and twenty feet long with fires for eight or nine families here and in subterranean caches was stored a prodigious quantity of indian corn and other provisions and all the dwellings were supplied with carpenters tools domestic utensils and many other appliances of comfort the only living things in andarac when the french entered were two old women a small boy and a decrepit old man who being frightened by the noise of the drums had hidden himself under a canoe from them the victors learned that the mohawks retreating from the other towns had gathered here resolved to fight to the last but at sight of the troops their courage failed and the chief was first to run crying out let us save ourselves brother the whole world is coming against us a cross was planted and at its side the royal arms the troops were drawn up in battle array when jean baptiste de bois an officer deputed by tracy advancing sword in hand to the front proclaimed in a loud voice that he took possession in the name of the king of all the country of the mohawks and the troops shouted three times vive la roy that night a mighty bonfire illumined the mohawk forests and the scared savages from their hiding places among the rocks saw their palisades their dwellings their stores of food and all their possessions turned to cinders and ashes the two old squaws captured in the town threw themselves in despair into the flames of their blazing homes when morning came there was nothing left of andarac but smouldering embers rolling their pale smoke against the painted background of the october woods te deum was sung and mass said and then the victors began their backward march burning as they went all the remaining forts with all their hoarded stores of corn except such as they needed for themselves if they had failed to destroy their enemies in battle they hoped that winter and famine would do the work of shot and steel while there was distress among the mohawks there was trouble among their english neighbours who claimed as their own the country which tracy had invaded the english authorities were the more disquieted because they feared that the lately conquered Dutch might join hands with the French against them. When Nichols, governor of New York, 
heard of tracy's advance he wrote to the governors of the new england colonies begging them to join him against the french invaders and urging that if tracy's force were destroyed or captured the conquest of canada would be an easy task there was war at the time between the two crowns and the british court had already entertained this project of conquest and sent orders to its colonies to that effect but the new england governors ill prepared for war and fearing that their indian neighbors who were enemies of the mohawks might take part with the french hesitated to act and the affair ended in a correspondence civil if not sincere between nichols and tracy the treaty of breda in the following year secured peace for a time between the rival colonies the return of tracy was less fortunate than his advance the rivers swollen by autumn rains were difficult to pass and in crossing lake champlain two canoes were overset in a storm and eight men were drowned from st anne a new fort built early in the summer on ile la motte near the northern end of the lake he sent news of his success to quebec where there was great rejoicing and a solemn thanksgiving signs and prodigies had not been wanting to attest the interest of the upper and nether powers in the crusade against the myrmidons of hell at one of the forts on the richelieu the soldiers says mother mary were near dying of fright they saw a great fiery cavern in the sky and from this cavern came plaintive voices mixed with frightful howlings perhaps it was the demons enraged because we had depopulated a country where they had been masters so long and had said mass and sung the praises of god in a place where there had never before been anything but foulness and abomination tracy had at first meant to abandon fort st anne but he changed his mind after returning to quebec meanwhile the season had grown so late that there was no time to send proper supplies to the garrison winter closed and the place was not only ill provisioned but was left without a priest tracy wrote to the superior of the sulpicians at montreal to send one without delay but the request was more easily made than fulfilled for he forgot to order an escort and the way was long and dangerous the stout-hearted dolier de casson was told however to hold himself ready to go at the first opportunity his recent campaigning had left him in no condition for braving fresh hardships for he was nearly disabled by a swelling on one of his knees by way of cure he resolved to try a severe bleeding and the sangrado of montreal did his work so thoroughly that his patient fainted under his hands as he returned to consciousness he became aware that two soldiers had entered the room they told him that they were going in the morning to chambly which was on the way to st anne and they invited him to go with them wait till the day after to-morrow replied the priest and i will try the delay was obtained and on the day fixed the party set out by the forest path to chambly a distance of about four leagues when they reached it dolier de casson was nearly spent but he concealed his plight from the commanding officer and begged an escort to st anne some twenty leagues further as the officer would not give him one he threatened to go alone on which ten men and an ensign were at last ordered to conduct him thus attended he resumed his journey after a day's rest one of the soldiers fell through the ice and none of his comrades dared help him dolier de casson making the sign of the cross went to his aid and more successful than on the former occasion caught him and pulled him out the snow was deep and the priest having arrived in the preceding summer had never before worn snowshoes while a sack of clothing and his portable chapel which he carried at his back joined to the pain of his knee and the effects of his late bleeding made the march a purgatory he was sorely needed at fort st anne 
there was pestilence in the garrison two men had just died without absolution while more were at the point of death and praying for a priest thus it happened that when the sentinel descried far off on the ice of lake champlain a squad of soldiers approaching and among them a black cassock every officer and man not sick or on duty came out with one accord to meet the newcomer they overwhelmed him with welcome and with thanks one took his sack another his portable chapel and they led him in triumph to the fort first he made a short prayer then went his rounds among the sick and then came to refresh himself with the officers here was la motte de la lucière the commandant la durante a name destined to be famous in canadian annals and a number of young subalterns the scene was no strange one to dollier de casson for he had been an officer of cavalry in his time and fought under turenne a good soldier without doubt at the mess-table or in the field and none the worse a priest that he had once followed the wars he was of a lively humour given to jests and mirth as pleasant a father as ever said benedicte the soldier and the gentleman still lived under the cassock of the priest he was greatly respected and beloved and his influence as a peacemaker which he often had occasion to exercise is said to have been remarkable when the time demanded it he could use arguments more cogent than those of moral suasion once in a camp of algonquins when as he was kneeling in prayer an insolent savage came to interrupt him the father without rising knocked the intruder flat by a blow of his fist and the other indians far from being displeased were filled with admiration at the exploit his cheery temper now stood him in good stead for there was dreary work before him and he was not the man to flinch from it the garrison of st anne had nothing to live on but salt pork and half-spoiled flour their hogshead of vinegar had sprung a leak and the contents had all oozed out they had rejoiced in the supposed possession of a reasonable stock of brandy but they soon discovered that the sailors on the voyage from france had emptied the casks and filled them again with salt water the scurvy broke out with fury in a short time forty out of the sixty men became victims of the loathsome malady day or night dollier de casson and forestier the equally devoted young surgeon had no rest the surgeon's strength failed and the priest was himself slightly attacked with the disease eleven men died and others languished for want of help for their comrades shrank from entering the infected dens where they lay in their extremity some of them devised an ingenious expedient though they had nothing to bequeath they made wills in which they left imaginary sums of money to those who had befriended them and thenceforth they found no lack of nursing in the intervals of his labours dollier de casson would run to and fro for warmth and exercise on a certain track of beaten snow between two of the bastions reciting his breviary as he went so that those who saw him might have thought him out of his wits one day la motte called out to him as he was thus engaged e monsieur le Corre, if the iroquois should come you must defend that bastion my men are all deserting me and going over to you and the doctor to which the father replied get me some litters with wheels and i will bring them out to man my bastion they are brave enough now no fear of their running away with banter like this they sought to beguile their miseries and thus the winter wore on at fort st anne early in spring they saw a troop of iroquois approaching and prepared as well as they could to make fight but the strangers proved to be ambassadors of peace the destruction of the mohawk towns had produced a deep effect not on that nation alone but also on the other four members of the league they were disposed to confirm the promises of peace which they had already made and tracy had spurred their good intentions by sending them a message 
that unless they quickly presented themselves at quebec he would hang all the chiefs whom he had kept prisoners after discovering their treachery in the preceding summer the threat had its effect deputies of the one-eyders onondagas cayugas and senecas presently arrived in a temper of befitting humility the mohawks were at first afraid to come but in april they sent the flemish bastard with overtures of peace and in july a large deputation of their chiefs appeared at quebec they and the rest left some of their families as hostages and promised that if any of their people should kill a frenchman they would give them up to be hanged they begged too for blacksmiths surgeons and jesuits to live among them the presence of the jesuits in their towns was in many ways an advantage to them while to the colony it was of the greatest importance not only was conversion to the church justly regarded as the best means of attaching the indians to the french and alienating them from the english but the jesuits living in the midst of them could influence even those whom they could not convert soothe rising jealousies counteract english intrigues and keep the rulers of the colony informed of all that was passing in the iroquois towns thus half christian missionaries half political agents the jesuits prepared to resume the hazardous mission of the iroquois Framin and Pierron were ordered to the Mohawks, Bruyas to the Oneidas, and three others were named for the remaining three nations of the League. The troops had made the peace, the Jesuits were the rivets to hold it fast, and peace endured without absolute rupture for nearly twenty years. Of all the French expeditions against the Iroquois, that of Tracy was the most productive of good. End of chapter 14Chapter Fifteen of the Old Regime in Canada by Francis Parkman, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen, sixteen sixty five to sixteen seventy two Paternal Government. Tracy's work was done, and he left Canada with the glittering noblesse in his train. Courcel and Talon remained to rule alone and now the great experiment was begun. Paternal royalty would try its hand at building up a colony, and Talon was its chosen agent. His appearance did him no justice. The regular contour of his oval face, about which fell to his shoulders a cataract of curls, natural or suppositious, the smooth lines of his well-formed features, brows delicately arched and a mouth more suggestive of feminine sensibility than of masculine force would certainly have misled the disciple of lavater yet there was no want of manhood in him he was most happily chosen for the task placed in his hands and from first to last approved himself a vigorous executive officer he was a true disciple of colbert formed in his school and animated by his spirit being on the spot he was better able than his master to judge the working of the new order of things with regard to the company he writes that it will profit by impoverishing the colony that its monopolies dishearten the people and paralyze enterprise that it is thwarting the intentions of the king who wishes trade to be encouraged and that if its exclusive privileges are maintained canada in ten years will be less populous than now but colbert clung to his plan though he wrote in reply that to satisfy the colonists he had persuaded the company to forego the monopolies for a year as this proved insufficient the company was at length forced to give up permanently its right of exclusive trade still exacting its share of beaver and moose skins this was its chief source of profit it begrudged every sou deducted from it for charges of government 
and the king was constantly obliged to do at his own cost that which the company should have done in one point it shows a ceaseless activity and this was the levying of duties in which it was never known to fail trade even after its exercise was permitted was continually vexed by the hand of authority one of tracy's first measures had been to issue a decree reducing the price of wheat one half the council took up the work of regulation and fixed the price of all imported goods in three several tariffs one for quebec one for three rivers and one for montreal it may well be believed that there was in canada little capital and little enterprise industrially and commercially the colony was almost dead talon set himself to galvanize it and if one man could have supplied the intelligence and energy of a whole community the results would have been triumphant he had received elaborate instructions and they indicate an ardent wish for the prosperity of canada colbert had written to him that the true means to strengthen the colony was to cause justice to reign establish a good police protect the inhabitants discipline them against enemies and procure for them peace repose and plenty and as the minister further says the king regards his canadian subjects from the highest to the lowest almost as his own children and wishes them to enjoy equally with the people of france the mildness and happiness of his reign the sieur talon will study to solace them in all things and encourage them to trade and industry and seeing that nothing can better promote this end than entering into the details of their households and of all their little affairs it will not be amiss that he visit all their settlements one after the other in order to learn their true condition provide as much as possible for their wants and performing the duty of a good head of a family put them in the way of making some profit the attendant was also told to encourage fathers to inspire their children with piety together with profound love and respect for the royal person of his majesty talon entered on his work with admirable zeal sometimes he used authority sometimes persuasion sometimes promises of reward sometimes again he tried the force of example thus he built a ship to show the people how to do it and rouse them to imitation three or four years later the experiment was repeated this time it was at the cost of the king who applied the sum of forty thousand livres to the double purpose of promoting the art of shipbuilding and saving the colonists from vagrant habits by giving them employment talent wrote that three hundred and fifty men had been supplied that summer with work at the charge of government he dispatched two engineers to search for coal lead iron copper and other minerals important discoveries of iron were made but three generations were destined to pass before the mines were successfully worked the copper of lake superior raised the intendant's hopes for a time but he was soon forced to the conclusion that it was too remote to be of practical value he laboured vigorously to develop arts and manufactures made a barrel of tar and sent it to the king as a specimen caused some of the colonists to make cloth of the wool of the sheep which the king had sent out encouraged others to establish a tannery and also a factory of hats and of shoes the sieur Follin was induced by the grant of a monopoly to begin the making of soap and potash the people were ordered to grow hemp and urged to gather the nettles of the country as a material for cordage and the ursulines were supplied with flax and wool in order that they might teach girls to weave and spin talon was especially anxious to establish trade between canada and the west indies and to make a beginning he freighted the vessel he had built with salted cod salmon eels peas 
fish oil staves and planks and sent her thither to exchange her cargo for sugar which she was in turn to exchange in france for goods suited for the canadian market another favourite object with him was the fishery of seals and white porpoises for the sake of their oil and some of the chief merchants were urged to undertake it as well as the establishment of stationary cod fisheries along the lower st lawrence but with every encouragement many years passed before this valuable industry was placed on a firm basis talon saw with concern the huge consumption of wine and brandy among the settlers costing them as he wrote to colbert a hundred thousand livres a year and to keep this money in the colony he declared his intention of building a brewery the minister approved the plan not only on economic grounds but because the vice of drunkenness would thereafter cause no more scandal by reason of the cold nature of beer the vapours whereof rarely deprive men of the use of judgment the brewery was accordingly built to the great satisfaction of the poorer colonists nor did the active intendant fail to acquit himself of the duty of domiciliary visits enjoined upon himself by the royal instructions a point on which he was of one mind with his superiors for he writes that those charged in this country with his majesty's affairs are under a strict obligation to enter into the detail of families accordingly we learn from mother juchereau that he studied with the affection of a father how to succour the poor and cause the colony to grow entered into the minutest particulars visited the houses of the inhabitants and caused them to visit him learned what crops each one was raising taught those who had wheat to sell it at a profit helped those who had none and encouraged everybody and dolier de casson represents him as visiting in turn every house in montreal and giving aid from the king to such as needed it horses cattle sheep and other domestic animals were sent out at the royal charge in considerable numbers and distributed gratuitously with an order that none of the young should be killed till the country was sufficiently stocked large quantities of goods were also sent from the same high quarter some of these were distributed as gifts and the rest bartered for corn to supply the troops as the intendant perceived that the farmers lost much time in coming from their distant clearings to buy necessaries at quebec he caused his agents to furnish them with the king's goods at their own houses to the great annoyance of the merchants of quebec who complained that their accustomed trade was thus forestalled these were not the only cares which occupied the mind of talon he tried to open a road across the country to acadia an almost impossible task in which he and his successors completely failed under his auspices albanel penetrated to hudson's bay and st lucent took possession in the king's name of the country of the upper lakes it was talon in short who prepared the way for the remarkable series of explorations described in another work again and again he urged upon colbert and the king a measure from which had it taken effect momentous consequences must have sprung this was the purchase or seizure of new york involving the isolation of new england the subjection of the iroquois and the undisputed control of half the continent great as were his opportunities of abusing his trust it does not appear that he took advantage of them he held lands and houses in canada owned the brewery which he had established and embarked in various enterprises of productive industry but so far as i can discover he is nowhere accused of making illicit gains and there is reason to believe that he acquitted himself of his charge with entire fidelity his health failed in sixteen sixty eight and for this and other causes he asked for his recall colbert granted it with strong expressions of regret and when two years later he resumed the intendancy the colony seems to have welcomed his return End of chapter fifteen
Chapter Sixteen of the Old Regime in Canada by Francis Parkman, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen, sixteen sixty one to sixteen seventy three, Marriage and Population. The peopling of Canada was due in the main to the king. Before the accession of Louis the Fourteenth the entire population priests nuns traders and settlers did not exceed twenty five hundred but scarcely had he reached his majority when the shipment of men to the colony was systematically begun even in argenson's time loads of emigrants sent out by the crown were landed every year at quebec the sulpicians of montreal also brought over colonists to people their seigneurial estate the same was true on a small scale of one or two other proprietors and once at least the company sent a considerable number yet the government was the chief agent of emigration colbert did the work and the king paid for it in sixteen sixty one laval wrote to the cardinals of the propaganda that during the past two years the king had spent two hundred thousand livres on the colony that since sixteen fifty nine he had sent out three hundred men a year and that he had promised to send an equal number every summer during ten years these men were sent by squads in merchant ships each one of which was required to carry a certain number in many cases emigrants were bound on their arrival to enter into the service of colonists already established in this case the employer paid them wages and after a term of three years they became settlers themselves the destined emigrants were collected by agents in the provinces conducted to dieppe or rochelle and thence embarked at first men were sent from rochelle itself and its neighbourhood but laval remonstrated declaring that he wanted none from that ancient stronghold of heresy the people of rochelle indeed found no favour in canada another writer describes them as persons of little conscience and almost no religion adding that the normans percherons picards and peasants of the neighbourhood of paris are docile industrious and far more pious it is important he concludes in beginning a new colony to sow good seed it was accordingly from the northwestern provinces that most of the emigrants were drawn they seem in the main to have been a decent peasantry though writers who from their position should have been well informed have denounced them in unmeasured terms some of them could read and write and some brought with them a little money Talon was constantly begging for more men, till Louis the Fourteenth at length took alarm. Colbert replied to the overzealous intendant that the king did not think it expedient to depopulate France in order to people Canada, that he wanted men for his armies, and that the colony must rely chiefly on increase from within. Still the shipments did not cease, and even while tempering the ardour of his agent, the king gave another proof of how much he had the growth of canada at heart the regiment of carignan salieres had been ordered home with the exception of four companies kept in garrison and a considerable number discharged in order to become settlers of those who returned six companies were a year or two later sent back discharged in their turn and converted into colonists neither men nor officers were positively constrained to remain in canada but the officers were told that if they wished to please his majesty this was the way to do so and both they and the men were stimulated by promises and rewards fifteen hundred leaves were given to la motte because he had married in the country and meant to remain there six thousand leaves were assigned to other officers because they had followed or were about to follow la motte's example and twelve thousand were set apart to be distributed to the soldiers under similar conditions each soldier who consented to remain and settle 
was promised a grant of land and a hundred leaves in money or if he preferred it fifty livres with provisions for a year this military colonization had a strong and lasting influence on the character of the canadian people but if the colony was to grow from within the new settlers must have wives for some years past the sulpicians had sent out young women for the supply of montreal and the king on a larger scale continued the benevolent work girls for the colony were taken from the hospitals of paris and of lyons which were not so much hospitals for the sick as houses of refuge for the poor mother mary writes in sixteen sixty five that a hundred had come that summer and were nearly all provided with husband and that two hundred more were to come next year the case was urgent for the demand was great complaints however were soon heard that women from cities made indifferent partners and peasant girls healthy strong and accustomed to field work were demanded in their place peasant girls were therefore sent but this was not all officers as well as men wanted wives and talon asked for a consignment of young ladies his request was promptly answered in sixteen sixty seven he writes they send us eighty-four girls from dieppe and twenty-five from rochelle among them are fifteen or twenty of pretty good birth several of them are really demoiselles and tolerably well brought up they complained of neglect and hardship during the voyage i shall do what i can to soothe their discontent adds the intendant for if they write to their correspondents at home how ill they have been treated it would be an obstacle to your plan of sending us next year a number of select young ladies three years later we find him asking for three or four more in behalf of certain bachelor officers the response surpassed his utmost wishes and he wrote again it is not expedient to send more demoiselles i have had this year fifteen of them instead of the four i asked for as regards peasant girls the supply rarely equalled the demand count frontenac courcelles successor complained of the scarcity if a hundred and fifty girls and as many servants he says had been sent out this year they would all have found husbands and masters within a month the character of these candidates for matrimony has not escaped the pen of slander the caustic la Hontan, writing fifteen or twenty years after draws the following sketch of the mothers of canada after the regiment of carignan was disbanded ships were sent out freighted with girls of indifferent virtue under the direction of a few pious old duennas who divided them into three classes these vestals were so to speak piled one on the other in three different halls where the bridegrooms chose their brides as a butcher chooses his sheep out of the midst of the flock there was wherewith to contact the most fantastical in these three harems for here were to be seen the tall and the short the blond and the brown the plump and the lean everybody in short found a shoe to fit him at the end of a fortnight not one was left i am told that the plumpest were taken first because it was thought that being less active they were more likely to keep at home and that they could resist the winter cold better those who wanted a wife applied to the directresses to whom they were obliged to make known their possessions and means of livelihood before taking from one of the three classes the girl whom they found most to their liking the marriage was concluded forthwith with the help of a priest and a notary and the next day the governor-general caused the couple to be presented with an ox a cow a pair of swine a pair of fowls two barrels of salted meat and eleven crowns in money as regards the character of the girls there can be no doubt that this amusing sketch is in the main maliciously untrue 
since the colony began it had been the practice to send back to france women of the class alluded to by la hontane as soon as they became notorious those who were not taken from institutions of charity usually belonged to the families of peasants overburdened with children and glad to find the chance of establishing them how some of them were obtained appears from a letter of colbert to harlay archbishop of rouen as in the parishes about rouen he writes fifty or sixty girls might be found who would be very glad to go to canada to be married i beg you to employ your credit and authority with the cures of thirty or forty of these parishes to try to find in each of them one or two girls disposed to go voluntarily for the sake of a settlement in life mistakes nevertheless occurred along with the honest people complains mother mary comes a great deal of canet of both sexes who cause a great deal of scandal after some of the young women had been married at quebec it was found that they had husbands at home the priests became cautious in tying the matrimonial knot and colbert thereupon ordered that each girl should provide herself with a certificate from the cure or magistrate of her parish to the effect that she was free to marry nor was the practical intendant unmindful of other precautions to smooth the path to the desired goal the girls destined for this country he writes besides being strong and healthy ought to be entirely free from any natural blemish or anything personally repulsive thus qualified canonically and physically the annual consignment of young women was shipped to quebec in charge of a matron employed and paid by the king her task was not an easy one for the troop under her care was apt to consist of what mother mary in a moment of unwonted levity calls mixed goods on one occasion the office was undertaken by the pious widow of jean bourdon her flock of a hundred and fifty girls says mother mary gave her no little trouble on the voyage for they are of all sorts and some of them are very rude and hard to manage madame bourdon was not daunted she not only saw her charge distributed and married but she continued to receive and care for the subsequent shiploads as they arrived summer after summer she was indeed chief among the pious duennas of whom la hontane irreverently speaks marguerite bourgois did the same good offices for the young women sent to montreal here the king's girls as they were called were all lodged together in a house to which the suitors repaired to make their selection i was obliged to live there myself writes the excellent nun because families were to be formed that is to say because it was she who superintended these extemporized unions meanwhile she taught the girls their catechism and more fortunate than madame bourdon inspired them with a confidence and affection which they retained long after at quebec where the matrimonial market was on a larger scale a more ample bazaar was needed that the girls were assorted into three classes each penned up for selection in a separate hall is a statement probable enough in itself but resting on no better authority than that of la hontane be this as it may they were submitted together to the inspection of the suitor and the awkward young peasant or the rugged soldier of carignan was required to choose a bride without delay from among the anxious candidates they on their part were permitted to reject any applicant who displeased them and the first question we are told which most of them asked was whether the suitor had a house and a farm great as was the call for wives it was thought prudent to stimulate it the new settler was at once enticed and driven into wedlock bounties were offered on early marriages twenty livres were given to each youth who married before the age of twenty 
and to each girl who married before the age of sixteen this which was called the king's gift was exclusive of the dowry given by him to every girl brought over by his orders the dowry varied greatly in form and value but according to mother mary it was sometimes a house with provisions for eight months more often it was fifty livres in household supplies besides a barrel or two of salted meat the royal solicitude extended also to the children of colonists already established i pray you writes colbert to talon to commend it to the consideration of the whole people that their prosperity their subsistence and all that is dear to them depend on a general resolution never to be departed from to marry youths at eighteen or nineteen years and girls at fourteen or fifteen since abundance can never come to them except through the abundance of men this counsel was followed by appropriate action any father of a family who without showing good cause neglected to marry his children when they had reached the ages of twenty and sixteen was fined and each father thus delinquent was required to present himself every six months to the local authorities to declare what reason if any he had for such delay orders were issued a little before the arrival of the yearly ships from france that all single men should marry within a fortnight after the landing of the prospective brides no mercy was shown to the obdurate bachelor talon issued an order forbidding unmarried men to hunt fish trade with the indians or go into the woods under any pretence whatsoever in short they were made as miserable as possible colbert goes further he writes to the intendant those who may seem to have absolutely renounced marriage should be made to bear additional burdens and be excluded from all honours it would be well even to add some marks of infamy the success of these measures was complete no sooner says mother mary have the vessels arrived than the young men go to get wives and by reason of the great number they are married by thirties at a time throughout the length and breadth of canada hymen if not cupid was whipped into a frenzy of activity dollier de casson tells us of a widow who was married afresh before her late husband was buried nor was the fatherly care of the king confined to the humbler classes of his colonists he wished to form a canadian noblesse to which end early marriages were thought needful among officers and others of the better sort the progress of such marriages was carefully watched and reported by the intendant we have seen the reward bestowed upon la motte for taking to himself a wife and the money set apart for the brother officers who imitated him in his dispatch of october sixteen sixty seven the intendant announces that two captains are already married to two damsels of the country that a lieutenant has espoused a daughter of the governor of three rivers and that four ensigns are in treaty with their mistresses and are already half engaged the paternal care of government one would think could scarcely go further it did however go further bounties were offered on children the king in council passed a decree that in future all inhabitants of the said country of canada who shall have living children to the number of ten born in lawful wedlock not being priests monks or nuns shall each be paid out of the monies sent by his majesty to the said country a pension of three hundred livres a year and those who shall have twelve children a pension of four hundred livres and that to this effect they shall be required to declare the number of their children every year in the months of june or july to the intendant of justice police and finance established in the said country who having verified the same shall order the payment of said pensions one half in cash and the other half at the end of each year this was applicable to all colbert had before offered a reward 
intended specially for the better class of twelve hundred leaves to those who had fifteen children and eight hundred to those who had ten these wise encouragements as the worthy faillon calls them were crowned with the desired result a despatch of talon in sixteen seventy informs the minister that most of the young women sent out last summer are pregnant already and in sixteen seventy one he announces that from six hundred to seven hundred children have been born in the colony during the year a prodigious number in view of the small population the climate was supposed to be particularly favorable to the health of women which is somewhat surprising in view of recent american experience the first reflection i have to make says dolier de casson is on the advantage that women have in this place montreal over men for though the cold is very wholesome to both sexes it is incomparably more so to the female who is almost immortal here her fecundity matched her longevity and was the admiration of talon and his successors accustomed as they were to the scanty families of france why with this great natural increase joined to an immigration which though greatly diminishing did not entirely cease was there not a corresponding increase in the population of the colony why more than half a century after the king took canada in charge did the census show a total of less than twenty five thousand souls the reasons will appear hereafter it is a peculiarity of canadian immigration at this most flourishing epoch that it was mainly an immigration of single men and single women the cases in which entire families came over were comparatively few the new settler was found by the king sent over by the king and supplied by the king with a wife a farm and sometimes with a house well did louis the fourteenth earn the title of father of new france but the royal zeal was spasmodic the king was diverted to other cares and soon after the outbreak of the dutch war in sixteen seventy two the regular dispatch of emigrants to canada well nigh seized though the practice of disbanding soldiers in the colony giving them lands and turning them into settlers was continued in some degree even to the last. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Old Regime in Canada by Francis Parkman, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17, 1665-1672 to 1672. The New Home we have seen that the settler landed and married let us follow him to his new home at the end of talon's administration the head of the colony that is to say the island of montreal and the borders of the richelieu was the seat of a peculiar colonization the chief object of which was to protect the rest of canada against iroquois incursions the lands along the richelieu from its mouth to a point above Chambly, were divided in large seigneurial grants among several officers of the regiment of Carignan, who in their turn granted out the land to the soldiers, reserving a sufficient portion as their own. The officer thus became a kind of feudal chief, and the whole settlement a permanent military cantonment, admirably suited to the object in view. The disbanded soldier was practically a soldier still, but he was also a farmer and a landholder. Talon had recommended this plan as being in accordance with the example of the Romans. The practice of that politic and martial people, he wrote, may, in my opinion, be wisely adopted in a country a thousand leagues distant from its monarch and as the peace and harmony of peoples depend above all things on their fidelity to their sovereign our first kings better statesmen than is commonly supposed introduced into newly conquered countries men of war of approved trust in order at once to hold the inhabitants to their duty within and repel the enemy from without 
the troops were accordingly discharged and settled not alone on the richelieu but also along the st lawrence between lake st peter and montreal as well as at some other points the sulpicians feudal owners of montreal adopted a similar policy and surrounded their island with a border of fiefs large and small granted partly to officers and partly to humbler settlers bold hardy and practised in bush fighting thus a line of sentinels was posted around their entire shore ready to give the alarm whenever an enemy appeared about quebec the soldiers covered as they were by those above were for the most part of a more pacific character to return to the richelieu the towns and villages which have since grown upon its banks and along the adjacent shores of the st lawrence owe their names to these officers of carignan ancient lords of the soil sorel chambly saint ours contrecoeur varennes vercheres yet let it not be supposed that villages sprang up at once the military seigneur valiant and poor as walter the penniless was in no condition to work such magic his personal possessions usually consisted of little but his sword and the money which the king had paid him for marrying a wife a domain varying from half a league to six leagues in front on the river and from half a league to two leagues in depth had been freely given him when he had distributed a part of it in allotments to the soldiers a variety of tasks awaited him to clear and cultivate his land to build his seigneurial mansion often a log hut to build a fort to build a chapel and to build a mill to do all this at once was impossible chambly the chief proprietor on the richelieu was better able than the others to meet the exigency he built himself a good house where with cattle and sheep furnished by the king he lived in reasonable comfort the king's fort close at hand spared him and his tenants the necessity of building one for themselves and furnished no doubt a mill a chapel and a chaplain his brother officers sorel excepted were less fortunate they and their tenants were forced to provide defence as well as shelter their houses were all built together and surrounded by a palisade so as to form a little fortified village the ever active benevolence of the king had aided them in the task for the soldiers were still maintained by him while clearing the lands and building the houses destined to be their own nor was it till this work was done that the provident government dispatched them to quebec with orders to bring back wives the settler thus lodged and wedded was required on his part to aid in clearing lands for those who should come after him it was chiefly in the more exposed parts of the colony that the houses were gathered together in palisaded villages thus forcing the settler to walk or paddle some distance to his farm he naturally preferred to build where he could on the front of his farm itself near the river which supplied the place of a road as the grants of land were very narrow his house was not far from that of his next neighbour and thus a line of dwellings was ranged along the shore forming what in local language was called a coat a use of the word peculiar to canada where it still prevails the impoverished seigneur rarely built a chapel most of the early canadian churches were built with funds furnished by the seminaries of quebec or of montreal aided by contributions of material and labor from the parishioners meanwhile mass was said in some house of the neighborhood by a missionary priest paddling his canoe from village to village or from coat to coat the mill was an object of the last importance it was built of stone and pierced with loopholes to serve as a blockhouse in case of attack 
the great mill at montreal was one of the chief defences of the place it was at once the duty and the right of the seigneur to supply his tenants or rather vassals with this essential requisite and they on their part were required to grind their grain at his mill leaving the fourteenth part in payment but for many years there was not a seigneury in canada where this fraction would pay the wages of a miller and except the ecclesiastical corporations there were few seigneurs who could pay the cost of building the first settlers were usually forced to grind for themselves after the tedious fashion of the indians talon in his capacity of counsellor friend and father to all canada arranged the new settlements near quebec in the manner which he judged best and which he meant to serve as an example to the rest of the colony it was his aim to concentrate population around this point so that should an enemy appear the sound of a cannon shot from the chateau st louis might summon a numerous body of defenders to this common point of rendezvous he bought a tract of land near quebec laid it out and settled it as a model seigneury hoping as he says to kindle a spirit of emulation among the new-made seigneurs to whom he had granted lands from the king he also laid out at the royal cost three villages in the immediate neighbourhood planning them with great care and peopling them partly with families newly arrived partly with soldiers and partly with old settlers in order that the newcomers might take lessons from the experience of these veterans that each village might be complete in itself he furnished it as well as he could with the needful carpenter mason blacksmith and shoemaker these inland villages called respectively bourg royal bourg la reine and bourg talon did not prove very thrifty wherever the settlers were allowed to choose for themselves they ranged their dwellings along the watercourses with the exception of talon's villages one could have seen nearly every house in canada by paddling a canoe up the st lawrence and the richelieu the settlers formed long thin lines on the edges of the rivers a convenient arrangement but one very unfavourable to defence to ecclesiastical control and strong government the king soon discovered this and repeated orders were sent to concentrate the inhabitants and form canada into villages instead of coats to do so would have involved a general revocation of grants and abandonment of houses and clearings a measure too arbitrary and too wasteful even for louis the fourteenth and one extremely difficult to enforce canada persisted in attenuating herself and the royal will was foiled as you ascended the st lawrence the first harbouring place of civilization was tadoussac at the mouth of the saguenay where the company had its trading station where its agents ruled supreme and where in early summer all was alive with canoes and wigwams and troop of montagnais savages bringing their fur to market leave tadoussac behind and embarked in a sailboat or a canoe follow the northern coast far on the left twenty miles away the southern shore lies pale and dim and mountain ranges wave their faint outline along the sky you pass the beetling rocks of mole bay a solitude but for the bark hut of some wandering indian beneath the cliff the aboulements with their wild romantic gorge and foaming waterfalls and the bay of st paul with its broad valley and its woody mountains rich with hidden stores of iron vast piles of savage verdure border the mighty stream till at length the mountains of cape torment upheaves its huge bulk from the bosom of the water shadowed by lowering clouds and dark with forests 
just beyond begin the settlements of laval's vast seigneury of beaupre which had not been forgotten in the distribution of emigrants and which in sixteen sixty seven contained more inhabitants than quebec itself the ribbon of a rich meadow-land that borders that beautiful shore was yellow with wheat in harvest time and on the woody slopes behind the frequent clearings and the solid little dwellings of logs continued for a long distance to relieve the sameness of the forest after passing the cataract of montmorency there was another settlement much smaller at beauport the seigneury of the ex-physician giffard one of the earliest proprietors in canada the neighboring shores of the island of orleans were also edged with houses and clearings the promontory of quebec now towered full in sight crowned with church fort chateau convents and seminary there was little else on the rock priests nuns government officials and soldiers were the denizens of the upper town while commerce and the trades were cabined along the strand beneath from the gallery of the chateau you might toss a pebble far down on their shingled roofs in the midst of them was the magazine of the company with its two round towers and two projecting wings it was here that all the beaver skins of the colony were collected assorted and shipped for france the so-called chateau st louis was an indifferent wooden structure planted on a site truly superb above the lower town above the river above the ships gazing abroad on a majestic panorama of waters forests and mountains behind it was the area of the fort of which it formed one side the governor lived in the chateau and soldiers were on guard night and day in the fort at some little distance was the convent of the ursulines ugly but substantial where mother mary of the incarnation ruled her pupils and her nuns and a little farther on towards the right was the hotel dieu between them were the massive buildings of the jesuits then as now facing the principal square at one side was their church newly finished and opposite across the square stood and still stands the great church of notre dame behind the church was laval's seminary with the extensive enclosures belonging to it the seneschaussee or courthouse the tavern of one jacques boisdon on the square near the church and a few houses along the line of what is now st louis street comprised nearly all the civil part of the upper town the ecclesiastical buildings were of stone and the church of notre dame and the jesuit college were marvels of size and solidity in view of the poverty and weakness of the colony proceeding upward along the north shore of the st lawrence one found a cluster of houses at cap rouge and further on the frequent rude beginnings of a seigneury the settlements thickened on approaching three rivers a fur-trading hamlet enclosed with a square palisade above this place a line of incipient seigneuries bordered the river most of them granted to officers laubia a captain labadie a sergeant morass an ensign berthier a captain rodin an ensign la valterie a lieutenant under their auspices settlers military and civilian were arranging themselves along the shore and ugly gaps in the forest thickly set with stumps bore witness to their toils these settlements rapidly extended till in a few years a chain of houses and clearings reached with little interruption from quebec to montreal such was the fruit of tracy's chastisement of the mohawks and the influx of immigrants that followed as you approached montreal the fortified mill built by the sulpicians at point aux trembles towered above the woods and soon after the newly built chapel of the infant jesus 
more settlements followed till at length the great fortified mill of montreal rose in sight then the long row of compact wooden houses the hotel dieu and the rough masonry of the seminary of st sulpice beyond the town the clearings continued at intervals till you reached lake st louis where a young cavalier de la salle had laid out his seigneury of la chine and abandoned it to begin his hard career of western exploration above the island of montreal the wilderness was broken only by a solitary trading station on the neighboring isle perrot now cross lake st louis shoot the rapids of la chine and follow the southern shore downward here the seigneuries of longoy boucherville varennes verchere and contrecoeur were already begun from the fort of sorel one could visit the military seigneuries along the richelieu or descend towards quebec passing on the way those of losodiere becancourt lothiniere and others still in a shapeless infancy even far below quebec at st anne de la pocatiere river Uel and other points cabins and clearings greeted the eye of the passing canoemen for a year or two the settler's initiation was a rough one but when he had a few acres under tillage he could support himself and his family on the produce aided by hunting if he knew how to use a gun and by the bountiful profusion of eels which the st lawrence never failed to yield in their season and which smoked or salted supplied his larder for months in winter he hewed timber sawed planks or split shingles for the market of quebec obtaining in return such necessaries as he required with thrift and hard work he was sure of comfort at last but the former habits of the military settlers and of many of the others were not favourable to a routine of dogged industry the sameness and solitude of their new life often became insufferable nor married as they had been was the domestic hearth likely to supply much consolation yet thrifty or not they multiplied apace a poor man says mother mary will have eight children and more who run about in winter with bare heads and bare feet and a little jacket on their backs live on nothing but bread and eels and on that grow fat and stout with such treatment the weaker sort died but the strong survived and out of this rugged nursing sprang the hardy canadian race of bush rangers and bush fighters end of chapter seventeen Chapter 18 of The Old Regime in Canada by Francis Parkman, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18, 1663 to 1763. Canadian Feudalism. Canadian society was beginning to form itself, and at its base was the feudal tenure. European feudalism was the indigenous and natural growth of political and social conditions which preceded it. Canadian feudalism was an offshoot of the feudalism of France, modified by the lapse of centuries, and further modified by the royal will. In France, as in the rest of Europe, the system had lost its vitality. The warrior nobles who placed Hugh Capet on the throne and began the feudal monarchy formed an aristocratic republic and the king was one of their number whom they chose to be their chief but through the struggles and vicissitudes of many succeeding reigns royalty had waxed and oligarchy had waned the fact had changed and the theory had changed with it the king once powerless among a host of turbulent nobles was now a king indeed once a chief because his equals had made him so he was now the anointed of the lord this triumph of royalty had culminated in louis the fourteenth 
the stormy energies and bold individualism of the old feudal nobles had ceased to exist they who had held his predecessors in awe had become his obsequious servants he no longer feared his nobles he prized them as gorgeous decorations of his court and satellites of his royal person it was richelieu who first planted feudalism in canada the king would preserve it there because with its teeth drawn he was fond of it and because as the feudal tenure prevailed in old france it was natural that it should prevail also in the new but he continued as richelieu had begun and moulded it to the form that pleased him nothing was left which could threaten his absolute and undivided authority over the colony in france a multitude of privileges and prescriptions still clung despite its fall about the ancient ruling class few of these were allowed to cross the atlantic while the old lingering abuses which had made the system odious were at the same time lopped away thus retrenched canadian feudalism was made to serve a double end to produce a faint and harmless reflection of french aristocracy and simply and practically to supply agencies for distributing land among the soldiers the nature of the precaution which it was held to require appear in the plan of administration which talon and tracy laid before the minister they urged that in view of the distance from france special care ought to be taken to prevent changes and revolutions aristocratic or otherwise in the colony whereby in time sovereign jurisdictions might grow up as formerly occurred in various parts of france and in respect to grants already made an inquiry was ordered to ascertain if seigneurs in distributing lands to their vassals have exacted any conditions injurious to the right of the crown and the subjection due solely to the king in the same view the seigneur was denied any voice whatever in the direction of government and it is scarcely necessary to say that the essential feature of feudalism in the day of its vitality the requirement of military service by the lord from the vassal was utterly unknown in canada the royal governor called out the militia whenever he saw fit and set over it what offices he pleased the seigneur was usually the immediate vassal of the crown from which he had received his land gratuitously in a few cases he made grants to other seigneurs inferior in the feudal scale and they his vassals granted in turn to their vassals the habitants or cultivators of the soil sometimes the habitant held directly of the crown in which case there was no step between the highest and lowest degrees of the feudal scale the seigneur held by the tenure of faith and homage the habitant by the inferior tenure en sensi faith and homage were rendered to the crown or other feudal superior whenever the seigneury changed hands or in the case of seigneuries held by corporations after long stated intervals the following is an example drawn from the early days of the colony of the performance of this ceremony by the owner of a fief to the seigneur who had granted it to him it is that of jean goyon vassal of giffard seigneur of beauport the act recounts how in presence of a notary goyon presented himself at the principal door of the manor house of beauport how having knocked one buel farmer of giffard opened the door and in reply to goyon's question if the seigneur was home replied that he was not but that he Boul, was empowered to receive acknowledgments of faith and homage from the vassal in his name after the which reply proceeds the act the said goyon being at the principal door placed himself on his knees on the ground with head bare and without sword or spurs said three times these words monsieur de beauport monsieur de beauport monsieur de beauport 
i bring you the faith and homage which i am bound to bring you on account of my fief de boisson which i hold as a man of faith of your seigneury of beauport declaring that i offer to pay my seigneurial and feudal dues in their season and demanding of you to accept me in faith and homage as aforesaid the following instance is the more common one of a seigneur holding directly of the crown it is widely separated from the first in point of time having occurred a year after the army of wolfe entered quebec philippe noel had lately died and jean noel his son inherited his seigneury of tilly and bon secours to make the title good faith and homage must be renewed jean noel was under the bitter necessity of rendering this duty to general murray governor for the king of great britain the form is the same as in the case of goyon more than a century before noel repairs to the government house at quebec and knocks at the door a servant opens it noel asks if the governor is there the servant replies that he is murray informed of the visitor's object comes to the door and noel then and there without sword or spurs with bare head and one knee on the ground repeats the acknowledgment of faith and homage for his seigneury he was compelled however to add a detested innovation the oath of fidelity to his britannic majesty coupled with a pledge to keep his vassals in obedience to the new sovereign the seigneur was a proprietor holding that relation to the feudal superior which in its pristine character has been truly described as servile in form proud and bold in spirit but in canada this bold spirit was very far from being strengthened by the changes which the policy of the crown had introduced into the system the reservation of mines and minerals oaks for the royal navy roadways and a site if needed for royal forts and magazines had in it nothing extraordinary the great difference between the position of the canadian seigneur and that of the vassal proprietor of the middle ages lay in the extent and nature of the control which the crown and its officers held over him a decree of the king an edict of the council or an ordinance of the intendant might at any moment change the old conditions impose new ones interfere between the lord of the manor and his grantees and modify or annul his bargains past or present he was never sure whether or not the government would let him alone and against its most arbitrary intervention he had no remedy one condition was imposed on him which may be said to form the distinctive feature of canadian feudalism that of clearing his land within a limited time on pain of forfeiting it the object was the excellent one of preventing the lands of the colony from lying waste as the seigneur was often the penniless owner of a domain three or four leagues wide and proportionably deep he could not clear it all himself and was therefore under the necessity of placing the greater part in the hands of those who could but he was forbidden to sell any part of it which he had not cleared he must grant it without price on condition of a small perpetual rent and this brings us to the cultivator of the soil the censitaire the broad base of the feudal pyramid the tenure en censive by which the censitaire held of the seigneur consisted in the obligation to make annual payments in money produce or both in canada these payments known as sans et rent were strangely diverse in amount and kind but in all the early period of the colony they were almost ludicrously small a common charge at montreal was half a sou and half a pint of wheat for each arpent 
the rate usually fluctuated in the early times between half a sou and two sous so that a farm of a hundred and sixty arpents would pay from four to sixteen francs of which a part would be in money and the rest in live capons wheat eggs or all three together in pursuance of contracts as amusing in their precision as they are bewildering in their variety live capons estimated at twenty sous each though sometimes not worth ten form a conspicuous feature in these agreements so that on payday the seigneur's barnyard presented an animated scene later in the history of the colony grants were at somewhat higher rates payment was commonly made on st martin's day when there was a general muster of tenants at the seigneurial mansion with a prodigious consumption of tobacco and a corresponding retail of neighbourhood gossip joined to the outcries of the captive fowls bundled together for delivery with legs tied but throats at full liberty a more considerable but a very uncertain source of income to the seigneur were the lods et vente or mutation fines the land of the censitaire passed freely to his heirs but if he sold it a twelfth part of the purchase money must be paid to the seigneur the seigneur on his part was equally liable to pay a mutation fine to his feudal superior if he sold his seigneury and for him the amount was larger being a quint or a fifth of the price received of which however the greater part was deducted for immediate payment this heavy charge constituting as it did a tax on all improvements was a principal cause of the abolition of the feudal tenure in 1854 the obligation of clearing his land and living on it was laid on seigneur and censitaire alike but the latter was under a variety of other obligations to the former partly imposed by custom and partly established by agreement when the grant was made to grind his grain at the seigneur's mill bake his bread in the seigneur's oven work for him one or more days in the year and give him one fish in every eleven for the privilege of fishing in the river before his farm these were the most annoying of the conditions to which the censitaire was liable few of them were ever enforced with much regularity that of baking in the seigneur's oven was rarely carried into effect though occasionally used for purposes of extortion it is here that the royal government appears in its true character so far as concerns its relations with canada that of a well-meaning despotism it continually intervened between censitaire and seigneur on the principle that as his majesty gives the land for nothing he can make what conditions he pleases and change them when he pleases these interventions were usually favourable to the censitaire on one occasion an intendant reported to the minister that in his opinion all rents ought to be reduced to one sou and one live capon for every arpent of front equal in most cases to forty superficial arpents everything he remarks ought to be brought down to the level of the first grants made in days of innocence a happy period which he does not attempt to define the minister replies that the diversity of the rent is in fact vexatious and that for his part he is disposed to abolish it altogether neither he nor the intendant gives the slightest hint of any compensation to the seigneur though these radical measures were not executed many changes were decreed from time to time in the relations between seigneur and censitaire sometimes as a simple act of sovereign power and sometimes on the ground that the grants had been made with conditions not recognized by the coutume de paris this was the code of law assigned to canada but most of the contracts between seigneur and censitaire had been agreed upon in good faith by men who knew as much of the coutume de paris as of the capitularies of charlemont 
and their conditions had remained in force unchallenged for generations these interventions of government sometimes contradicted each other and often proved a dead letter they are more or less active through the whole period of the french rule the seigneur had judicial powers which however were carefully curbed and controlled his jurisdiction when exercised at all extended in most cases only to trivial causes he very rarely had a prison and seems never to have abused it the dignity of a seignorial gallows with high justice or jurisdiction over heinous offences was granted only in three or four instances four arpents in front by forty in depth were the ordinary dimensions of a grant en sensive these ribbons of land nearly a mile and a half long with one end on the river and the other on the uplands behind usually combined the advantage of meadows for cultivation and forests for timber and firewood so long as the censitaire brought in on st martin's day his yearly capons and his yearly handful of copper his title against the seigneur was perfect there are farms in canada which have passed from father to son for two hundred years the condition of the cultivator was incomparably better than that of the french peasant crushed by taxes and oppressed by feudal burdens far heavier than those of canada in fact the canadian settler scorned the name of peasant and then as now was always called the habitant the government held him in wardship watched over him interfered with him but did not oppress him or allow others to oppress him canada was not governed to the profit of a class and if the king wished to create a canadian noblesse he took care that it should not bear hard on the country under a genuine feudalism the ownership of land conferred nobility but all this was changed the king and not the soil was now the parent of honour france swarmed with landless nobles while roturier landholders grew daily more numerous in canada half the seigneuries were in roturier or plebeian hands and in course of time some of them came into possession of persons on very humble degrees of the social scale a seigneury could be bought and sold and a trader or a thrifty habitant might and often did become the buyer if the canadian noble was always a seigneur it is far from being true that the canadian seigneur was always a noble in france it will be remembered nobility did not in itself imply a title besides its titled leaders it had its rank and file numerous enough to form a considerable army under the late bourbons the penniless young nobles were in fact enrolled into regiments turbulent difficult to control obeying officers of high rank but scorning all others and conspicuous by a fiery and impetuous valour which on more than one occasion turned the tide of victory the gentilhomme or untitled noble had a distinctive character of his own gallant punctilious vain skilled in social and sometimes in literary and artistic accomplishments but usually ignorant of most things except the handling of his rapier yet there were striking exceptions and to say of him as has been said that he knew nothing but how to get himself killed is hardly just to a body which has produced some of the best writers and thinkers of france sometimes the origin of his nobility was lost in the mists of time sometimes he owed it to a patent from the king in either case the line of demarcation between him and the classes below him was perfectly distinct 
and in this lies an essential difference between the french noblesse and the english gentry a class not separated from others by a definite barrier the french noblesse unlike the english gentry constituted a caste the gentilhomme had no vocation for emigrating he liked the army and he liked the court if he could not be of it it was something to live in its shadow the life of a backwoods settler had no charm for him he was not used to labour and he could not trade at least in retail without becoming liable to forfeit his nobility when talon came to canada there were but four noble families in the colony young nobles in abundance came out with tracy but they went home with him where then should be found the material of a canadian noblesse first in the regiment of carignan of which most of the officers were gentilhommes secondly in the issue of patents of nobility to a few of the more prominent colonists tracy asked for four such patents talon asked for five more and such requests were repeated lit intervals by succeeding governors and intendants in behalf of those who had gained their favour by merit or otherwise money smoothed the path to advancement so far had noblesse already fallen from its old estate thus jacques lebert the merchant who had long kept a shop at montreal got himself made a gentleman for six thousand livres all canada soon became infatuated with noblesse and country and town merchant and seigneur vied with each other for the quality of gentilhomme if they could not get it they often pretended to have it and aped its ways with the zeal of monsieur jourdain himself everybody here writes the intendant mules calls himself a squire and ends with thinking himself a gentleman successive intendants repeat this complaint the case was worst with roturiers who had acquired seigneuries thus noel langlois was a good carpenter till he became owner of a seigneury on which he grew lazy and affected to play the gentleman the real gentilhomme as well as the spurious had their full share of official stricture the governor denonville speaks of them thus several of them have come out this year with their wives who are very much cast down but they play the fine lady nevertheless i had much rather see good peasants it would be a pleasure to me to give aid to such knowing as i should that within two years their families would have the means of living at ease for it is certain that a peasant who can and will work is well off in this country while our nobles with nothing to do can never be anything but beggars still they ought not to be driven off or abandoned the question is how to maintain them the intendant du chesneau writes to the same effect many of our gentilhomme officers and other owners of seigneuries lead what in france is called the life of a country gentleman and spend most of their time in hunting and fishing as their requirements in food and clothing are greater than those of the simple habitants and as they do not devote themselves to improving their land they mix themselves up in trade run in debt on all hands incite their young habitants to range the woods and send their own children there to trade for furs in the indian villages and in the depth of the forest in spite of the prohibition of his majesty yet with all this they are in miserable poverty their condition indeed was often deplorable it is pitiful says the intendant champigny to see their children of which they have great numbers passing all summer with nothing on them but a shirt and their wives and daughters working in the fields in another letter he asks aid from the king for repentigny with his thirteen children 
and for tilly with his fifteen we must give them some corn at once he says or they will starve these were two of the original four noble families of canada the family of elbu another of the four is described as equally destitute pride and sloth says the same intendant are the great faults of the people of canada and especially of the nobles and those who pretend to be such i pray you to grant no more letters of nobility unless you want to multiply beggars the governor de nonville is still more emphatic above all things monseigneur permit me to say that the nobles of this new country are everything that is most beggarly and that to increase their number is to increase the number of do-nothings a new country requires hard workers who will handle the axe and mattock the sons of our councillors are no more industrious than the nobles and their only resource is to take to the woods trade a little with the indians and for the most part fall into the disorders of which i have had the honour to inform you i shall use all possible means to induce them to engage in regular commerce but as our nobles and councillors are all very poor and weighed down with debt they could not get credit for a single crown piece two days ago he writes in another letter monsieur de saint ours a gentleman of dauphiny came to me to ask leave to go back to france in search of bread he says that he will put his ten children into the chaise of any one who will give them a living and that he himself will go into the army again his wife and he are in despair and yet they do what they can i have seen two of his girls reaping grain and holding the plough other families are in the same condition they come to me with tears in their eyes all our married officers are beggars and i entreat you to send them aid there is need that the king should provide support for their children or else they will be tempted to go over to the english again he writes that the sons of the councillor d'amours have been arrested as coureurs de bois or outlaws in the bush and that if the minister does not do something to help them there is danger that all the sons of the noblesse real or pretended will turn bandits since they have no other means of living the king dispenser of charity for all canada came promptly to the rescue he granted an alms of a hundred crowns to each family coupled with a warning to the recipients of his bounty that their misery proceeds from their ambition to live as persons of quality and without labour at the same time the minister announced that no more letters of nobility would be granted in canada adding to relieve the country of some of the children of those who are really noble i send you the governor six commissions of garde de la marine and recommend you to take care not to give them to any who are not actually gentilhommes the garde de la marine answered to the midshipmen of the english or american service as the six commissions could bring little relief to the crowd of needy youths it was further ordained that sons of nobles or persons living as such should be enrolled into companies at eight sous a day for those who should best conduct themselves and six sous a day for the others nobles in canada were also permitted to trade even at retail without derogating from their rank they had already assumed this right without waiting for the royal license but thus far it had profited them little the gentilhomme was not a good shopkeeper nor as a rule was the shopkeeper's vocation very lucrative in canada the domestic trade of the colony was small and all trade was exposed to such vicissitudes from the intervention of intendants ministers and councils that at one time it was almost banished at best it was carried on under conditions auspicious to a favoured few and withering to the rest 
even when most willing to work the position of the gentilhomme was a painful one unless he could gain a post under the crown which was rarely the case he was as complete a political cipher as the meanest habitant his rents were practically nothing and he had no capital to improve his seignorial estate by a peasant's work he could gain a peasant's living and this was all the prospect was not inspiring his long initiation of misery was the natural result of his position and surroundings and it is no matter of wonder that he threw himself into the only field of action which in time of peace was open to him it was trade but trade seasoned by adventure and ennobled by danger defiant of edict and ordinance outlawed conducted in arms among forests and savages in short it was the western fur trade the tyro was likely to fail in it at first but time and experience formed him to do the work on the great lakes in the wastes of the northwest on the mississippi and the plains beyond we find the roving gentilhomme chief of a gang of bushrangers often his own habitants sometimes proscribed by the government sometimes leagued in contraband traffic with its highest officials a hardy vedette of civilization tracing unknown streams piercing unknown forests trading fighting negotiating and building forts again we find him on the shores of acadia or maine surrounded by indian retainers a menace and a terror to the neighboring english colonist saint castin du lut la durante la salle la motte cadillac iberville bienville la verendry are names that stand conspicuous on the page of half-savage romance that refreshes the hard and practical annals of american colonization but a more substantial debt is due to their memory it was they and such as they who discovered the ohio explored the mississippi to its mouth discovered the rocky mountains and founded detroit st louis and new orleans even in his earliest day the gentilhomme was not always in the evil plight where we have found him there were a few exceptions to the general misery and the chief among them is that of the le moines of montreal charles le moine son of an innkeeper of dieppe and founder of a family the most truly eminent in canada was a man of sterling qualities who had been long enough in the colony to learn how to live there others learned the same lesson at a later day adapted themselves to soil and situation took root grew and became more canadian than french as population increased their seigneuries began to yield appreciable returns and their reserved domains became worth cultivating a future dawned upon them they saw in hope their names their seigneurial estates their manor-houses their tenantry passing to their children and their children's children the beggared noble of the early time became a sturdy country gentleman poor but not wretched ignorant of books except possibly a few scraps of rusty latin picked up in a jesuit school hardy as the hardiest woodsman yet never forgetting his quality of gentilhomme scrupulously wearing its badge the sword and copying as well as he could the fashions of the court which glowed on his vision across the sea in all the effulgence of versailles and beamed with reflected ray from the chateau of quebec he was at home among his tenants at home among the indians and never more at home than when a gun in his hand and a crucifix on his breast he took the war-path with a crew of painted savages and frenchmen almost as wild and pounced like a lynx from the forest on some lonely farm or outlying hamlet of new england how new england hated him let her records tell the reddest blood-streaks on her annals mark the track 
of the Canadian Gentilhomme. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19 of The Old Regime in Canada by Francis Parkman, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19, 1663-1763 The Rulers of Canada The government of Canada was formed in its chief features after the government of a French province. Throughout France, the past and the present stood side by side the kingdom had a double administration or rather the shadow of the old administration and the substance of the new the government of provinces had long been held by the high nobles often kindred to the crown and hence in former times great perils had arisen amounting during the civil war to the danger of dismemberment the high nobles were still governors of provinces but here as always they had ceased to be dangerous titles honours and ceremonial they had in abundance but they were deprived of real power close behind them was the royal intendant an obscure figure lost amid the vain glories of the feudal sunset but in the name of the king holding the reins of government a check and a spy on his gorgeous colleague he was the king's agent of modest birth springing from the legal class owing his present to the king and dependent on him for his future learned in the law and trained to administration it was by such instruments that the powerful centralization of the monarchy enforced itself throughout the kingdom and penetrating beneath the crust of old prescriptions supplanted without seeming to supplant them the courtier noble looked down in the pride of rank on the busy man in black at his side but this man in black with the troop of officials at his beck controlled finance the royal courts public works and all the administrative business of the province the governor-general and the intendant of canada answered to those of a french province the governor excepting in the earliest period of the colony was a military noble in most cases bearing a title and sometimes of high rank the intendant as in france was usually drawn from the jean de robe or legal class the mutual relations of the two officers were modified by the circumstances about them the governor was superior in rank to the intendant he commanded the troops conducted relations with foreign colonies and indian tribes and took precedence on all occasions of ceremony unlike a provisional governor in france he had great and substantial power the king and the minister his sole masters were a thousand leagues distant and he controlled the whole military force if he abused his position there was no remedy but in appeal to the court which alone could hold him in check there were local governors at montreal and three rivers but their power was carefully curbed and they were forbidden to fine or imprison any person without authority from quebec the intendant was virtually a spy on the governor-general of whose proceedings and of everything else that took place he was required to make report every year he wrote to the minister of state one two three or four letters often forty or fifty pages long filled with the secrets of the colony political and personal great and small set forth with a minuteness often interesting often instructive and often excessively tedious the governor too wrote letters of pitiless length and each of the colleagues was jealous of the letters of the other in truth their relations to each other were so critical and perfect harmony so rare that they might also be described as natural enemies the court it is certain 
did not desire their perfect accord, nor, on the other hand, did it wish them to quarrel. It aimed to keep them on such terms that, without deranging the machinery of administration, each should be a check on the other. The governor, the intendant, and the supreme council or court were absolute masters of Canada under the pleasure of the king. Legislative, judicial, and executive power all centred in them. We have seen already the very unpromising beginnings of the Supreme Council. It had consisted at first of the governor, the bishop, and five councillors chosen by them. The intendant was soon added to form the ruling triumvirate. But the appointment of the councillors, the occasion of so many quarrels, was afterwards exercised by the king himself. Even the name of the council underwent a change in the interest of his autocracy, and he commanded that it should no longer be called the Supreme, but only the Superior Council. The same change had been imposed on all the high tribunals of France, under the shadow of the fleur-de-lis, the king alone was to be supreme. In 1675, the number of councillors was increased to seven, and in 1703, it was again increased to twelve, but the character of the council or court remained the same. It issued decrees for the civil, commercial, and financial government of the colony, and gave judgment in civil and criminal cases according to the royal ordinances and the contume de Paris. It exercised also the function of registration borrowed from the Parliament of Paris. That body, it will be remembered, had no analogy whatever with the English Parliament. Its ordinary functions were not legislative, but judicial, and it was composed of judges hereditary under certain conditions. Nevertheless, it had long acted as a check on the royal power through its right of registration. No royal edict had the force of law till entered upon its books, and this custom had so deep a root in the monarchical constitution of France that even Louis the Fourteenth, in the flush of his power, did not attempt to abolish it. He did better. He ordered his decrees to be registered, and the humbled Parliament submissively obeyed. In like manner, all edicts, ordinances, or declarations relating to Canada were entered on the registers of the Superior Council at Quebec. The order of registration was commonly affixed to the edict or other mandate, and nobody dreamed of disobeying it. The council or court had its attorney general, who heard complaints and brought them before the tribunal if he thought necessary. Its secretary, who kept its registers and its huissiers, or attendant officers. It sat once a week, and though it was the highest court of appeal, it exercised at first original jurisdiction in very trivial cases. It was empowered to establish subordinate courts or judges throughout the colony. Besides these, there was a judge appointed by the king for each of the three districts into which Canada was divided, those of Quebec, Three Rivers, and Montreal. To each of the three royal judges were joined a clerk and an attorney general under the supervision and control of the attorney general of the superior court, to which tribunal appeal lay from all the subordinate jurisdictions. The jurisdiction of the seigneurs within their own limits has already been mentioned. They were entitled by the terms of their grants to the exercise of high, middle, and low justice, but most of them were practically restricted to the last of the three, that is, to petty disputes between the habitants, including not more than sixty sous, or offences for which the fine did not exceed ten sous. Thus limited, their judgments were often useful in saving time, trouble, and money to the disputants. The corporate seniors of Montreal long continued to hold a feudal court in form, with attorney general, clerk, and huissier, but very few other seniors were in a condition to imitate them. 
added to all these tribunals was the bishop's court at quebec to try cases held to be within the province of the church the office of judge in canada was no sinecure the people were of a litigious disposition partly from their norman blood partly perhaps from the idleness of the long and tedious winter which gave full leisure for gossip and quarrel and partly from the very imperfect manner in which titles had been drawn and the boundaries of grants marked out whence ensued disputes without end between neighbour and neighbour i will not say writes the satirical la hontan that justice is more chaste and disinterested here than in france but at least if she is sold she is sold cheaper we do not pass through the clutches of advocates the talons of attorneys and the claws of clerks these vermin do not infest canada yet everybody pleads his own cause our themis is prompt and she does not bristle with fees costs and charges the judges have only four hundred francs a year a great temptation to look for law in the bottom of the suitor's purse four hundred francs not enough to buy a cap and gown so these gentry never wear them thus far la hontan now let us hear the king himself the greatest disorder which has hitherto existed in canada writes louis the fourteenth to the intendant mules has come from the small degree of liberty which the officers of justice have had in the discharge of their duties by reason of the violence to which they have been subjected and the part they have been obliged to take in the continual quarrels between the governor and the intendant insomuch that justice having been administered by cabal and animosity the inhabitants have hitherto been far from the tranquillity and repose which cannot be found in a place where everybody is compelled to take side with one party or another nevertheless on ordinary local questions between the inhabitants justice seems to have been administered on the whole fairly and judges of all grades often interposed in their personal capacity to bring parties to an agreement without a trial from head to foot the government kept its attitude of paternity beyond and above all the regular tribunals beyond and above the council itself was the independent jurisdiction lodged in the person of the king's man the intendant his commission empowered him if he saw fit to call any cause whatever before him for judgment and he judged exclusively the cases which concerned the king and those involving the relations of seigneur and vassal he appointed subordinate judges from whom there was appeal to him but from his directions as well as those of the superior council there was no appeal but to the king in his council of state on any monday morning one would have found the superior council in session at the antechamber of the governor's apartment at the chateau st louis the members sat at a round table at the head was the governor with the bishop on his right and the intendant on his left the councillors sat in the order of their appointment and the attorney-general also had his place at the board as la Honton says they were not in judicial robes but in their ordinary dress and all but the bishop wore swords the want of the cap and gown greatly disturbed the intendant mules and he begs the minister to consider how important it is that the councillors in order to inspire respect should appear in public in long black robes which on occasions of ceremony they should exchange for robes of red he thinks that the principal persons of the colony would thus be induced to train up their children to so enviable a dignity and he concludes as none of our councillors can afford to buy red robes i hope that the king will vouchsafe to send out nine such as for the black robes they can furnish those themselves the king did not respond and the nine robes never arrived the official dignity of the council was sometimes exposed to trials against 
which even red gowns might have provided an insufficient protection the same intendant urges that the tribunal ought to be provided immediately with a house of its own it is not decent he says that it should sit in the governor's antechamber any longer his guards and valets make such a noise that we cannot hear each other speak i have continually to tell them to keep quiet which causes them to make a thousand jokes at the councillors as they pass in and out as the governor and the council were often on ill terms the official head of the colony could not always be trusted to keep his attendants on their good behaviour the minister listened to the complaint of mules and adopted his suggestion that the government should buy the old brewery of talon a large structure of mingled timber and masonry on the banks of the st charles it was at an easy distance from the chateau passing the hotel dieu and descending the rock one reached it by a walk of a few minutes it was accordingly repaired partly rebuilt and fitted up to serve the double purpose of a lodging for the intendant and a courthouse henceforth the transformed brewery was known as the palace of the intendant or the palace of justice and here the council and inferior courts long continued to hold their sessions some of these inferior courts appear to have needed a lodging quite as much as the council the watchful mules informs the minister that the royal judge for the district of quebec was accustomed in winter with a view to saving fuel to hear causes and pronounce judgment by his own fireside in the midst of his children whose gambols disturbed the even distribution of justice the superior council was not a very harmonious body as its three chiefs the man of the sword the man of the church and the man of the law were often at variance the councillors attached themselves to one party or the other and hot disputes sometimes ensued the intendant though but third in rank presided at the sessions took votes pronounced judgment signed papers and called special meetings this matter of the presidency was for some time a source of contention between him and the governor till the question was set at rest by a decree of the king the intendants in their reports to the minister do not paint the council in flattering colours one of them complains that the councillors being busy with their farms neglect their official duties another says that they are all more or less in trade a third calls them uneducated persons of slight account allied to the chief families and chief merchants in canada in whose interest they make laws and he adds that as a year and a half or even two years usually elapse before the answer to a complaint is received from france they take advantage of this long interval to the injury of the king's service these and other similar charges betray the continual friction between the several branches of the government the councillors were rarely changed and they usually held office for life in a few cases the king granted to the son of a councillor yet living the right of succeeding his father when the charge should become vacant it was a post of honour and not of profit at least of direct profit the salaries were very small and coupled with a prohibition to receive fees judging solely by the terms of his commission the intendant was the ruling power in the colony he controlled all expenditure of public money and not only presided at the council but was clothed in his own person with independent legislative as well as judicial power he was authorized to issue ordinances having the force of law whenever he thought necessary and in the words of his commission to order everything as he shall see just and proper he was directed to be present at councils of war though war was the special province of his colleague and to protect soldiers and all others from official extortion and abuse 
that is, protect them from the governor. Yet there were practical difficulties in the way of his apparent power. The king, his master, was far away. But official jealousy was busy around him, and his patience was sometimes put to the proof. Thus the royal judge of Quebec had fallen into irregularities. I can do nothing with him, writes the intendant. He keeps on good terms with the governor and council, and sets me at naught. The governor had, as he thought, treated him amiss. You have told me, he writes to the minister, to bear everything from him and report to you, and he proceeds to recount his grievances. Again, the attorney general is bold to insolence, and needs to be repressed. The king's interposition is necessary. He modestly adds that the intendant is the only man in Canada whom his majesty can trust, and that he ought to have more power. These were far from being his only troubles. The enormous powers with which his commission clothed him were sometimes retrenched by contradictory instructions from the king, for this government, not of laws, but of arbitrary will, is marked by frequent inconsistencies. When he quarrelled with the governor, and the governor chanced to have strong friends at court, his position became truly pitiable. He was berated as an imperious master berates an offending servant. Your last letter is full of nothing but complaints. You have exceeded your authority study to know yourself and to understand clearly the difference there is between a governor and an intendant since you fail to comprehend the difference between you and the officer who represents the king's person you are in danger of being often condemned or rather of being recalled for his majesty cannot endure so many petty complaints founded on nothing but a certain quasi equality between the governor and you, which you assume, but which does not exist. Meddle with nothing beyond your function. Take good care to tell me nothing but the truth. You ask too many favors for your adherence. You must not spend more than you have authority to spend, or it will be taken out of your pay. In short, there are several letters from the minister Colbert to his colonial man-of-all work, which from beginning to end are one continued scold. The luckless intendant was liable to be held to account for the action of natural laws. If the population does not increase in proportion to the pains I take, writes the king to Duchesneau, you are to lay the blame on yourself for not having executed my principal order to promote marriages, and for having failed in the principal object for which I sent you to Canada. A great number of ordinances of intendants are preserved. They were usually read to the people at the doors of churches after mass, or sometimes by the curé from his pulpit. They relate to a great variety of subjects, regulation of inns and markets, poaching, preservation of a game, sales of brandy, rent of pews, stray hogs, mad dogs, tithes, matrimonial quarrels, fast driving, wards and guardians, weights and measures, nuisances, value of coinage, trespass on lands, building churches, observance of Sunday, preservation of timber, seigneur and vassal, settlement of boundaries, and many other matters. If a curé with some of his parishioners reported that his church or his house needed repair or rebuilding, the intendant issued an ordinance requiring all the inhabitants of the parish, both those who have consented and those who have not consented, to contribute materials and labor on pain of fine or other penalty. The militia captain of the coat was to direct the work and see that each parishioner did his due part, which was determined by the extent of his farm. 
so too if the grand voyeur an officer charged with the superintendence of highways reported that a new road was wanted or that an old one needed mending an ordinance of the intendant set the whole neighborhood at work upon it directed as in the other case by the captain of militia if children were left fatherless the intendant ordered the cure of the parish to assemble their relations or friends for the choice of a guardian if a censitaire did not clear his land and live on it the intendant took it from him and gave it back to the seigneur chimney sweeping having been neglected at quebec the intendant commands all householders promptly to do their duty in this respect and at the same time fixes the pay of the sweep at six sous a chimney another order forbids quarrelling in church another assigns pews in due order of precedence to the seigneur the captain of militia and the wardens the intendant Rodot, who seems to have been inspired even more than the others with the spirit of paternal intervention issued a mandate to the effect that whereas the people of montreal raise too many horses which prevents them from raising cattle and sheep being therein ignorant of their true interest now however we command that each inhabitant of the coats of this government shall hereafter own no more than two horses or mares and one foal the same to take effect after the sowing season of the ensuing year seventeen ten giving them time to rid themselves of their horses in excess of said number after which they will be expected to kill any of such excess that may remain in their possession many other ordinances if not equally preposterous are equally stringent such for example as that of the intendant bigot in which with a view of promoting agriculture and protecting the morals of the farmers by saving them from the temptations of cities he proclaims to them we prohibit and forbid you to remove to this town quebec under any pretext whatever without our permission in writing on pain of being expelled and sent back to your farms your furniture and goods confiscated and a fine of fifty livres laid upon you for the benefit of the hospitals and furthermore we forbid all inhabitants of the city to let houses or rooms to persons coming from the country on pain of a fine of a hundred livres also applicable to the hospitals at about the same time a royal edict designed to prevent the undue subdivision of farms forbade the country people except such as were authorized to live in villages to build a house or barn on any piece of land less than one and a half arpents wide and thirty arpents long while a subsequent ordinance of the intendant commands the immediate demolition of certain houses built in contravention of the edict the spirit of absolutism is everywhere apparent it is of very great consequence writes the intendant mules that the people should not be left at liberty to speak their minds hence public meetings were jealously restricted even those held by parishioners under the eye of the cure to estimate the cost of a new church seems to have required a special license from the intendant during a number of years a meeting of the principal inhabitants of quebec was called in spring and autumn by the council to discuss the price and quality of bread the supply of firewood and other similar matters the council commissioned two of its members to preside at these meetings and on hearing their report took what action it thought best thus after the meeting held in february sixteen eighty six it issued a decree in which after a long and formal preamble it solemnly ordained that besides white bread and light brown bread all bakers shall hereafter make dark brown bread whenever the same shall be required such assemblies so controlled could scarcely one would think 
wound the tenderest susceptibility of authority yet there was evident distrust of them and after a few years this modest shred of self-government is seen no more the syndic too that functionary whom the people of the towns were at first allowed to choose under the eye of the authorities was conjured out of existence by a word from the king signor censitaire and citizen were prostrate alike in flat subjection to the royal will they were not free even to go home to france no inhabitant of canada man or woman could do so without leave and several intendants expressed their belief that without this precaution there would soon be a falling off in the population in sixteen seventy one the council issued a curious decree one paul de poy had been heard to say that there is nothing like writings oneself and that when the English cut off the head of Charles I, they did a good thing, with other discourse to the like effect. The council declared him guilty of speaking ill of royalty in the person of the King of England, and uttering words tending to sedition. He was condemned to be dragged from prison by the public executioner, and led in his shirt with a rope about his neck and a torch in his hand, to the gate of the chateau st louis there to beg pardon of the king thence to the pillory of the lower town to be branded with a fleur-de-lis on the cheek and set in the stocks for half an hour then to be led back to prison and put in irons till the information against him shall be completed if a reverence to royalty was thus rigorously chastised the reverence to god was threatened with still sharper penalties Louis the Fourteenth, ever haunted with the fear of the devil, sought protection against him by his famous edict against swearing, duly registered on the books of the council at Quebec. It is our will and pleasure, says this pious mandate, that all persons convicted of profane swearing or blaspheming the name of God, the Most Holy Virgin, his mother or the saints, be condemned for the first offence to a pecuniary fine according to their possessions and the greatness and enormity of the oath and blasphemy and if those thus punished repeat the said oaths then for the second third and fourth time they shall be condemned to a double triple and quadruple fine and for the fifth time they shall be set in the pillory on sunday or other festival days there to remain from eight in the morning till one in the afternoon exposed to all sorts of opprobrium and abuse and be condemned besides to a heavy fine and for the sixth time they shall be led to the pillory and there have the upper lip cut with a hot iron and for the seventh time they shall be led to the pillory and have the lower lip cut and if by reason of obstinacy and inveterate bad habit they continue after all these punishments to utter the said oaths and blasphemies it is our will and command that they have the tongue completely cut out so that thereafter they cannot utter them again all those should hear anybody swear were further required to report the fact to the nearest judge within twenty-four hours on pain of fine this is far from being the only instance in which the temporal power lends aid to the spiritual among other cases the following is worth mentioning louis gaboury an inhabitant of the island of orleans charged with eating meat in lent without asking leave of the priest was condemned by the local judge to be tied three hours to a stake in public and then led to the door of the chapel there on his knees with head bare and hands clasped to ask pardon of god and the king the culprit appealed to the council which revoked the sentence and imposed only a fine the due subordination of households had its share of attention servants who deserted their masters were to be set in the pillory for the first offence and whipped and branded for the second 
while any person harboring them was to pay a fine of twenty francs on the other hand nobody was allowed to employ a servant without a license in case of heinous charges torture of the accused was permitted under the french law and it was sometimes practised in canada condemned murderers and felons were occasionally tortured before being strangled and the dead body enclosed in a kind of iron cage was left hanging for months at the top of cape diamond a terror to children and a warning to evildoers yet on the whole canadian justice tried by the standard of the time was neither vindictive nor cruel in reading the voluminous correspondence of governors and intendants the minister and the king nothing is more apparent than the interest with which in the early part of his reign louis the fourteenth regarded his colony one of the faults of his rule is the excess of his benevolence for not only did he give money to support parish priests build churches and aid the seminary the ursulines the missions and the hospitals but he established a fund destined among other objects to relieve indigent persons subsidized nearly every branch of trade and industry and in other instances did for the colonies what they would far better have learned to do for themselves meanwhile the officers of government were far from suffering an excess of royal beneficence la honton says that the local governor of three rivers would die of hunger if besides his pay he did not gain something by trade with the indians and that perrault local governor of montreal with one thousand crowns of salary traded to such purpose that in a few years he made fifty thousand crowns this trade it may be observed was in violation of the royal edicts the pay of the governor-general varied from time to time when la poterie wrote it was twelve thousand francs a year besides three thousand which he received in his capacity of local governor for quebec this would hardly tempt a frenchman of rank to expatriate himself and yet some at least of the governors came out to the colony for the express purpose of mending their fortunes indeed the higher nobility could scarcely in time of peace have other motives for going there the court and the army were their element and to be elsewhere was banishment we shall see hereafter by what means they sought compensation for their exile in canadian forests loud complaints sometimes found their way to versailles a memorial address to the regent duke of orleans immediately after the king's death declares that the ministers of state who have been the real managers of the colony have made their creatures and relations governors and intendants and set them free from all responsibility high colonial officers pursues the writer come home rich while the colony languishes almost to perishing as for lesser offices they were multiplied to satisfy needy retainers till lean and starving canada was covered with official leeches sucking in famished desperation at her bloodless veins the whole system of administration centred in the king who to borrow the formula of his edicts in the fullness of our power and our certain knowledge was supposed to direct the whole machine from its highest functions to its pettiest intervention in private affairs that this theory like all extreme theories of government was an illusion is no fault of louis the fourteenth hard-working monarch as he was he spared no pains to guide his distant colony in the paths of prosperity the prolix letters of governors and intendants were carefully studied and many of the replies signed by the royal hand enter into details of surprising minuteness that the king himself wrote these letters is incredible but in the early part of his reign he certainly directed and controlled them at a later date when more absorbing interests engrossed him he could no longer study in person the long-winded dispatches of his canadian officers 
they were usually addressed to the minister of state who caused abstracts to be made from them for the king's use and perhaps for his own the minister or the minister's secretary could suppress or colour as he or those who influenced him saw fit in the latter half of his too long reign when cares calamities and humiliations were thickening around the king another influence was added to make the theoretical supremacy of his royal will more than ever a mockery that prince of analysts saint simon has painted louis the fourteenth ruling his realm from the bedchamber of madame de maintenon seated with his minister at a small table beside the fire the king in an armchair the minister on a stool with his bag of papers on a second stool near him in another armchair at another table on the other side of the fire sat the sedate favourite busy to all appearances with a book or a piece of tapestry but listening to everything that passed she rarely spoke says st simon except when the king asked her opinion which he often did and then she answered with great deliberation and gravity she never or very rarely showed a partiality for any measures still less for any person but she had an understanding with the minister who never dared do otherwise than she wished whenever any favour or appointment was in question the business was settled between them beforehand she would send to the minister that she wanted to speak to him and he did not dare bring the matter on the carpet till he had received her orders st simons next recounts the subtle methods by which maintenon and the minister her tool beguiled the king to do their will while never doubting that he was doing his own he thought concludes the analyst that it was he alone who disposed of all appointments while in reality he disposed of very few indeed except on the rare occasions when he had taken a fancy to somebody or when somebody whom he wanted to favour had spoken to him in behalf of somebody else add to this the rarity of communication with the distant colony the ships from france arrived at quebec in july august or september and returned in november the machine of canadian government wound up once a year was expected to run unaided at least a twelvemonth indeed it was often left to itself for two years such was sometimes the tardiness of the overburdened government in answering the dispatches of its colonial agents it is no matter of surprise that a writer well versed in its affairs calls canada the country of abuses End of chapter nineteen Chapter Twenty of the Old Regime in Canada by Francis Parkman, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty, sixteen sixty three to seventeen sixty three. Trade and Industry. We have seen the head of the colony, its guiding intellect and will. It remains to observe its organs of nutrition whatever they might have been under a different treatment they were perverted and enfeebled by the regimen to which they were subjected the spirit of restriction and monopoly had ruled from the beginning the old governor lauzon seigneur for a while of a great part of the colony held that montreal had no right to trade directly with france but must draw all her supplies from quebec and this preposterous claim was revived in the time of Mézy. The successive companies to whose hands the colony was consigned had a baneful effect on individual enterprise. In 1674 the charter of the West India Company was revoked, and trade was declared open to all subjects of the king. Yet commerce was still condemned to wear the ball and chain. 
new restrictions were imposed meant for good but resulting in evil merchants not resident in the colony were forbidden all trade direct or indirect with the indians they were also forbidden to sell any goods at retail except in august september and october to trade anywhere in canada above quebec and to sell clothing or domestic articles already made this last restriction was designed to develop colonial industry no person resident or not could trade with the english colonies or go thither without a special passport and rigid examination by the military authorities foreign trade of any kind was stiffly prohibited in seventeen nineteen after a new company had engrossed the beaver trade its agents were empowered to enter all houses in canada whether ecclesiastical or secular and search them for foreign goods which when found were publicly burned in the next year the royal council ordered that vessels engaging in foreign trade should be captured by form of arms like pirates and confiscated along with their cargoes while anybody having an article of foreign manufacture in his possession was subjected to a heavy fine attempts were made to fix the exact amount of profit which merchants from france should be allowed to make in the colony one of the first acts of the superior council was to order them to bring their invoices immediately before that body which thereupon affixed prices to each article the merchant who sold and the purchaser who bought above this tariff were alike condemned to heavy penalties and so too was the merchant who chose to keep his goods rather than sell them at the price ordained resident merchants on the other hand were favored to the utmost they could sell at what price they saw fit and according to la hontan they made great profit by the sale of laces ribbons watches jewels and similar superfluities to the poor but extravagant a considerable number of the non-resident merchants were huguenots for most of the importations were from the old huguenot city of rochelle no favor was shown them they were held under rigid restraint and forbidden to exercise their religion or to remain in the colony during winter without special license this sometimes bore very hard upon them the governor de nonville an ardent catholic states the case of one bernon who had done great service to the colony and whom la hontan mentions as the principal french merchant in the canadian trade it is a pity says de nonville that he cannot be converted as he is a huguenot the bishop wants me to order him home this autumn which i have done though he carries on a large business and a great deal of money remains due to him here for a long time the ships from france went home empty except a favored few which carried furs or occasionally a load of dried peas or of timber payment was made in money when there was any in canada or in bills of exchange the colony drawing everything from france and returning little besides beaver skins remained under a load of debt french merchants were discouraged and shipments from france languished as for the trade with the west indies which talon had tried to precept and example to build up the intendant reports in sixteen eighty that it had nearly ceased though six years later it grew again to the modest proportions of three vessels loaded with wheat the besetting evil of trade and industry in canada was the habit they contracted and were encouraged to contract of depending on the direct aid of government not a new enterprise was set on foot without a petition to the king to lend a helping hand sometimes the petition was sent through the governor sometimes through the intendant and it was rarely refused denonville writes that the merchants of quebec by a combined effort had sent a vessel of sixty tons to france with colonial produce and he asks 
that the royal commissaries at rochefort be instructed to buy the whole cargo in order to encourage so deserving an enterprise one hezure set up a sawmill at mal bay finding a large stock of planks and timber on his hands he begs the king to send two vessels to carry them to france and the king accordingly did so a similar request was made in behalf of another sawmill at st paul's bay denonville announces that one riverin wishes to embark in the whale and cod fishery and though strong in zeal he is weak in resources the minister replies that he is to be encouraged and that his majesty will favourably consider his enterprise various gifts were soon after made him he now took to himself a partner the sieur chalons whereupon the governor writes to ask the minister's protection for them the basques he says formerly carried on this fishery but some monopoly or other put a stop to it the remedy he proposes is homeopathic he asks for another monopoly for the two partners louis joliet the discoverer of the mississippi made a fishing station on the island of anticosti and he begs help from the king on the ground that his fishery will furnish a good and useful employment to young men the sieur vitry wished to begin a fishery of white porpoises and he begs the king to give him two thousand pounds of cod line and two thousand pounds of one and two inch rope his request was granted on which he asked for five hundred livres the money was given him and the next year he asked to have the gift renewed the king was very anxious to develop the fisheries of the colony his majesty writes the minister wishes you to induce the inhabitants to unite with the merchants for this object and to incite them by all sorts of means to overcome their natural laziness since there is no other way of saving them from the misery in which they now are i wish says the zealous denonville that fisheries could be well established to give employment to our young men and prevent them from running wild in the woods and he adds mournfully they the fisheries are enriching boston at our expense they are our true minds urges the intendant mules but the english of boston have got possession of those of acadia which belong to us and we ought to prevent it it was not prevented and the canadian fisheries like other branches of canadian industry remained in a state of almost hopeless languor the government applied various stimulants one of these proposed by the intendant duchesneau is characteristic he advises the formation of a company which should have the exclusive right of exporting fish but which on its part should be required to take at a fixed price all that the inhabitants should bring them this notable plan did not find favour with the king it was practised however in the case of beaver skins and also in that of wood ashes the farmers of the revenue were required to take this last commodity at a fixed price on their own risk and in any quantity offered they remonstrated saying that it was unsaleable adding that if the inhabitants would but take the trouble to turn it into potash it might be possible to find a market for it the king released them entirely coupling his order to that effect with the eulogy of free trade in all departments of industry the appeals for help are endless governors and intendants are so many sturdy beggars for the languishing colony send us money to build storehouses to which the inhabitants can bring their product and receive goods from the government in exchange send us a teacher to make sailors of our young men it is a pity the colony should remain in such a state for want of instruction for youth we want a surgeon there is none in canada who can set a bone send us some tilers brickmakers and potters 
send us ironworkers to work our mines it is to be wished that his majesty would send us all sorts of artisans especially potters and glass workers our canadians need aid and instruction in their fisheries they need pilots in sixteen eighty eight the intendant reported that canada was entirely without either pilots or sailors and as late as seventeen twelve the engineer catalon informed the government that though the st lawrence was dangerous a pilot was rarely to be had there ought to be trade with the west indies and other places urged another writer everybody says it is best but nobody will undertake it our merchants are too poor or else are engrossed by the fur trade the languor of commerce made agriculture languish it is of no use now writes mules in sixteen eighty two to raise any crops except what each family wants for itself in vain the government sent out seeds for distribution in vain intendants lectured the farmers and lavished well-meant advice tillage remained careless and slovenly if says the all-observing catalon the soil were not better cultivated in europe than here three-fourths of the people would starve he complains that the festivals of the church are so numerous that not ninety working days are left during the whole working season the people he says ought to be compelled to build granaries to store their crops instead of selling them in autumn for almost nothing and every habitant should be required to keep two or three sheep the intendant champigny calls for seed of hemp and flax and promises to visit the farms and show the people the lands best suited for their culture he thinks that favours should be granted to those who raise hemp and flax as well as to those who marry denonville is of opinion that each habitant should be compelled to raise a little hemp every year and that the king should then buy it off him at a high price it will be well he says to make use of severity while at the same time holding out a hope of gain and he begs that weavers be sent out to teach the women and girls who spend the winter in idleness how to weave and spin weaving and spinning however as well as the culture of hemp and flax were neglected till seventeen o five when the loss of a ship laden with goods for the colony gave the spur to home industry and madame de repentigny set the example of making a kind of coarse blanket of nettle and linden bark the jealousy of colonial manufactures shown by england appears but rarely in the relations of france with canada according to its light the french government usually did its best to stimulate canadian industry with what results we have just seen there was afterwards some improvement in seventeen fourteen the intendant begon reported that coarse fabrics of wool and linen were made that the sisters of the congregation wore cloth for their own habits as good as the same stuffs in france that black cloth was made for priests and blue cloth for the pupils of the colleges the inhabitants he says have been taught these arts by necessity they were naturally adroit at handiwork of all kinds and during the last half century of the french rule when the population had settled into comparative stability many of the mechanic arts were practised with success notwithstanding the assertion of the abbe latour that everything but bread and meat had still to be brought from france this change may be said to date from the peace of utrecht or a few years before it at that time one du plessis had a new vessel on the stocks catalon who states the fact calls it the beginning of shipbuilding in canada evidently ignorant that talon had made a fruitless beginning more than forty years before of the arts of ornament 
not much could have been expected but strangely enough they were in somewhat better condition than the useful arts the nuns of the hotel dieu made artificial flowers for altars and shrines under the direction of mother juchereau and the boys of the seminary were taught to make carvings in wood for the decoration of churches pierre son of the merchant lebert had a turn for painting and made religious pictures described as very indifferent his sister jeanne an enthusiastic devotee made embroideries for vestments and altars and her work was much admired the colonial finances were not prosperous in the absence of coin beaver skin long served as currency in sixteen sixty nine the council declared wheat a legal tender at four francs the minot or three french bushels and five years later all creditors were ordered to receive moose skins in payment at the market rate coin would not remain in the colony if the company or king sent any thither it went back in the returning ships the government devised a remedy a coinage was ordered for canada one-fourth less in value than that of france thus the canadian libra or franc was worth in reality fifteen sous instead of twenty this shallow expedient produced only a nominal rise of prices and coin fled the colony as before trade was carried on for a time by means of negotiable notes payable in furs goods or farm produce in sixteen eighty five the intendant mules issued a card currency he had no money to pay the soldiers and not knowing he informs the minister to what saint to make my vows the idea occurred to me of putting in circulation notes made of cards each cut into four pieces and i have issued an ordinance commanding the inhabitants to receive them in payment the cards were common playing cards and each piece was stamped with a fleur-de-lis and a crown and signed by the governor the intendant and the clerk of the treasury at quebec the example of mules found ready imitation governors and intendants made card money whenever they saw fit and being worthless everywhere but in canada it showed no disposition to escape the colony it was declared convertible not into coin but into bills of exchange and this conversion could only take place at brief specified periods the currency used in canada says a writer in the last years of the french rule has no value as a representative of money it is the sign of a sign it was card representing paper and this paper was very often dishonoured in seventeen fourteen the amount of card rubbish had risen to two million livres confidence was lost and trade was half dead the minister Ponchartrain came to the rescue and promised to redeem it at half its nominal value the holders preferred to lose half than the whole and accepted the terms a few of the cards were redeemed at the rate named then the government broke faith and payment ceased this afflicting news says a writer of the time was brought out by the vessel which sailed from france last july in seventeen seventeen the government made another proposal and the cards were converted into bills of exchange at the same time a new issue was made which it was declared should be the last this issue was promptly redeemed but twelve years later another followed it in the interval a certain quantity of coins circulated in the colony but it underwent fluctuations through the intervention of government and within eight years at least four edicts were issued affecting its value then came more promises to pay till in the last bitter years of its existence the colony floundered in drifts of worthless paper one characteristic grievance was added to the countless woes of canadian commerce the government was so jealous of popular meetings of all kinds 
that for a long time it forbade merchants to meet together for discussing their affairs and it was not till seventeen seventeen that the establishment of a bourse or exchange was permitted at quebec and montreal in respect of taxation canada as compared with france had no reason to complain if the king permitted governors and intendants to make card money he permitted nobody to impose taxes but himself the canadians paid no direct civil tax except in a few instances where temporary and local assessments were ordered for special objects it was the fur trade on which the chief burden fell one-fourth of the beaver skins and one-tenth of the moose hides belonged to the king and wine brandy and tobacco contributed a duty of ten per cent during a long course of years these were the only imports the king also retained the exclusive right of the fur trade at tadoussac a vast tract of wilderness extending from st paul's bay to a point eighty leagues down the st lawrence and stretching indefinitely northward towards hudson's bay formed a sort of royal preserve whence every settler was rigidly excluded the farmers of the revenue had their trading houses at tadoussac whither the northern tribes until war pestilence and brandy consumed them brought every summer a large quantity of furs when in sixteen seventy four the west india company to whom these imposts had been granted was extinguished the king resumed possession of them. The various duties, along with the trade of Tadoussac, were now farmed out to one Oudiette and his associates, who paid the crown 350,000 livres for their privilege. We come now to a trade far more important than all the rest together, one which absorbed the enterprise of the colony, drained the life-sap from other branches of commerce, and even more than a vicious system of government kept them in a state of chronic debility the hardy adventurous lawless fascinating fur trade in the eighteenth century canada exported a moderate quantity of timber wheat the herb called ginseng and a few other commodities but from first to last she lived chiefly on beaver skins the government tried without ceasing to control and regulate this traffic but it never succeeded it aimed above all things to bring the trade home to the colonists to prevent them from going to the indians and induce the indians to come to them to this end a great annual fair was established by order of the king at montreal thither every summer a host of savages came down from the lakes in their bark canoes a place was assigned them at a little distance from the town they landed drew up their canoes in a line on the bank took out their packs of beaver skins set up their wigwams slung their kettles and encamped for the night on the next day there was a grand council on the common between st paul street and the river speeches of compliment were made amid a solemn smoking of pipes the governor-general was usually present seated in an armchair while the visitors formed a ring about him ranged in the order of their tribes on the next day the trade began in the same place merchants of high and low degree brought up their goods from quebec and every inhabitant of montreal of any substance sought a share in the profit their booths were set along the palisades of the town and each had an interpreter to whom he usually promised a certain portion of his gains the scene abounded in those contrasts not always edifying but always picturesque which mark the whole course of french canadian history here was a throng of indians armed with bows and arrows war clubs or the cheap guns of the trade some of them completely naked except for the feathers on their heads and the paint on their faces french bushrangers tricked out with savage finery 
merchants and habitants in their coarse and plain attire and the grave priests of st sulpice robed in black order and sobriety were their watchwords but the wild gathering was beyond their control the prohibition to sell brandy could rarely be enforced and the fair ended at times in a pandemonium of drunken frenzy the rapacity of trade and the license of savages and coureurs de bois had completely transformed the pious settlement a similar fair was established at three rivers for the algonquin tribes north of that place these yearly markets did not fully answer the desired object there was a constant tendency among the inhabitants of canada to form settlements above montreal in order to intercept the indians on their way down drench them with brandy and get their furs from them at low rates in advance of the fair such settlements were forbidden but not prevented the audacious squatter defied edict and ordinance and the fury of drunken savages and boldly planted himself in the path of the descending trade nor is this a matter of surprise for he was usually the secret agent of some high colonial officer an intendant the local governor or the governor-general who often used his power to enforce the law against others and to violate it himself this was not all for the more youthful and vigorous part of the male population soon began to escape into the woods and trade with the indians far beyond the limits of the remotest settlements here too many of them were in league with the authorities who denounced the abuse while secretly favouring the portion of it in which they themselves were interested the home government unable to prevent the evil tried to regulate it licenses were issued for the forest trade their number was limited to twenty-five and the privileges which they conferred varied at different periods in la hontan's time each license authorized the departure of two canoes loaded with goods one canoe only was afterwards allowed bearing three men with about four hundred pounds of freight the licenses were sometimes sold for the profit of government but many were given to widows of officers and other needy persons to the hospitals or to favorites and retainers of the governor those who could not themselves use them sold them to merchants or voyageurs at a price varying from a thousand to eighteen hundred francs they were valid for a year and a half and each canoeman had a share in the profits which if no accident happened were very large the license system was several times suppressed and renewed again but like the fair at montreal it failed completely to answer its purpose and restrain the young men of canada from a general exodus into the wilderness the most characteristic features of the canadian fur trade still remain to be seen Houdiette and his associates were not only charged with collecting the revenue but were also vested with an exclusive right of transporting all the beaver skins of the colony to france on their part they were compelled to receive all beaver skins brought to their magazines and after deducting the fourth belonging to the king to pay for the rest at a fixed price this price was graduated to the different qualities of the fur but the average cost to the collectors was a little more than three francs a pound the inhabitants could barter their furs with merchants but the merchants must bring them all to the magazines of oudiette who paid in receipts convertible into bills of exchange he soon found himself burdened with such a mass of beaver skins that the market was completely glutted the french hatters refused to take them all and for the part which they consent to take they paid chiefly in hats which oudiette was not allowed to sell in france but only in the french west indies where few people wanted them an unlucky fashion of small hats diminished the consumption of fur and increased his embarrassments 
as did also a practice common among the hatters of mixing rabbit fur with the beaver in his extremity he bethought himself of setting up a hat factory for himself under the name of a certain licensed hatter thinking thereby to alarm his customers into buying his stock the other hatters rose in wrath and petitioned the minister the new factory was suppressed and oudiette soon became bankrupt another company of farmers of the revenue took his place with similar results the action of the law of supply and demand was completely arrested by the peremptory edict which with a view to the prosperity of the colony and the profit of the king required the company to take every beaver skin offered all canada thinking itself sure of its price rushed into the beaver trade and the accumulation of unsaleable furs became more and more suffocating the farmers of the revenue could not meet their engagements their bills of exchange were unpaid and canada was filled with distress and consternation in seventeen hundred a change of system was ordered the monopoly of exporting beaver was placed in the hands of a company formed of the chief inhabitants of canada some of them hesitated to take the risk but the government was not to be trifled with and the minister Ponchartrain wrote in terms so peremptory and so menacing to the recusants that in the words of a writer of the time he shut everybody's mouth about a hundred and fifty merchants accordingly subscribed to the stock of the new company and immediately petitioned the king for a ship and a loan of seven hundred thousand francs they were required to take off the hands of the farmers of the revenue an accumulation of more than six hundred thousand pounds of beaver for which however they were to pay but half its usual price the market of france absolutely refused it and the directors of the new company saw no better course than to burn three-fourths of the troublesome and perishable commodity nor was this the first resort to this strange expedient one cannot repress a feeling of indignation at the fate of the interesting and unfortunate animals uselessly sacrificed to a false economic system in order to rid themselves of what remained the directors begged the king to issue a decree requiring all hatters to put at least three ounces of genuine beaver fur into each hat all was in vain the affairs of the company fell into a confusion which was aggravated by the bad faith of some of its chief members in seventeen o seven it was succeeded by another company to whose magazines every habitant or merchant was ordered to bring every beaver skin in his possession within forty-eight hours and the company like its predecessors was required to receive it and pay for it in written promises again the market was overwhelmed with a surfeit of beaver again the bills of exchange were unpaid and all was confusion and distress among the memorials and petitions to which this state of things gave birth there is one conspicuous by the presence of good sense and the absence of self-interest the writer proposes that there should be no more monopoly but that every one should be free to buy beaver skins and send them to france subject only to a moderate duty of entry the proposal was not accepted in seventeen twenty one the monopoly of exporting beaver skins was given to the new west india company but this time it was provided that the government should direct from time to time according to the capacities of the market the quantity of furs which the company should be forced to receive out of the beaver trade rose a huge evil baneful to the growth and the morals of canada all that was most active and vigorous in the colony took to the woods and escaped from the control of intendants councils and priests to the savage freedom of the wilderness not only were the possible profits great but in the pursuit of them there was a fascinating element of adventure and danger the bushrangers or coureurs de bois 
were to the king an object of horror they defeated his plans for the increase of the population and shocked his native instinct of discipline and order edict after edict was directed against them and more than once the colony presented the extraordinary spectacle of the greater part of its young men turned into forest outlaws but severity was dangerous the offenders might be driven over to the english or converted into a lawless banditti renegades of civilization and the faith therefore clemency alternated with rigor and declarations of amnesty with edicts of proscription neither threats nor blandishments were of much avail we hear of seigneuries abandoned farms turned again into forests wives and children left in destitution the exodus of the coureur de bois would take at times the character of an organized movement the famous de Lutte is said to have made a general combination of the young men of canada to follow him into the woods their plan was to be absent four years in order that the edicts against them might have time to relent the intendant duchesneau reported that eight hundred men out of a population of less than ten thousand souls had vanished from sight in the immensity of a boundless wilderness whereupon the king ordered that any person going into the woods without a license should be whipped and branded for the first offence and sent for life to the galleys for the second the order was more easily given than enforced i must not conceal from you monseigneur again writes duchesneau that the disobedience of the coureur de bois has reached such a point that everybody boldly contravenes the king's interdictions that there is no longer any concealment and that parties are collected with astonishing insolence to go and trade in the indian country i have done all in my power to prevent this evil which may cause the ruin of the colony i have enacted ordinances against the coureur de bois against the merchants who furnish them with goods against the gentlemen and others who harbour them and even against those who have any knowledge of them and will not inform the local judges all has been in vain inasmuch as some of the most considerable families are interested with them and the governor lets them go on and even shares their profits you are aware monseigneur writes denonville some years later that the courier de bois are a great evil but you are not aware how great this evil is it deprives the country of its effective men makes them indocile debauched and incapable of discipline and turns them into pretended nobles wearing the sword and decked out with lace both they and their relations who all affect to be gentlemen and ladies as for cultivating the soil they will not hear of it this along with the scattered condition of the settlements causes their children to be as unruly as children being brought up in the same manner not that there are not some very good people out there but they are in a minority in another dispatch he enlarges on their vagabond and lawless ways their indifference to marriage and the mischief caused by their example describes how on their return from the woods they swagger like lords spend all their gains in dress and drunken revelry and despise the peasants whose daughters they will not deign to marry though they are peasants themselves it was a curious scene when a party of coureurs de bois returned from their rovings montreal was their harboring place and they conducted themselves much like the crew of a man-of-war paid off after a long voyage as long as their beaver skins lasted they set no bounds to their riot every house in the place we are told was turned into a drinking shop the newcomers were bedizened with a strange mixture of french and italian finery while some of them with instincts more thoroughly savage 
stalked about the streets as naked as a potawatami or a sioux the clamour of tongues was prodigious and gambling and drinking filled the day and the night when at last they were sober again they sought absolution for their sins nor could the priests venture to bear too hard on their unruly penitents lest they should break wholly with the church and dispense thenceforth with her sacraments under such leaders as de Lut, the courier de bois built forts of palisades at various points throughout the west and northwest they had a post of this sort at detroit some time before its permanent settlement as well as others on lake superior and in the valley of the mississippi they occupied them as long as it suited their purposes and then abandoned them to the next comer michilimackinac was however their chief resort and thence they could set out two or three together to roam for hundreds of miles through the endless meshwork of interlocking lakes and rivers which seems the northern wilderness no wonder that a year or two of bush ranging spoiled them for civilization though not a very valuable member of society and though a thorn in the side of princes and rulers the courier de bois had his uses at least from an artistic point of view and his strange figure sometimes brutally savage but oftener marked with the lines of a daredevil courage and a reckless thoughtless gaiety will always be joined to the memories of that grand world of woods which the nineteenth century is fast civilizing out of existence at least he is picturesque and with his red-skin companion serves to animate forest scenery perhaps he could sometimes feel without knowing how he felt them the charms of the savage nature that had adopted him rude as he was her voice may not always have been meaningless for one who knew her haunts so well deep recesses where veiled in foliage some wild shy rivulet steals with timid music through breathless caves of verdure gulfs where feathered crags rise like castle walls where the noonday sun pierces with keen rays athwart the torrent and the mossed arms of fallen pines cast wavering shadows on the illumined foam pools of liquid crystal turned emerald in the reflected green of impending woods rocks on whose rugged front the gleam of sunlit waters dances in quivering light ancient trees hurled headlong by the storm to damn the raging stream with their forlorn and savage ruin or the stern depths of immemorial forests dim and silent as a cavern columned with innumerable trunks each like an atlas upholding its world of leaves and sweating perpetual moisture down its dark and channelled rind some strong in youth some grisly with decrepit age nightmares of strange distortion gnarled and knotted with wens and goiters roots intertwined beneath like serpents petrified in an agony of contorted strife green and glistening mosses carpeting the rough ground mantling the rocks turning pulpy stumps to mounds of verdure and swathing fallen trunks as bent in the impotence of rottenness they lie outstretched over knoll and hollow like mouldering reptiles of the primeval world while around and on through them springs the young growth that battens on their decay the forest devouring its own dead or to turn from its funereal shade to the light and life of the open woodland the sheen of sparkling lakes and mountains basking in the glory of the summer noon flecked by the shadows of passing clouds that sail on snowy wings across the transparent azure yet it would be false coloring to paint the half-savage courier de bois as a romantic lover of nature he liked the woods because they emancipated him from restraint he liked the lounging ease of the campfire and the license of indian villages his life has a dark and ugly side which is nowhere drawn more strongly than in a letter written by the jesuit 
Carheel to the intendant Champigny. It was at a time when some of the outlying forest posts, originally either missions or transient stations of Courier de Bois, had received regular garrisons. Carheel writes from Michilimackinac and describes the state of things around him like one whom long familiarity with them had stripped of every illusion. But here, for the present, we pause, for the father touches on other matters than the courier de bois, and we reserve him and his letter for the next chapter. End of chapter 20《Chapter Twenty One of the Old Regime in Canada by Francis Parkman, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Chapter Twenty One, 1663 to 1702. The Missions, the Brandy Question. For a year or two after de Tracy had chastised the Mohawks and humbled the other Iroquois nations, all was rose color on the side of that dreaded confederacy the jesuits defiant as usual of hardship and death had begun their ruined missions anew bruyas took the mission of the martyrs among the mohawks millet that of st francis xavier among the oneidas lamberville that of st john the baptist among the onondagas Carheel, that of St. Joseph among the Cayugas, and Raffi and Julien Garnier shared between them the three missions of the Senecas. The Iroquois, after their punishment, were in a frame of mind so hopeful that the fathers imagined for a moment that they were all on the point of accepting the faith. This was a consummation earnestly to be wished not only from a religious but also from a political point of view the complete conversion of the iroquois meant their estrangement from the heretic english and dutch and their firm alliance with the french it meant safety for canada and it ensured for her the fur trade of the interior freed from english rivalry hence the importance of these missions and hence their double character while the jesuit toiled to convert his savage hosts he watched them at the same time with the eye of a shrewd political agent reported at quebec the result of his observations and by every means in his power sought to alienate them from england and attach them to france their ample conversion by placing them wholly under his influence would have outweighed in political value all other agencies combined but the flattering hopes of the earlier years soon vanished some petty successes against other tribes so elated the iroquois that they ceased to care for french alliance or french priests then a few petty reverses would dash their spirits and dispose them again to listen to jesuit councils every success of a war party was a loss to the faith and every reverse was a gain meanwhile a more repulsive or a more critical existence than that of a jesuit father in an iroquois town is scarcely conceivable the torture of prisoners turned into a horrible festivity for the whole tribe foul and crazy orgies in which as the priest thought the powers of darkness took a special delight drunken riots the work of dutch brandy when he was forced to seek refuge from death in his chapel a sanctuary which superstitious fear withheld the indians from violating these and a thousand disgusts and miseries filled the record of his days and he bore them all in patience not only were the early and canadian jesuits men of an intense religious zeal but they were also men who lived not for themselves but for their order their faults were many and great 
but the grandeur of their self-devotion towers conspicuous over all at Kanawaga, near montreal may still be seen the remnants of a mission of converted iroquois whom the jesuits induced to leave the temptations of their native towns and settle here under the wing of the church they served as a bulwark against the english and sometimes did good service in time of war at sillery near quebec a band of abenakis escaping from the neighbourhood of the english towards the close of philip's war formed another mission of similar character the sulpicians had a third at the foot of the mountain of montreal where two massive stone towers of the fortified indian town are standing to this day all these converted savages as well as those of lorette and other missions far and near were used as allies in war and launched in scalping parties against the border settlements of new england not only the sulpicians but also the seminary priests of quebec the recollets and even the capuchins had missions more or less important and more or less permanent but the jesuits stood always in the van of religious and political propagandism and all the forest tribes felt their influence from acadia and maine to the plains beyond the mississippi next in importance to their iroquois missions were those among the algonquins of the northern lakes here was the grand domain of the beaver trade and the chief woes of the missionary sprang not from the indians but from his own countrymen beaver skins had produced an effect akin to that of gold in our own day and the deepest recesses of the wilderness were invaded by eager seekers after gain the focus of the evil was at father marquette's old mission of Makilamakinac. first year after year came a riotous invasion of coureur de bois and then a garrison followed to crown the mischief discipline was very weak at these advanced posts and to eke out their pay the soldiers were allowed to trade brandy whether permitted or interdicted being the chief article of barter father etienne carheel was driven almost to despair and he wrote to the intendant his fast friend and former pupil the long letter already mentioned our missions he says are reduced to such extremity that we can no longer maintain them against the infinity of disorder brutality violence injustice impiety impurity insolent scorn and insult which the deplorable and infamous traffic in brandy has spread universally among the indians of these parts in the despair in which we are plunged nothing remains for us but to abandon them to the brandy sellers as a domain of drunkenness and debauchery he complains bitterly of the officers in command of the fort who he says far from repressing disorders encourage them by their example and are even worse than their subordinates insomuch that all our indian villages are so many taverns for drunkenness and sodoms for iniquity which we shall be forced to leave to the just wrath and vengeance of god he insists that the garrisons are entirely useless as they have only four occupations first to keep open liquor stores for crowds of drunken indians secondly to roam from place to place carrying goods and brandy under the orders of the commandant who shares their profits thirdly to gamble day and night fourthly to turn the fort into a place which i am ashamed to call by its right name and he describes with a curious amplitude of detail the swarms of indian girls who are hired to make it their resort such monsignor are the only employments of the soldiers maintained here so many years if this can be called doing the king's service 
i admit that such service is done for him here now and has always been done for him here but i never saw any other done in my life he further declares that the commandant suppose and malign the missionaries while of the presents which the king sends up the country for distribution to the indians they the indians get nothing but a little tobacco and the officer keeps the rest for himself from the misconduct of officers and soldiers he passes to that of the coureurs de bois and licensed traders and here he is equally severe he dilates on the evils which result from permitting the colonists to go to the indians instead of requiring the indians to come to the settlements it serves only to rob the country of all its young men weaken families deprive wives of their husbands sisters of their brothers and parents of their children expose the voyagers to a hundred dangers of body and soul involve them in a multitude of expenses some necessary some useless and some criminal accustom them to do no work and at last disgust them with it for ever make them live in constant idleness unfit them completely for any trade and render them useless to themselves their families and the public but it is less as regards the body than as regards the soul that this traffic of the french among the savages is infinitely hurtful it carries them far away from churches separates them from priests and nuns and severs them from all instruction all exercise of religion and all spiritual aid it sends them into places wild and almost inaccessible through a thousand perils by land and water to carry on by base abject and shameful means a trade which would much better be carried on at montreal but in the complete transfer of the trade to montreal he sees insuperable difficulties and he proceeds to suggest as the last and best resort that garrisons and officers should be withdrawn and licenses abolished that discreet and virtuous persons should be chosen to take charge of all the trade of the upper country that these persons should be in perfect sympathy and correspondence with the jesuits and that the trade should be carried on at the missions of the jesuits and in their presence this letter brings us again face to face with the brandy question of which we have seen something already in the quarrel between avogor and the bishop in the summer of sixteen forty eight there was held at the mission of sillery a temperance meeting the first in all probability on this continent the drum beat after mass and the indians gathered at the summons then an algonquin chief a zealous convert of the jesuits proclaimed to the crowd a late edict of the governor imposing penalties for drunkenness and in his own name and that of the other chiefs exhorted them to abstinence declaring that all drunkards should be handed over to the french for punishment father jerome lalemont looked on delighted it was he says the finest public act of jurisdiction exercised among the indians since i have been in this country from the beginning of the world they have all thought themselves as great lords the one as the other and never before submitted to their chiefs any further than they chose to do so there was great need of reform for a demon of drunkenness seemed to possess these unhappy tribes nevertheless with all their rage for brandy they sometimes showed in regard to it a self-control quite admirable in its way when at a fair a council or a friendly visit their entertainers regaled them with rations of the coveted liquor so prudently measured out that they could not be the worse for it they would unite their several portions in a common stock which they would then divide among a few of their number 
thus enabling them to attain that complete intoxication which in their view was the true end of all drinking the objects of this singular benevolence were expected to requite it in kind on some future occasion a drunken indian with weapons within reach was very dangerous and all prudent persons kept out of his way this greatly pleased him for seeing everybody run before him he fancied himself a great chief and howled and swung his tomahawk with redoubled fury if as often happened he maimed or murdered some wretch not nimble enough to escape his countrymen absolved him from all guilt and blamed only the brandy hence if an indian wished to take a safe revenge on some personal enemy he would pretend to be drunk and not only murders but other crimes were often committed by false claimants to the bacchanalian privilege in the eyes of the missionaries brandy was a fiend with all crimes and miseries in his train and in fact nothing earthly could better deserve the epithet infernal than an indian town in the height of a drunken debauch the orgies never ceased till the bottom of the barrel was reached then came repentance despair wailing and bitter invective against the white man the cause of all the woe in the name of the public good of humanity and above all religion the bishop and the jesuits denounced the fatal traffic the case was a strong one but so was the case of their opponents there was real and imminent danger that the thirsty savages if refused brandy by the french would seek it from the dutch and english of new york it was the most potent lure and the most killing bait wherever it was found thither the indians and their beaver skins were sure to go and the interests of the fur trade vital to the colony were bound up with it nor was this all for the merchants and the civil powers insisted that religion and the saving of souls were bound up with it no less since to repel the indians from the catholic french and to attract them to the heretic english was to turn them from ways of grace to ways of perdition the argument no doubt was dashed largely with hypocrisy in those who used it but it was one which the priests were greatly perplexed to answer in former days when canada was not yet transformed from a mission to a colony the jesuits entered with a high hand on the work of reform it fared hard with the culprit caught in the act of selling brandy to indians they led him after the sermon to the door of the church where kneeling on the pavement partially stripped and bearing in his hand the penitential torch he underwent a vigorous flagellation laid on by father le mercier himself after the fashion formerly practised in the case of refractory schoolboys bishop laval not only discharged against the offenders volleys of wholesale excommunication but he made of the offence a reserved case that is a case in which the power of granting absolution was reserved to himself alone this produced great commotion and a violent conflict between religious scruples and a passion for gain the bishops and the jesuits stood inflexible while their opponents added bitterness to the quarrel by charging them with permitting certain favoured persons to sell brandy unpunished and even covertly selling it themselves appeal was made to the king who with his jesuit confessor guardian of his conscience on one side and colbert guardian of his worldly interests on the other stood in some perplexity the case was referred to the fathers of the sorbonne and they after solemn discussion pronounced the selling of brandy to indians a mortal sin it was next referred to an assembly of the chief merchants and inhabitants of canada held under the eye of the governor intendant and council 
in the chateau st louis each was directed to state his views in writing the great majority were for unrestricted trade in brandy a few were for limited and guarded trade and two or three declared for prohibition decrees of prohibition were passed from time to time but they were unavailing they were revoked renewed and revoked again they were in fact worse than useless for their chief effect was to turn traders and coureurs de bois into troops of audacious contrabandists attempts were made to limit the brandy trade to the settlements and exclude it from the forest country where its regulation was impossible but these attempts like the others were of little avail it is worthy of notice that when brandy was forbidden everywhere else it was permitted in the trade of tadoussac carried on for the profit of government in spite of the sorbonne in spite of pere lachaise and of the archbishop of paris whom he also consulted the king was never at heart a prohibitionist his canadian revenue was drawn from the fur trade and the singular argument of the partisans of brandy that its attractions were needed to keep the indians from contact with heresy served admirably to solve his conscience bigot as he was he distrusted the bishop of quebec the great champion of the anti-liquor movement his own letters as well as those of his minister prove that he saw or thought that he saw motives for the crusade very different from those inscribed on its banners he wrote to saint valier laval's succession in the bishopric that the brandy trade was very useful to the kingdom of france that it should be regulated but not prevented that the consciences of his subjects must not be disturbed by denunciations of it as a sin and that it is well that you the bishop should take care that the zeal of the ecclesiastics is not excited by personal interests and passions perhaps he alludes to the spirit of encroachment and domination which he and his minister in secret instructions to their officers often impute to the bishop and the clergy or perhaps he may have in mind other accusations which had reached him from time to time during many years and of which the following from the pen of the most noted of canadian governors will serve as an example count frontenac declares that the jesuits greatly exaggerate the disorders caused by brandy and that they easily convince persons who do not know the interested motives which have led them to harp continually on this string for more than forty years they have long wished to have the fur trade entirely to themselves and to keep out of sight the trade which they have always carried on in the woods and which they are carrying on there now End of chapter twenty one Chapter twenty two of the Old Regime in Canada by Francis Parkman, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty two, sixteen sixty three to seventeen sixty three. Priests and People. When Laval and the Jesuits procured the recall of Mezy, they achieved a seeming triumph. Yet it was but a defeat in disguise while ordering home the obnoxious governor the king and colbert made a practical assertion of their power too strong to be resisted a vice-regal officer a governor an intendant and a regiment of soldiers were silent but convincing proofs that the mission days of canada were over and the dream of the theocracy dispelled for ever the ecclesiastics read the signs of the times, and for a while seemed to accept the situation. The king, on his part, in vindicating the civil power, had shown a studious regard to the sensibilities of the bishop and his allies. The lieutenant-general Tracy, a zealous devotee, and the intendant Talon, who had at least 
professed to be one, were not men to offend the clerical party needlessly. In the choice of Courcel, the governor, a little less caution had been shown. His chief business was to fight the Iroquois, for which he was well fitted, but he presently showed signs of a willingness to fight the Jesuits also. The colonists liked him for his lively and impulsive speech, but the priests were of a different mind, and so too was his colleague Talon, a prudent person who studied the amenities of life and knew how to pursue his ends with temper and moderation. On the subject of the clergy, he and the governor substantially agreed, but the ebullitions of the one and the smooth discretion of the other were mutually repugnant to both. Talon complained of his colleague's impetuosity, and Colbert directed him to use his best efforts to keep Courcel within bounds and prevent him from publicly finding fault with the bishop and the Jesuits. Next we find the minister writing to Courcel himself to soothe his ruffled temper, and enjoining him to act discreetly, because, said Colbert, as the colony grows, the king's authority will grow with it, and the authority of the priests will be brought back in time within lawful bounds. Meanwhile, Talon had been ordered to observe carefully the conduct of the bishop and the Jesuits, who, says the minister, have hitherto nominated governors for the king, and used every means to procure the recall of those chosen without their participation, filled offices with their adherents, and tolerated no secular priests except those of one mind with them. Talon, therefore, under the veil of irreverent courtesy, sharply watched them. They paid courtesy with courtesy, and the intendant wrote home to his master that he saw nothing amiss in them. He quickly changed his mind. I should have had less trouble and more praise, he writes in the next year, if I had been willing to leave the power of the church where I found it. It is easy, he says again, to incur the ill-will of the Jesuits if one does not accept all their opinions and abandon one's self to their direction even in temporal matters, for their encroachments extend to affairs of police which concern only the civil magistrate, and he recommends that one or two of them be sent home as disturbers of the peace. They, on their part, changed attitude towards both him and the governor. One of them, Father Bardi, less discreet than the rest, is said to have preached a sermon against them at Quebec, in which he likened them to a pair of toadstools springing up in a night, adding that a good remedy would soon be found, and that Courcel would have to run home like other governors before him. Tracy escaped clerical attacks. He was extremely careful not to provoke them, and one of his first acts was to restore to the council the bishop's adherents, whom Mézy had expelled, and if on the one hand he was too pious to quarrel with the bishop, so, on the other, the bishop was too prudent to invite collision with a man of his rank and influence. After all, the dispute between the civil and ecclesiastical powers was not fundamental. Each had need of the other. Both rested on authority, and they differed only as to the boundary lines of their respective shares in it. Yet the dispute of boundaries was a serious one, and it remained a source of bitterness for many years. The king, though rigidly Catholic, was not yet sunk in the slough of bigotry to which Maintenon and the Jesuits succeeded at last in plunging him. He had conceived a distrust of Laval, and his jealousy of his royal authority disposed him to listen to the anti-clerical counsels of his minister. How needful they both thought it to prune the exuberant growth of clerical power, and how cautiously they set themselves to do so. Their letters attest again and again. The bishop, writes Colbert, 
assumes a domination far beyond that of other bishops throughout the christian world and particularly in the kingdom of france it is the will of his majesty that you confine him and the jesuits within just bounds and let none of them overstep these bounds in any manner whatsoever consider this as a matter of the greatest importance and one to which you cannot give too much attention but the prudent minister elsewhere writes it is of the greatest consequence that the bishops and the jesuits do not perceive that the intendant blames their conduct it was to the same intendant that colbert wrote it is necessary to diminish as much as possible the excessive number of priests monks and nuns in canada yet in the very next year and on the advice of talon he himself sent four more to the colony his motive was plain he meant that they should serve as a counterpoise to the jesuits they were mendicant friars belonging to the branch of the franciscans known as the recollets and they were supposed to be free from the ambition for the aggrandizement of their order which was imputed and with reason to the jesuits whether the recollets were free from it or not no danger was to be feared from them for laval and the jesuits were sure to oppose them and they would need the support of the government too much to set themselves in opposition to it the more recollets we have says talon the better will the too firmly rooted authority of the others be balanced while louis the fourteenth tried to confine the priests to their ecclesiastical functions he was at the same time whether from religion policy or both combined very liberal to the canadian church of which indeed he was the mainstay in the yearly estimate of ordinary charges of the colony the church holds the most prominent place and the appropriations for religious purposes often exceed all the rest together thus in sixteen sixty seven out of a total of thirty six thousand three hundred and sixty francs twenty eight thousand are assigned to church uses the amount fluctuated but was always relatively large the canadian cures were paid in great part by the king who for many years gave eight thousand francs annually towards their support such was the poverty of the country that though in sixteen eighty five there were only twenty five cures each costing about five hundred francs a year the tithes utterly failed to meet the expense as late as seventeen hundred the intendant declared that canada without the king's help could not maintain more than eight or nine cures louis the fourteenth winced under these steady demands and reminded the bishop that more than four thousand cures in france lived on less than two hundred francs a year you say he wrote to the intendant that it is impossible for a canadian cure to live on five hundred francs then you must do the impossible to accomplish my intentions which are always that the cures should live on the tithes alone yet the head of the church still begged for money and the king still paid it we are in the midst of a costly war wrote the minister to the bishop yet in consequence of your urgency the gifts to ecclesiastics will be continued as before and they did continue more than half a century later the king was still making them and during the last years of the colony he gave twenty thousand francs annually to support canadian cures the maintenance of cures was but a part of his bounty he endowed the bishopric with the revenues of two french abbeys to which he afterwards added a third the vast tracts of land which laval had acquired were free from feudal burdens and emigrants were sent to them by the government in such numbers that in sixteen sixty seven the bishop's seigneury of beaupre and orleans contained more than a fourth of the entire population of canada he had emerged from his condition of apostolic poverty to find himself the richest landowner in the colony 
if by favours like these the king expected to lead the ecclesiastics into compliance with his wishes he was doomed to disappointment the system of movable cures by which the bishop like a military chief could compel each member of his clerical army to come and go at his bidding was from the first repugnant to louis the fourteenth on the other hand the bishop clung to it with his usual tenacity colbert denounced it as contrary to the laws of the kingdom his majesty has reason to believe he writes that the chief source of the difficulty which the bishop makes on this point is his wish to preserve a greater authority over the cures the inflexible prelate whose heart was bound up in the system he had established opposed evasion and delay to each expression of the royal will and even a royal edict failed to produce the desired effect in the height of the dispute laval went to court and on the ground of failing health asked for a successor in the bishopric the king readily granted his prayer the successor was appointed but when laval prepared to embark again for canada he was given to understand that he was to remain in france in vain he promised to make no trouble and it was not till after an absence of four years that he was permitted to return no longer as its chief to his beloved canadian church meanwhile saint valier the new bishop had raised a new tempest he attacked that organization of the seminary of quebec by which laval had endeavoured to unite the secular priests of canada into an attached and obedient family with the bishop at its head and the seminary as its home a plan of which the system of movable cures was an essential part the canadian priests devoted to laval met the innovations of saint valier with an opposition which seemed only to confirm his purpose laval old and worn with toil and asceticism was driven almost to despair the seminary of quebec was the cherished work of his life and to his thinking the citadel of the canadian church and now he beheld it battered and breached before his eyes his successor in fact was trying to place the church of canada on the footing of the church of france the conflict lasted for years with the rancour that marks the quarrels of non-combatants of both sexes he saint valier says one of his opponents has made himself contemptible to almost everybody and particularly odious to the priests born in canada for there is nothing between them and a mutual antipathy difficult to overcome he is described by the same writer as a person without reflection and judgment extreme in all things secret and artful passionate when opposed and a flatterer when he wishes to gain his point this amiable critic adds that saint valier believes a bishop to be inspired in virtue of his office with a wisdom that needs no human aid and that whatever thought comes to him in prayer is a divine inspiration to be carried into effect at all costs and in spite of all opposition the new bishop notwithstanding the tempest he had raised did not fully accomplish that establishment of the cures in their respective parishes which the king and the minister so much desired the canadian cure was more a missionary than a parish priest's and nature as well as bishop laval threw difficulties in the way of settling him quietly over his charge on the lower st lawrence where it widens to an estuary six leagues across a ship from france the last of the season holds her way for quebec laden with stores and clothing household utensils goods for indian trade the newest court fashions wine brandy tobacco and the king's orders from versailles swelling her patched and dingy sails 
she glides through the wilderness and the solitude where there is nothing but her to remind you of the great troubled world behind and the little troubled world before on the far edge of the ocean-like river clouds and mountains mingle in dim confusion fresh gusts from the north dash waves against the ledges sweep through the quivering spires of stiff and stunted fir trees and ruffle the feathers of the crow perched on the dead bough after his feast of mussels among the seaweed you are not so solitary as you think a small birch canoe rounds the point of rocks and it bears two men one in an old black cassock and the other in a buckskin coat both working hard at the paddle to keep their slender craft off the shingle and the breakers the man in the cassock is father morel aged forty-eight the oldest country cure in canada most of his brethren being in the vigour of youth as they had need to be his parochial charge embraces a string of incipient parishes extending along the south shore from rivière du loup to rivière du a distance reckoned at twenty-seven leagues and his parishioners number in all three hundred and twenty-eight souls he has administered spiritual consolation to the one inhabitant of camarasca visited the eight families of la boutelière and the five families of la combe and now he is on his way to the seigneury of st denis with its two houses and eleven souls the farther lands where a shattered eel-pot high and dry on the pebbles betrays the neighbourhood of man his servant shoulders his portable chapel and follows him through the belt of firs and the taller woods beyond till the sunlight of a desolate clearing shines upon them charred trunks and limbs encumber the ground dead trees branchless barkless pierced by the woodpeckers in part black with fire in part bleached by sun and frost tower ghastly and weird above the labyrinth of forest ruins through which the priest and his follower wind their way the catbird mewing and the blue jay screaming as they pass now the goldenrod and the aster harbingers of autumn fringe with purple and yellow the edge of the older clearing where wheat and maize the settler's meagre harvest are growing among the stumps wild-looking women with sunburnt faces and neglected hair run from their work to meet the cure a man or two follow with soberer steps and less exuberant zeal while half savage children the courier de bois of the future bareheaded barefooted and half clad come to wonder and stare to set up his altar in a room of the rugged log cabin say mass hear confessions impose penance grant absolution repeat the office of the dead over a grave made weeks before baptize perhaps the last infant marry possibly some pair who may or may not have waited for his coming catechize as well as time and circumstance would allow the shy but turbulent brood of some former wedlock such was the work of the pariah priest in the remoter districts it was seldom that his charge was quite so scattered and so far extended as that of father morel but there were fifteen or twenty others whose labour were like in kind and in some cases no less arduous all summer they paddled their canoes from settlement to settlement and in winter they toiled on snowshoes over the drifts while the servant carried the portable chapel on his back or dragged it on a sledge once at least in the year the cure paid his visit to quebec where under the maternal roof of the seminary he made his retreat of meditation and prayer and then returned to his work he rarely had a house of his own but boarded in that of the seigneur or one of the habitants 
many parishes or aggregations of parishes had no other church than a room fitted up for the purpose in the house of some pious settler in the larger settlements there were churches and chapels of wood thatched with straw often ruinous poor to the last degree without ornaments and sometimes without the sacred vessels necessary for the service in sixteen eighty three there were but seven stone churches in all the colony the population was so thin and scattered that many of the settlers heard mass only three or four times a year and some of them not so often the sick frequently died without absolution and infants without baptism the splendid self-devotion of the early jesuit missions has its record so too have the unseemly bickerings of bishops and governors but the patient toils of the missionary cure rest in the obscurity where the best of human virtues are buried from age to age what we find set down concerning him is that louis the fourteenth was unable to see why he should not live on two hundred francs a year as well as a village cure by the banks of the garonne the king did not know that his cassock and all his clothing cost him twice as much and lasted half as long that he must have a canoe and a man to paddle it and that when on his annual visit the seminary paid him five or six hundred francs partly in clothes partly in stores and partly in money the end of the year found him as poor as before except only in his conscience the canadian priests held the manners of the colony under a rule as rigid as that of the puritan churches of new england but with the difference that in canada a large part of the population was restive under their control while some of the civil authorities often with the governor at their head supported the opposition this was due partly to an excess of clerical severity and partly to the continued friction between the secular and ecclesiastical powers it sometimes happened however that a new governor arrived so pious that the clerical party felt that they could rely on him of these rare instances the principal is that of denonville who with a wife as pious as himself and a young daughter landed at quebec in 1685 on this bishop saint valier anxious to turn his good dispositions to the best account addressed to him a series of suggestions or rather directions for the guidance of his conduct with a view to the spiritual profit of those over whom he was appointed to rule the document was put on file and the following are some of the points in it it is divided into five different heads touching feasts touching balls and dances touching comedies and other declamations touching dress touching irreverence in church the governor and madame his wife are desired to accept no invitations to suppers that is to say late dinners as tending to nocturnal hours and dangerous pastimes and they are further enjoined to express dissatisfaction and refuse to come again should any entertainment offered to them be too sumptuous although continues the bishop under the second head of his address balls and dances are not sinful in their nature nevertheless they are so dangerous by reason of the circumstances that attend them and the evil results that almost inevitably follow that in the opinion of st francis of sales it should be said of them as physicians say of mushrooms that at best they are good for nothing and after enlarging on their perils he declares it to be of great importance to the glory of god and the sanctification of the colony that the governor and his wife neither give such entertainments nor countenance them by their presence nevertheless adds the mentor since the youth and vivacity of mademoiselle their daughter require some diversion 
it is permitted to relent somewhat and indulge her in a little moderate and proper dancing provided that it be solely with persons of her own sex and in the presence of madame her mother but by no means in the presence of men or youths since it is this mingling of sexes which causes the disorders that spring from balls and dances private theatricals in any form are next interdicted to the young lady the bishop then passes to the subject of her dress and exposes the abuses against which she is to be guarded the luxury of dress he says appears in the rich and dazzling fabrics wherein the women and girls of canada attire themselves and which are far beyond their condition and their means in the excess of ornaments which they put on in the extraordinary headdresses which they affect their heads being uncovered and full of strange trinkets and in the immodest curls so expressly forbidden in the epistles of st peter and st paul as well as by all the fathers and doctors of the church and which god has often severely punished as may be seen by the example of the unhappy pretextata a lady of high quality who as we learn from st jerome who knew her had her hands withered and died suddenly five months after and was precipitated into hell as god had threatened her by an angel because by order of her husband she had curled the hair of her niece and attired her after a worldly fashion whether the marquis and marchioness de nonville profited by so apt and terrible a warning or whether their patience and good nature survived the episcopal onslaught does not appear on record the subject of feminine apparel received great attention both from st valier and his predecessor each of whom issued a number of pastoral mandates concerning it their severest denunciation were aimed at low-necked dresses which they regarded as favourite devices of the enemy for the snaring of souls and they also used strong language against certain knots of ribbons called fontanges with which the bells of quebec adorned their heads laval launches strenuous invectives against the luxury and vanity of women and girls who forgetting the promises of their baptism decorate themselves with the pomp of satan whom they have so solemnly renounced and in their wish to please the eyes of men make themselves the instruments and the captives of the fiend in the journal of the superior of the jesuits we find under date of february the fourth sixteen sixty seven a record of the first ball in canada along with the pious wish god grant that nothing further come of it nevertheless more balls were not long in following and worse yet sundry comedies were enacted under no less distinguished patronage than that of frontenac the governor laval denounced them vigorously the jesuit dablon attacked them in a violent sermon and such excitement followed that the affair was brought before the royal council which declined to interfere this flurry however was nothing to the storm raised ten or twelve years later by other dramatic aggressions an account of which will appear in the sequel of this volume the morals of families were watched with unrelenting vigilance frontenac writes in a mood unusually temperate they the priests are full of virtue and piety and if their zeal were less vehement and more moderate they would perhaps succeed better in their efforts for the conversion of souls but they often use means so extraordinary and in france so unusual that they repel most people instead of persuading them i sometimes tell them my views frankly and as gently as i can as i know the murmurs that their conduct excites and often receive complaints of the constraint under which they place consciences 
this is above all the case with the ecclesiastics at montreal where there is a cure from franche comte who wants to establish a sort of inquisition worse than that of spain and all out of an excess of zeal it was this cure no doubt of whom la hontan complains that unsanctified young officer was quartered at montreal in the house of one of the inhabitants during a part of the winter i was hunting with the algonquins the rest of it i spent here very disagreeably one can neither go on a pleasure party nor play a game of cards nor visit the ladies without the cure knowing it and preaching about it publicly from his pulpit the priests excommunicate masqueraders and even go in search of them to pull off their masks and overwhelm them with abuse they watch more closely over the women and girls than their husbands and fathers they prohibit and burn all books but books of devotion i cannot think of this tyranny without cursing the indiscreet zeal of the cure of this town he came to the house where I lived, and finding some books on my table, presently pounced on the romance of Petronius, which I valued more than my life because it was not mutilated. He tore out almost all the leaves, so that if my host had not restrained me when I came in and saw the miserable wreck, I should have run after this rampant shepherd and torn out every hair of his beard. La Motte Cadillac, the founder of Detroit, seems to have had equal difficulty in keeping his temper. Neither men of honor nor men of parts are endured in Canada. Nobody can live here but simpletons and slaves of the ecclesiastical domination. The Count Frontenac would not have so many troublesome affairs on his hands if he had not abolished a jericho in the shape of a house built by messieurs of the seminary of montreal to shut up as they said girls who caused scandal if he had allowed them to take office and soldiers to go into houses at midnight and carry off women from their husbands and whip them till the blood flowed because they had been at a ball or worn a mask if he had said nothing against the cures who trent the rounds with the soldiers and compelled the women and girls to shut themselves up in their houses at nine o'clock of summer evening if he had forbidden the wearing of lace and made no objection to the refusal of the communion to women of quality because they wore a fontage if he had not opposed excommunications flung about without sense or reason if i say the count had been of this way of thinking he would have stood as a nonpareil and have been put very soon on the list of saints for saint-making is cheap in this country while the sulpicians were thus rigorous at montreal the bishop and his jesuit allies were scarcely less so at quebec there was little good will between them and the sulpicians and some of the sharpest charges against the followers of Loyola are brought by their brother priests at Montreal. The Sulpician Allais writes, The Jesuits hold such dominion over the people of this country that they go into the houses and see everything that passes there. They then tell what they have learned to each other at their meetings, and on this information they govern their policy. The Jesuit, Father Ragano, used to go every day down to the lower town where the merchants live to find out all that was going on in their families and he often made people get up from table to confess to him allay goes on to say that father chastelain also went continually to the lower town with the same object and that some of the inhabitants complained of him to courcelle the governor one day courcelle saw the jesuit who was old and somewhat infirm slowly walking by the chateau cane in hand on his usual errand on which he sent a sergeant after him to request that he would not go so often to the lower town as the people were annoyed by the frequency of his visits the father replied in wrath go and tell monsieur de courcelle that i have been there ever since he was governor 
and that i shall go there after he has ceased to be governor and he kept on his way as before courcel reported his answer to the superior le messiere and demanded to have him sent home as a punishment but the superior effected a compromise on the following thursday after mass in the cathedral he invited courcel into the sacristy where father chatelaine was awaiting them and here at le mercier's order the old priest begged pardon of the offended governor on his knees the jesuits derived great power from the confessional and if their accusers are to be believed they employed unusual means to make it effective cavalier de la salle says they will confess nobody till he tells his name and no servant till he tells the name of his master when a crime is confessed they insist on knowing the name of the accomplice as well as all the circumstances with the greatest particularity father chatelaine especially never fails to do this they enter as it were by force into the secrets of families and thus make themselves formidable for what cannot be done by a clever man devoted to his work who knows all the secrets of every family above all when he permits himself to tell them when it is for his interest to do so the association of women and girls known as the congregation of the holy family which was formed under jesuit auspices and which met every thursday with closed doors in the cathedral is said to have been very useful to the fathers in their social investigations the members are affirmed to have been under a vow to tell each other every good or evil deed they knew of every person of their acquaintance so that this pious gossip became a copious source of information to those in a position to draw upon it in talon's time the congregation of the holy family caused such commotion in quebec that he asked the council to appoint a commission to inquire into its proceedings he was touching dangerous ground the affair was presently hushed and the application cancelled on the register of the council the jesuits had long exercised solely the function of confessors in the colony and a number of curious anecdotes are on record showing the reluctance with which they admitted the secular priests and above all the recollets to share in it the recollets of whom a considerable number had arrived from time to time were on excellent terms with the civil powers and were popular with the colonists but with the bishop and the jesuits they were not in favour and one or two sharp collisions took place the bishop was naturally annoyed when while he was trying to persuade the king that a cure needed at least six hundred francs a year these mendicant friars came forward with an offer to serve the parishes for nothing nor was he it is likely better pleased when having asked the hospital nuns eight hundred francs annually for two masses a day in their chapel the recollets underbid him and offered to say the masses for three hundred they on their part complained bitterly of the bishop who they say would gladly have ordered them out of the colony but being unable to do this tried to shut them up in their convent and prevent them from officiating as priests among the people we have as little liberty says the recollet writer as if we were in a country of heretics he adds that the inhabitants ask earnestly for the ministration of the friars but that the bishop replies with invectives and calumnies against the order and that when the recollets absolve a penitent he often annuls the absolution in one respect this canadian church militant achieved a complete success heresy was scoured out of the colony when maintenon and her ghostly prompters overcame the better nature of the king and wrought on his bigotry and his vanity to launch him into the dragonades when violence and lust bore the crucifix into thousands of huguenot homes 
and the land reeked with nameless infamies when churches rang with te deums and the heart of france withered in anguish when in short this hideous triumph of the faith was won the royal tool of priestly ferocity sent orders that heresy should be treated in canada as it had been treated in france the orders were needless the pious denonville replies praise be god there is not a heretic here he adds that a few abjured last year and that he should be glad if the king would make them a present the jesuits he further says go every day on board the ships in the harbour to look after the new converts from france now and then at a later day a real or suspected jansenist found his way to canada and sometimes an esprit fort like la hontan came over with the troops but on the whole a community more free from positive heterodoxy perhaps never existed on earth this exemption cost no bloodshed what it did cost we may better judge hereafter if canada escaped the dragonades so also she escaped another infliction from which a neighbouring colony suffered deplorably her peace was never much troubled by witches they were held to exist it is true but they wrought no panic mother mary of the incarnation reports on one occasion the discovery of a magician in the person of a converted huguenot miller who being refused in marriage by a girl of quebec bewitched her and filled the house where she lived with demons which the bishop tried in vain to exorcise the miller was thrown into prison and the girl sent to the hotel dieu where not a demon dared enter the infernal crew took their revenge by creating a severe influenza among the citizens if there are no canadian names on the calendar of saints it is not because in byways and obscure places in canada had not virtues worthy of canonization not alone her male martyrs and female devotees whose merits have found a chronicle and a recognition not the fantastic devotion of madame d'alibou who lest she should not suffer enough took to herself a vicious and refractory servant-girl as an exercise of patience and not certainly the medieval pietism of jean lebert the venerated recluse of montreal there are others quite as worthy of honour whose names have died from memory it is difficult to conceive a self-abnegation more complete than that of the hospital nuns of quebec and montreal in the almost total absence of trained and skilled physicians the burden of the sick and wounded fell upon them of the two communities that of montreal was the most wretchedly destitute while that of quebec was exposed perhaps to greater dangers nearly every ship from france brought some form of infection and all infection found its way to the hotel dieu of quebec the nuns died but they never complained removed from the arena of ecclesiastical strife too busy for the morbidness of the cloister too much absorbed in practical benevolence to become the prey of illusions they and their sister community were models of that benign and tender charity of which the roman catholic church is so rich in examples nor should the ursulines and the nuns of the congregation be forgotten among those who in another field of labour have toiled patiently according to their light mademoiselle jean lebert belonged to one of these sisterhoods she was the favourite daughter of the chief merchant of montreal the same who with the help of his money got himself ennobled she seems to have been a girl of fine and sensitive nature ardent affectionate and extremely susceptible to religious impressions religion at last gained absolute sway over her 
nothing could appease her longings or content the demands of her excited conscience but an entire consecration of herself to heaven constituted as she was the resolution must have cost her an agony of mental conflict her story is a strange and as many will think a very sad one she renounced her suitors and wished to renounce her inheritance but her spiritual directors too far-sighted to permit such a sacrifice persuaded her to hold fast to her claims and content herself with what they called poverty of heart her mother died and her father left with a family of young children greatly needed her help but she refused to leave her chamber where she had immured herself here she remained ten years seeing nobody but her confessor and the girl who brought her food once only she emerged and this was when her brother lay dead in the adjacent room killed in a fight with the english she suddenly appeared before her astonished sisters stood for a moment in silent prayer by the body and then vanished without uttering a word such says her modern biographer was the sublimity of her virtue and the grandeur of her soul not content with this domestic seclusion she caused a cell to be made behind the altar in the newly built church of the congregation and here we will permit ourselves to cast a stolen glance at her through the narrow opening through which food was passed in to her her bed a pile of straw which she never moved lest it should become too soft was so placed that her head could touch the partition that alone separated it from the host on the altar here she lay wrapped in a garment of coarse grey serge worn tattered and unwashed an old blanket a stool a spinning wheel a belt and shirt of haircloth a scourge and a pair of shoes made by herself of the husks of indian corn appear to have formed the sum of her furniture and her wardrobe her employments were spinning and working embroidery for churches she remained in this voluntary prison about twenty years and the nun who brought her food testified that she never omitted a mortification or a prayer though commonly in a state of profound depression and what her biographer calls complete spiritual aridity when her mother died she had refused to see her and long after no prayer of her dying father could draw her from her cell in the person of this modest virgin writes her reverend eulogist we see with astonishment the love of god triumphant over earthly affection for parents and a complete victory of faith over reason and of grace over nature in seventeen eleven canada was threatened with an attack by the english and she gave the nuns of the congregation an image of the virgin on which she had written a prayer to protect their granary from the invaders other persons anxious for a similar protection sent her images to write upon but she declined the request one of the disappointed applicants then stole the inscribed image from the granary of the congregation intending to place it on his own when the danger drew near the english however did not come their fleet having suffered a ruinous shipwreck ascribed to the prayers of jean le bar it was writes the sulpician belmont the greatest miracle that ever happened since the days of moses nor was this the only miracle of which she was the occasion she herself declared that once when she had broken her spinning wheel an angel came and mended it for her angels also assisted in her embroidery no doubt says mother juchereau taking great pleasure in the society of this angelic creature in the church where she had secluded herself an image of the virgin continued after her death to heal the lame and cure the sick though she rarely permitted herself to speak 
yet some oracular utterance of the sainted recluse would now and then escape to the outer world one of these was to the effect that teaching poor girls to read unless they wanted to be nuns was robbing them of their time nor was she far wrong for in canada there was very little to read except formulas of devotion and lives of saints the dangerous innovation of a printing press had not invaded the colony and the first canadian newspaper dates from the british conquest all education was controlled by priests or nuns the ablest teachers in canada were the jesuits their college of quebec was three years older than harvard we hear at an early date of public disputations by the pupils after the pattern of those tournaments of barren logic which preceded the reign of inductive reason in europe and of which the archetype is to be found in the scholastic duels of the sorbonne the boys were sometimes permitted to act certain approved dramatic pieces of a religious character like the sage visionnaire on one occasion they were allowed to play the seed of corniel which though remarkable as a literary work contained nothing threatening to orthodoxy they were taught a little latin a little rhetoric and a little logic but against all that might rouse the faculties to independent action the canadian schools prudently closed their doors there was then no rival population of a different origin and a different faith to compel competition in the race of intelligence and knowledge the church stood sole mistress of the field under the old regime the real object of education in canada was a religious and in far less degree a political one the true purpose of the schools was first to make priests and secondly to make obedient servants of the church and the king all the rest was extraneous and of slight account in regard to this matter the king and the bishop were of one mind as i have been informed louis the fourteenth writes to laval of your continued care to hold the people in their duty towards god and towards me by the good education you give or cause to be given to the young i write this letter to express my satisfaction with conduct so salutary and to exhort you to persevere in it the bishop did not fail to persevere the school for boys attached to his seminary became the most important educational institution in canada it was regulated by thirty-four rules in honour of the thirty-four years which jesus lived on earth the qualities commended to the boys as those which they should labour diligently to acquire were humility obedience purity meekness modesty simplicity chastity charity and an ardent love of jesus and his holy mother here is a goodly roll of christian virtues what is chiefly noticeable in it is that truth is allowed no place that manly but unaccommodating virtue was not it seems thought important in forming the mind of youth humility and obedience lead the list for in unquestioning submission to the spiritual director lay the guarantee of all other merits we have seen already that besides this seminary for boys laval established another for educating the humbler colonists it was a sort of farm school though besides farming various mechanical trades were also taught in it it was well adapted to the wants of a great majority of canadians whose tendencies were anything but bookish but here as elsewhere the real object was religious it enabled the church to extend her influence over classes which the ordinary schools could not reach besides manual training the pupils were taught to read and write and for a time a certain number of them received some instruction in latin when in sixteen eighty six st valier visited the school he found in all thirty-one boys under the charge of two priests 
but the number was afterwards greatly reduced and the place served as it still serves chiefly as a retreat during vacations for the priests and pupils of the seminary of quebec a spot better suited for such a purpose cannot be conceived from the vast meadows of the parish of st joachim that here border the st lawrence there rises like an island a low flat hill hedged round with forests like the tonsured head of a monk it was here that laval planted his school across the meadows a mile or more distant towers the mountain promontory of cape torment you may climb its woody steeps and from the top waist deep in blueberry bushes survey from camorasca to quebec the grand canadian world outstretched below or mount the neighbouring heights of st anne where athwart the gaunt arms of ancient pines the river lies shimmering in summer haze the cottages of the habitants are strung like beads of a rosary along the meadows of beaupre the shores of orleans bask in warm light and far on the horizon the rock of quebec rests like a faint grey cloud or traverse the forest till the roar of the torrent guides you to the rocky solitude where it holds its savage revels high on the cliffs above young birch trees stand smiling in the morning sun while in the abyss beneath the snowy waters plunge from depth to depth and half way down the slender harebell hangs from its mossy nook quivering in the steady thunder of the cataract game on the river trout in lakes brooks and pools wild fruits and flowers on meadows and mountains a thousand resources of honest and wholesome recreation here wait the student emancipated from books but not parted for a moment from the pious influence that hangs about the old walls embosomed in the woods of st joachim around on plains and hills stand the dwellings of a peaceful peasantry as different from the restless population of the neighbouring states as the denizens of some norman or breton village above all do not fail to make your pilgrimage to the shrine of saint anne you may see her chapel four or five miles away nestled under the heights of the petit cap here when alibout was governor he began with his own hands the pious work and a habitant of beaupre louis guimont sorely afflicted with rheumatism came grinning with pain to lay three stones in the foundation in honour probably of saint anne saint joachim and their daughter the virgin instantly he was cured it was but the beginning of a long course of miracles continued more than two centuries and continuing still their fame spread far and wide the devotion to saint anne became a distinguishing feature of canadian catholicity till at the present day at least thirteen parishes bear her name but of all her shrines none can match the fame of saint anne du petit cap crowds flocked thither on the week of her festival and marvellous cures were wrought unceasingly as the sticks and crutches hanging on the walls and columns still attest sometimes the whole shore was covered with the wigwams of indian converts who had paddled their birch canoes from the farthest wilds of canada the more fervent among them would crawl on their knees from the shore to the altar and in our own day every summer a far greater concourse of pilgrims not in paint and feathers but in cloth and millinery and not in canoes but in steamboats bring their offerings to the vows of the bon saint anne to return to laval's industrial school judging from repeated complaints of governors and intendants of the dearth of skilled workmen the priests in charge of it were more successful in making good catholics than in making good masons carpenters blacksmiths and weavers and the number of pupils even if well trained was at no time sufficient to meet the wants of the colony 
for though the canadians showed an aptitude for mechanical trades they preferred above all things the savage liberty of the backwoods the education of girls was in the hands of the ursulines and the nuns of the congregation of whom the former besides careful instruction in religious duties taught their pupils all that a girl ought to know this meant exceedingly little besides the manual arts suited to their sex and in the case of the nuns of the congregation who taught girls of the poorer class it meant still less it was on nuns as well as on priests that the charge fell not only of spiritual and mental but also of industrial training thus we find the king giving to a sisterhood of montreal a thousand francs to buy wool and a thousand more for teaching girls to knit the king also maintained a teacher of navigation and surveying at quebec on the modest salary of four hundred francs during the eighteenth century some improvement is perceptible in the mental state of the population as it became more numerous and more stable it also became less ignorant and the canadian habitant towards the end of the french rule was probably better taught so far as concerned religion than the mass of french peasants yet secular instruction was still extremely meagre even in the noblesse in spite of this defective education says the famous navigator bougainville who knew the colony well in its last years the canadians are naturally intelligent they do not know how to write but they speak with ease and with an accent as good as the parisian he means of course the better class even the children of officers and gentlemen says another writer scarcely know how to read and write they are ignorant of the first elements of geography and history and evidence like this might be extended when france was heaving with the throes that prepared the revolution when new hopes new dreams new thoughts good and evil false and true tossed the troubled waters of french society canada caught something of its social corruption but not the faintest impulsion of its roused mental life the torrent surged on its way while in the deep nook beside it the sticks and dry leaves floated their usual round and the unruffled pool slept in the placidity of intellectual torpor end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the old regime in canada by francis parkman jr this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty three sixteen forty to seventeen sixty three morals and manners the mission period of canada or the period anterior to the year sixteen sixty three when the king took the colony in charge has a character of its own the whole population did not exceed that of a large french village its extreme poverty the constant danger that surrounded it and above all the contagious zeal of the missionaries saved it from many vices and inspired it with an extraordinary religious fervour without doubt an ideal picture has been drawn of this early epoch trade as well as propagandism was the business of the colony and the colonists were far from being all in a state of grace yet it is certain that zeal was higher devotion more constant and popular morals more pure than at any later period of the french rule the intervention of the king wrought a change the annual shipment of emigrants made by him were in the most favourable view of a very mixed character and the portion which mother mary calls canet was but too conspicuous along with them came a regiment of soldiers fresh from the license of camps and the excitements of turkish wars 
accustomed to obey their officers and to obey nothing else and more ready to wear the scapulary of the virgin in campaigns against the mohawks than to square their lives by the rules of christian ethics our good king writes sister morin of montreal has sent troops to defend us from the iroquois and the soldiers and officers have ruined the lord's vineyard and planted wickedness and sin and crime in our soil of canada few indeed among the officers followed the example of one of their number paul de Puy, who in his settlement of ile aux Ois, below quebec lived it is said like a saint and on sundays and fete days exhorted his servants and habitants with such unction that their eyes filled with tears nor let us hope were there many imitators of major la Frediere, who with a company of the regiment was sent to garrison montreal where he ruled with absolute sway over settlers and soldiers alike his countenance naturally repulsive was made more so by the loss of an eye yet he was irrepressible in gallantry and women and girls fled in terror from the military polyphemus the men too feared and hated him not without reason one morning a settler named demers was hoeing his field when he saw a sportsman gun in hand striding through his half-grown wheat steady there steady he shouted in a tone of remonstrance but the sportsman gave no heed why do you spoil a poor man's wheat cried the outraged cultivator if i knew who you were i would go and complain of you whom would you complain to demanded the sportsman who then proceeded to walk back into the middle of the wheat and called out to demers you are a rascal and i'll thrash you look at home for rascals retorted demers and keep your thrashing for your dogs the sportsman came towards him in a rage to execute his threat demers picked up his gun which after the custom of the time he had brought to the field with him and advancing to meet his adversary recognized la frediere the commandant on this he ran off la frediere sent soldiers to arrest him threw him into prison put him in irons and the next day mounted him on the wooden horse with a weight of sixty pounds tied to each foot he repeated the torture a day or two after and then let his victim go saying if i could have caught you when i was in your wheat i would have beaten you well the commandant next turned his quarters into a dram shop for indians to whom he sold brandy in large quantities but so diluted that his customers finding themselves partially defrauded of their right of intoxication complained grievously about this time the intendant talon made one of his domiciliary visits to montreal and when in his character of father of the people he inquired if they had any complaints to make every tongue was loud in accusation against la frediere talon caused full depositions to be made out from the statements of demers and other witnesses copies were deposited in the hands of the notary and it is from these that the above story is drawn the tyrant was removed and ordered home to france many other officers embarked in the profitable trade of selling brandy to indians and several garrison posts became centres of disorder others of the regiment became notorious brawlers a lieutenant of the garrison of montreal named carillon and an ensign named morel had for some reason conceived a violent grudge against another ensign named Lormeau. On Pentecost Day, just after Vespers, Lormeau was walking by the river with his wife. They had passed the common and the seminary wall, and were in front of the house of the younger Charles Le Moyne, when they saw Carillon coming towards them. He stopped before Lormeau, looked him full in the face, 
and exclaimed, Coward! Coward yourself, returned Lormo. Take yourself off. Carrion drew his sword, and Lormo followed his example. They exchanged a few passes, then closed and fell to the ground, grappled together. Lormeau's wig fell off, and Carrion, getting the uppermost, hammered his bare head with the hilt of his sword. Lormeau's wife, in a frenzy of terror, screamed murder. One of the neighbors, Monsieur Belletre, was at table with Charles Le Moyne and a Rochelle merchant named Baston. He ran out with his two guests, and they tried to separate the combatants, who still lay on the ground foaming like a pair of enraged bulldogs. All their efforts were useless. Very well, said Le Moyne in disgust. If you won't let go, then kill each other if you like. A former military servant of Carrion now ran up and began to brandish his sword in behalf of his late master. Carrion's comrade, Morel, also arrived, and regardless of the angry protest of Le Moyne, stabbed repeatedly at Lormeau as he lay. Lormeau had received two or three wounds in the hand and arm with which he parried the thrusts, and was besides severely mauled by the sword hilt of Carrion. When two Sulpician priests drawn by the noise appeared on the scene, one was Fremont, the curé, the other was Dolière de Casson, that Herculean father whose past soldier life had made him at home in a fray, and who cared nothing for drawn swords, set himself at once to restore peace, upon which, whether from the strength of his arm, or the mere effect of his presence, the two champions released their grip on each other's throats, rose, sheathed their weapons and left the field montreal a frontier town at the head of the colony was the natural resort of desperadoes offering as we have seen a singular contrast between the rigour of its clerical seigneurs and the riotous license of the lawless crew which infested it dolier de casson tells the story of an outlaw who broke prison ten or twelve times and whom no walls, locks, or fetters could hold. A few months ago, he says, he was caught again and put into the keeping of six or seven men, each with a good gun. They stacked their arms to play a game of cards, which their prisoner saw fit to interrupt to play a game of his own. He made a jump at the guns, took them under his arm like so many feathers, aimed at these fellows with one of them, swearing that he would kill the first who came near him, and so falling back step by step, at last bade them good-bye, and carried off all their guns. Since then he has not been caught, and is roaming the woods. Very likely he will become chief of our banditti, and make great trouble in the country when it pleases him to come back from the Dutch settlements whither they say he is gone, along with another rascal and a French woman so depraved that she is said to have given or sold two of her children to the Indians. When the governor, Labar, visited Montreal, he found there some two hundred reprobates gambling, drinking, and stealing. If hard-pressed by justice, they had only to cross the river and place themselves beyond the seigneurial jurisdiction. The military settlements of the Richelieu were in a condition somewhat similar, and Labar complains of a prevailing spirit of disobedience and lawlessness. The most orderly and thrifty part of Canada appears to have been at this time the coat of Beaupre, belonging to the seminary of Quebec. Here the settlers had religious instruction from their curés, and industrial instruction also if they wanted it. Domestic spinning and weaving were practised at Beaupré sooner than in any other part of the colony. When it is remembered that a population which in Labar's time did not exceed ten thousand, and which forty years later did not much exceed twice that number, 
was scattered along both sides of a great river for three hundred miles or more, that a large part of the population was in isolated groups of two, three, five, ten, or twenty houses at the edge of a savage wilderness, that between them there was little communication except by canoes, that the settlers were disbanded soldiers or others whose lives had been equally adverse to habits of reflection or self-control, that they rarely saw a priest, and that a government omnipotent in name had not arms long enough to reach them, we may listen without surprise to the lamentations of order-loving officials over the unruly condition of a great part of the colony. One accuses the seniors, whom he says being often of low extraction, cannot keep their vassals in order. Another dwells sorrowfully on the terrible dispersion of the settlements where the inhabitants live in a savage independence. But it is better that each should speak for himself, and among the rest let us hear the pious Denonville. This, Monsignor, seems to me the place for rendering you an account of the disorders which prevail, not only in the woods, but also in the settlements. They arise from the idleness of young persons, and the great liberty which fathers, mothers, and guardians have for a long time given them, or allowed them to assume, of going into the forest under pretense of hunting or trading. This has come to such a pass that from the moment a boy can carry a gun, the father cannot restrain him and dares not offend him. You can judge the mischief that follows. These disorders are always greatest in the families of those who are gentilhommes, or who, through laziness or vanity, pass themselves off as such. Having no resource but hunting, they must spend their lives in the woods, where they have no cures to trouble them, and no fathers or guardians to constrain them. I think, Monseigneur, that martial law would suit their case better than any judicial sentence. Monsieur de la Barre suppressed a certain order of knighthood which had sprung up here, but he did not abolish the usages belonging to it. It was thought a fine thing, and a good joke, to go about naked, and tricked out like Indians, not only on carnival days, but on all other days of feasting and debauchery. These practices tend to encourage the disposition of our young men to live like savages, frequent their company, and be forever unruly and lawless like them. I cannot tell you, Monsignor, how attractive this Indian life is to all our youth. It consists in doing nothing, caring for nothing, following every inclination, and getting out of the way of all correction. He goes on to say that the mission villages governed by the Jesuits and Sulpicians are models of good order, and that drunkards are never seen there except when they come from the neighboring French settlements but that the other Indians who roam at large about the colony do prodigious mischief, because the children of the seniors not only copy their way of life, but also run off with their women into the woods. Nothing, he continues, can be finer or better conceived than the regulations framed for the government of this country, but nothing, I assure you, is so ill-observed as regards both the fur trade and the general discipline of the colony. One great evil is the infinite number of drinking shops, which makes it almost impossible to remedy the disorders resulting from them. All the rascals and idlers of the country are attracted into this business of tavern-keeping. They never dream of tilling the soil, but on the contrary they deter the other inhabitants from it, and end with mining them. I know seigneuries where there are but twenty houses, and more than half of them dram shops. At Three Rivers there are twenty-five houses, and liquor may be had at eighteen or twenty of them. Ville-Marie, Montreal, and Quebec are on the same footing. The governor, 
next dwells on the necessity of finding occupation for children and youths a matter which he regards as of the last importance it is sad to see the ignorance of the population at a distance from the abodes of the cures who are put to the greatest trouble to remedy the evil by travelling from place to place through the parishes in their charge la barre champigny and duchesneau write in a similar vein bishop st valier in an epistolary journal which he printed of a tour through the colony made on his first arrival gives a favourable account of the disposition of the people especially as regards religion he afterwards changed his view an abstract made from his letters for the use of the king states that he represents like monsieur de nonville that the canadian youth are for the most part wholly demoralized the bishop was very sorry says a correspondent of the minister at quebec to have so much exaggerated in the letter he printed at paris the morality of the people here he preached a sermon on the sins of the inhabitants and issued a pastoral mandate in which he says before we knew our flock we thought that the english and the iroquois were the only wolves we had to fear but god having opened our eyes to the disorders of the stasis and made us feel more than ever the weight of our charge we are forced to confess that our most dangerous foes are drunkenness luxury impurity and slander drunkenness was at this time the most destructive vice in the colony one writer declares that most of the canadians drink so much brandy in the morning that they are unfit for work all day another says that a canoeman when he is tired will lift a keg of brandy to his lips and drink the raw liquor from the bunghole after which having spoiled his appetite he goes to bed supperless and that what with drink and hardship he is an old man at forty nevertheless the race did not deteriorate the prevalence of early marriages and the birth of numerous offspring before the vigour of the father had been wasted ensured the strength and hardihood which characterised the canadians as denonville describes them so they long remained the canadians are tall well made and well set on their legs bien plante sur lieux jambes robust vigorous and accustomed in time of need to live on little they have intelligence and vivacity but are wayward light-minded and inclined to debauchery as the population increased as the rage for bushranging began to abate and above all as the cures multiplied a change took place for the better more churches were built the charge of each priest was reduced within reasonable bounds and a greater proportion of the inhabitants remained on their farms they were better watched controlled and taught by the church the ecclesiastical power wherever it had a hold was exercised as we have seen with an undue rigour yet it was the chief guardian of good morals and the colony grew more orderly and more temperate as the church gathered more and more of its wild and wandering flock fairly within the fold in this however its success was but relative it is true that in seventeen fifteen a well-informed writer says that the people were perfectly instructed in religion but at that time the statement was only partially true during the seventeenth century and some time after its close canada swarmed with beggars a singular feature in a new country where a good farm could be had for the asking in countries intensely roman catholic begging is not regarded as an unmixed evil being supposed to promote two cardinal virtues charity in the giver and humility in the receiver the canadian officials nevertheless tried to restrain it vagabonds of both sexes were ordered to leave quebec 
and nobody was allowed to beg without a certificate of poverty from the curé or the local judge. These orders were not always observed. Bishop St. Valier writes that he is overwhelmed by beggars, and the intendant echoes his complaint. Almshouses were established at Montreal, Three Rivers, and Quebec and when st valier founded the general hospital its chief purpose was to serve not as a hospital in the ordinary sense of the word but as a house of refuge after the plan of the general hospital of paris appeal as usual was made to the king denonville asks his aid for two destitute families and says that many others need it louis the fourteenth did not fail to respond and from time to time he sent considerable sums for the relief of the canadian poor denonville says the principal reason of the poverty of this country is the idleness and bad conduct of most of the people the greater part of the women including all the demoiselles are very lazy mules proposes as a remedy that the king should establish a general workshop in the colony and pay the workman himself during the first five or six years the persons here he says who have wished to make a figure are nearly all so overwhelmed with debt that they may be considered as in the last necessity he adds that many of the people go half naked even in winter the merchants of this country says the intendant du chesneau are all plunged in poverty except five or six at the most it is the same with the artisans except a small number because the vanity of the women and the debauchery of the men consume all their gains as for such of the laboring class as apply themselves steadily to cultivating the soil they not only live very well but are incomparably better off than the better sort of peasants in france all the writers lament the extravagant habits of the people and even la hontan joins hands with the priests in wishing that the supply of ribbons laces brocades jewellery and the like might be cut off by act of law mother juchereau tells us that when the english invasion was impending the bells of canada were scared for a while into modesty in order to gain the favour of heaven but as may be imagined the effect was short and father latour declares that in his time all the fashions except rouge came over regularly in the annual ships the manners of the mission period on the other hand were extremely simple the old governor lauzon lived on peas and bacon like a laborer and kept no manservant he was regarded it is true as a miser and held in slight account magdalene boucher sister of the governor of three rivers brought her husband two hundred francs in money four sheets two tablecloths six napkins of linen and hemp a mattress a blanket two dishes six spoons and six tin plates a pot and a kettle a table and two benches a kneading trough a chest with lock and key a cow and a pair of hogs but the bouchures were a family of distinction and the bride's dowry answered to her station by another marriage contract at about the same time the parents of the bride being of humble degree bind themselves to present the bridegroom with a barrel of bacon deliverable on the arrival of the ships from france some curious traits of this early day appear in the license of jean boisdon as innkeeper he is required to establish himself on the great square of quebec close to the church so that the parishioners may conveniently warm and refresh themselves between the services but he is forbidden to entertain anybody during high mass sermon catechism or vespers matters soon changed jean boisdon lost his monopoly and inns sprang up on all hands they did not want for patrons 
and we find some of their proprietors mentioned as among the few thriving men in canada talon tried to regulate them and among other rules ordained that no innkeeper should furnish food or drink to any hired labourer whatever or to any person reading in the place where his inn was situated an innkeeper of montreal was fined for allowing the syndic of the town to dine under his roof one gets glimpses of the pristine state of quebec through the early police regulations each inhabitant was required to make a gutter along the middle of the street before his house and also to remove refuse and throw it into the river all dogs without exception were ordered home at nine o'clock on tuesdays and fridays there was a market in the public square whither the neighbouring inhabitants male and female brought their produce for sale as they still continued to do smoking in the street was forbidden as a precaution against fire householders were required to provide themselves with ladders and when the fire alarm was rung all able-bodied persons were obliged to run to the scene of danger with buckets or kettles full of water this did not prevent the lower town from burning to the ground in sixteen eighty two it was soon rebuilt but a repetition of the catastrophe seemed very likely this place says denonville is in a fearful state as regards fire for the houses are crowded together out of all reason and so surrounded with piles of cordwood that it is pitiful to see add to this the stores of hay for the cows kept by many of the inhabitants for the benefit of their swarming progeny the houses were at this time low compact buildings with gables of masonry as required by law but many had wooden fronts and all had roofs covered with cedar shingles the anxious governor begs that as the town has not a sou of revenue his majesty will be pleased to make it the gift of two hundred crowns worth of leather fire buckets six or seven years after certain citizens were authorized by the council to import from france at their own cost a pump after the dutch fashion for throwing water on houses in case of fire how a fire was managed at quebec appears from a letter of the engineer vasseur describing the burning of laval's seminary in seventeen o one vasseur was then at quebec directing the new fortifications on a monday in november all the pupils of the seminary and most of the priests went according to their weekly custom to recreate themselves at a house and garden at saint michel a short distance from town the few priests who remained went after dinner to say vespers at the church only one father petit was left in the seminary and he presently repaired to the great hall to rekindle a fire in the stove and warm the place against the return of his brethren his success surpassed his wishes a firebrand snapped out in his absence and set the pine floor in a blaze father boucher cure of point levy chanced to come in and was half choked by the smoke he cried fire the servants ran for water but the flames soon mastered them they screamed the alarm and the bells began to ring vasseur was dining with the intendant at his palace by the st charles when he heard a frightened voice crying out monsieur you are wanted you are wanted he sprang from table saw the smoke rolling in volumes from the top of the rock ran up the steep ascent reached the seminary and found an excited crowd making a prodigious outcry he shouted for carpenters four men came to him and he set them at work with such tools as they had to tear away planks and beams and prevent the fire from spreading to the adjacent parts of the building but when he went to find others to help them they ran off he set new men in their place and these too ran off the moment his back was turned a cry was raised that the building was to be blown up 
on which the crowd scattered for their lives. Basseur now gave up the seminary for lost, and thought only of cutting off the fire from the rear of the church, which was not far distant. In this he succeeded by tearing down an intervening wing or gallery. The walls of the burning building were of massive stone, and by seven o'clock the fire had spent itself. We hear nothing of the Dutch pump, nor does it appear that the soldiers of the garrison made any effort to keep order. Under cover of the confusion, property was stolen from the seminary to the amount of about two thousand livres, which is remarkable, considering the religious character of the building, and the supposed piety of the people. There were more than three hundred persons at the fire, says Vasseur, but thirty picked men would have been worth more than the whole of them. August, September, and October were the busy months at Quebec. Then the ships from France discharged their lading, the shops and warehouses of the lower town were filled with goods, and the habitants came to town to make their purchases. When the frosts began, the vessels sailed away. The harbour was deserted, the streets were silent again, and like ants or squirrels the people set at work to lay in their winter stores. Fathers of families packed their cellars with beets, carrots, potatoes, and cabbages, and at the end of autumn with meat, fowls, game, fish, and eels, all frozen to stony hardness. Most of the shops closed, and the long season of leisure and amusement began. New Year's Day brought visits and mutual gifts. Thence till Lent dinner parties were frequent, sometimes familiar and sometimes ceremonious. The governor's little court at the chateau was a standing example to all the aspiring spirits of Quebec, and forms and orders of precedence were in some houses punctiliously observed. There were dinners to the military and civic dignitaries and their wives, and others quite distinct to prominent citizens. The wives and daughters of the burghers of Quebec are said to have been superior in manners to women of the corresponding class in France. They have wit, says La Potherie, delicacy, good voices, and a great fondness for dancing. They are discreet, not much given to flirting, but when they undertake to catch a lover, it is not easy for him to escape the bands of Hymen. So much for the town. In the country parishes there was the same autumnal stowing away of frozen vegetables, meat, fish, and eels, and unfortunately the same surfeit of leisure through five months of the year. During the seventeenth century many of the people were so poor that women were forced to keep at home from sheer want of winter clothing. Nothing, however, could prevent their running from house to house to exchange gossip with the neighbours, who all knew each other, and having nothing else to do, discussed each other affairs with an industry which often bred bitter quarrels. At a later period, a more general introduction of family weaving and spinning served at once to furnish clothing and to promote domestic peace. The most important persons in a parish were the curé, the seigneur and the militia captain the seigneur had his bench of honour in the church immediately behind it was the bench of the militia captain whose duty it was to drill the able-bodied men of the neighbourhood direct road-making and other public works and serve as deputy to the intendant whose ordinances he was required to enforce next in honour came the local judge any there was, and the church wardens. The existence of slavery in Canada dates from the end of the 17th century. In 1688, the Attorney General made a visit to Paris and urged upon the King the expediency of importing Negroes from the West Indies as a remedy for the scarcity and dearness of labor. The King consented 
but advised caution on the ground that the rigor of the climate would make the venture a critical one a number of slaves were brought into the colony but the system never flourished the climate and other circumstances being hostile to it many of the colonists especially at detroit and other outlying posts owned slaves of a remote indian tribe the pawnees the fact is remarkable since it would be difficult to find another of the wild tribes of the continent capable of subjection to domestic servitude the pawnee slaves were captives taken in war and sold at low prices to the canadians their market value was much impaired by their propensity to run off it is curious to observe the views of the canadians taken at different times by different writers la hontan says they are vigorous enterprising and indefatigable and need nothing but education they are presumptuous and full of self-conceit regard themselves as above all the nations of the earth and unfortunately have not the veneration for their parents that they ought to have the women are generally pretty few of them are brunettes many of them are discreet and a good number are lazy they are fond to the last degree of dress and show and each tries to outdo the rest in the art of catching a husband fifty years later the intendant hocart writes the canadians are fond of distinctions and attentions plume themselves on their courage and are extremely sensitive to slights or the smallest corrections they are self-interested vindictive prone to drunkenness use a great deal of brandy and pass for not being at all truthful this portrait is true of many of them particularly the country people those of the towns are less vicious they are all attached to religion and criminals are rare they are volatile and think too well of themselves which prevents their succeeding as they might in farming and trade they have not the rude and rustic air of our french peasants if they are put on their honour and governed with justice they are tractable enough but their natural disposition is indocile the navigator bougainville in the last years of the french rule describes the canadian habitant as essentially superior to the french peasant and adds he is loud boastful mendacious obliging civil and honest indefatigable in hunting travelling and bush raising but lazy in tilling the soil the swedish botanist kalm an excellent observer was in canada a few years before bougainville and sketches from life the following traits of canadian manners the language is that of the old english translation the men here at montreal are extremely civil and take their hats off to every person indifferently whom they meet in the street the women in general are handsome they are well-bred and virtuous with an innocent and becoming freedom they dress out very fine on sundays and though on the other days they do not take much pains with the other parts of their dress yet they are very fond of adorning their heads the hair of which is always curled and powdered and ornamented with glittering bodkins and aigrettes they are not averse to taking part in all the business of housekeeping and i have with pleasure seen the daughters of the better sort of people and of the governor of montreal himself not too finely dressed and going into kitchens and cellars to look that everything be done as it ought what i have mentioned above of their dressing their heads too assiduously is the case with all the ladies throughout canada their hair is always curled even when they are at home in a dirty jacket and short coarse petticoat that does not reach to the middle of their legs on those days when they pay or receive visits they dress so gaily that one is almost induced to think their parents possess the greatest honours in the state they are no less attentive 
to have the newest fashions and they laugh at each other when they are not dressed to each other's fancy one of the first questions they propose to a stranger is whether he is married the next how he likes the ladies of the country and whether he thinks them handsomer than those of his own country and third whether he will take one home with him the behaviour of the ladies seemed to me somewhat too free at quebec and of a more becoming modesty at montreal those of quebec are not very industrious the young ladies especially those of a higher rank get up at seven and dress till nine drinking their coffee at the same time when they are dressed they place themselves near a window that opens into the street take up some needlework and sew a stitch now and then but turn their eyes into the street most of the time when a young fellow comes in whether they are acquainted with him or not they immediately lay aside their work sit down by him and begin to chat laugh joke and invent double entendre and this is reckoned being very witty in this manner they frequently pass the whole day leaving their mothers to do the business of the house they are likewise cheerful and content and nobody can say that they want either wit or charms their fault is that they think too well of themselves however the daughters of people of all ranks without exception go to market and carry home what they have bought the girls at montreal are very much displeased that those at quebec get husbands sooner than they the reason of this is that many young gentlemen who come over from france with the ships are captivated by the ladies at quebec and marry them but as these gentlemen seldom go up to montreal the girls there are not often so happy as those of the former place long before calm's visit the jesuit charlevoix a traveller and a man of the world wrote thus of quebec in a letter to the duchesse de les Deguires. there is a select little society here which wants nothing to make it agreeable in the salons of the wives of the governor and of the intendant one finds circles as brilliant as in other countries these circles were formed partly of the principal inhabitants but chiefly of military officers and government officials with their families charlevoix continues everybody does his part to make the time pass pleasantly with games and parties of pleasure drives and canoe excursions in summer sleighing and skating in winter there is a great deal of hunting and shooting for many canadian gentlemen are almost destitute of any other means of living at their ease the news of the day amounts to very little indeed as the country furnishes scarcely any while that from europe comes all at once science and the fine arts have their turn and conversation does not fail the canadians breathe from their birth an air of liberty which makes them very pleasant in the intercourse of life and our language is nowhere more purely spoken one finds here no rich persons whatever and this is a great pity for the canadians like to get the credit of their money and scarcely anybody amuses himself with hoarding it they say it is very different with our neighbours the english and one who knew the two colonies only by the way of living acting and speaking of the colonists would not hesitate to judge ours the more flourishing in new england and the other british colonies there reigns an opulence by which the people seem not to know how to profit while in new france poverty is hidden under an air of ease which appears entirely natural the english colonist keeps as much and spends as little as possible the french colonist enjoys what he has got and often makes a display of what he has not got the one labours for his heirs the other leaves them to get on as they can like himself i could push the comparison further 
but i must close here the king's ship is about to sail and the merchant vessels are getting ready to follow in three days perhaps not one will be left in the harbour and now we too will leave canada winter draws near and the first patch of snow lies gleaming on the distant mountains of cape torment the sun has set in chill autumnal beauty and the sharp spires of fir trees on the heights of sillery stand stiff and black against the pure cold amber of the fading west the ship sails in the morning and before the old towers of rochelle rise in sight there will be time to smoke many a pipe and ponder what we have seen on the banks of the st lawrence End of chapter 23chapter twenty four of the old regime in canada by francis parkman jr this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four sixteen sixty three to seventeen sixty three canadian absolutism not institutions alone but geographical position climate and many other conditions unite to form the educational influences that acting through successive generations shape the character of nations and communities it is easy to see the nature of the education past and present which wrought on the canadians and made them what they were an ignorant population sprung from a brave and active race but trained to subjection and dependence through centuries of feudal and monarchical despotism was planted in the wilderness by the hand of authority and told to grow and flourish artificial stimulants were applied but freedom was withheld perpetual intervention of government regulations restrictions encouragements sometimes more mischievous than restrictions a constant uncertainty what the authorities would do next the fate of each man resting less with himself than with another volition enfeebled self-reliance paralyzed the condition in short of a child held always under the rule of a father in the main well-meaning and kind sometimes generous sometimes neglectful often capricious and rarely very wise such were the influences under which canada grew up if she had prospered it would have been sheer miracle a man to be a man must feel that he holds his fate in some good measure in his own hands but this was not all against absolute authority there was a counter influence rudely and wildly antagonistic canada was at the very portal of the great interior wilderness the st lawrence and the lakes were the highway to that domain of savage freedom and thither the disfranchised half-starved seigneur and the discouraged habitant who could find no market for his produce naturally enough betook themselves their lesson of savagery was well learned and for many a year a boundless license and a stiff-handed authority battled for the control of canada nor to the last were church and state fairly masters of the field the french rule was drawing towards its close when the intendant complained that though twenty-eight companies of regular troops were quartered in the colony there were not soldiers enough to keep the people in order one cannot but remember that in a neighbouring colony far more populous perfect order prevailed with no other guardians than a few constables chosen by the people themselves whence arose this difference and other differences equally striking between the rival colonies it is easy to ascribe them to a difference of political and religious institutions but the explanation does not cover the ground the institutions of new england were utterly inapplicable to the population of new france 
and the attempt to apply them would have wrought nothing but mischief. There are no political panaceas, except in the imagination of political quacks. To each degree and each variety of public development there are corresponding institutions, best answering the public needs, and what is meat to one is poison to another. Freedom is for those who are fit for it. The rest will lose it or turn it to corruption. Church and state were right in exercising authority over a people which had not learned the first rudiments of self-government. Their fault was not that they exercised authority, but that they exercised too much of it, and instead of weaning the child to go alone, kept him in perpetual leading strings, making him, if possible, more and more dependent and less and less fit for freedom. In the building up of colonies, England succeeded and France failed. The cause lies chiefly in the vast advantage drawn by England from the historical training of her people in habits of reflection, forecast, industry, and self-reliance, a training which enabled them to adopt and maintain an invigorating system of self-rule, totally inapplicable to their rivals. The New England colonists were far less fugitives from oppression than voluntary exiles seeking the realization of an idea. They were neither peasants nor soldiers, but a substantial Puritan yeomanry, led by Puritan gentlemen and divines in thorough sympathy with them. They were neither sent out by the king, governed by him, nor helped by him. They grew up in utter neglect, and continued neglect was the only boon they asked till their increasing strength roused the jealousy of the crown, they were virtually independent, a republic, but by no means a democracy. They chose their governor and all their rulers from among themselves, made their own government and paid for it, supported their own clergy, defended themselves, and educated themselves. Under the hard and repellent surface of New England society, lay the true foundations of a stable freedom. Conscience, reflection, faith, patience, and public spirit. The cement of common interests, hopes, and duties compacted the whole people like a rock of conglomerate, while the people of New France remained in a state of political segregation, like a basket of pebbles held together by the enclosure that surrounds them. It may be that the difference of historical antecedents would alone explain the difference of character between the rival colonies, but there are deeper causes, the influence of which went far to determine the antecedents themselves. The Germanic race, and especially the Anglo-Saxon branch of it, is peculiarly masculine, and therefore peculiarly fitted for self-government. It submits its action habitually to the guidance of reason, and has the judicial faculty of seeing both sides of a question. The French Celt is cast in a different mould. He sees the end distinctly, and reasons about it with an admirable clearness, but his own impulses and passions continually turn him away from it. Opposition excites him. He is impatient of delay, is impelled always to extremes, and does not readily sacrifice a present inclination to an ultimate good. He delights in abstractions and generalizations, cuts loose from unpleasing facts, and roams through an ocean of desires and theories. While New England prospered and Canada did not prosper, the French system had at least one great advantage. It favored military efficiency. The Canadian population sprang in great part from soldiers, and was to the last systematically reinforced by disbanded soldiers. Its chief occupation was a continual training for forest war. It had little or nothing to lose, and little to do but fight and range the woods. 
this was not all the canadian government was essentially military at its head was a soldier nobleman often an old and able commander and those beneath him caught his spirit and emulated his example in spite of its political nothingness in spite of poverty and hardship and in spite even of trade the upper stratum of canadian society was animated by the pride and fire of that gallant noblesse which held war as its only worthy calling and prized honour more than life as for the habitant the forest lake and river were his true school and here at least he was an apt scholar a skilful woodsman a bold and adroit canoe-man a willing fighter in time of need often serving without pay and receiving from government only his provisions and his canoe he was more than ready at any time for any hardy enterprise and in the forest warfare of skirmish and surprise there were few to match him an absolute government used him at will and experienced leaders guided his rugged valor to the best account the new england man was precisely the same material with that of which cromwell formed his invincible ironsides but he had very little forest experience his geographical position cut him off completely from the great wilderness of the interior the sea was his field of action without the aid of government and in spite of its restrictions he built up a prosperous commerce and enriched himself by distant fisheries neglected by the rivals before whose doors they lay he knew every ocean from greenland to cape horn and the whales of the north and the south had no more dangerous foe but he was too busy to fight without good cause and when he turned his hand to soldiering it was only to meet some pressing need of the hour the New England troops in the early wars were bands of raw fishermen and farmers, led by civilians decorated with military titles, and subject to the slow and uncertain actions of legislative bodies. The officers had not learned to command, nor the men to obey. The remarkable exploit of the capture of Louisbourg the strongest fortress in america was the result of mere audacity and hardihood backed by the rarest good luck one great fact stands out conspicuous in canadian history the church of rome more even than the royal power she shaped the character and the destinies of the colony she was its nurse and almost its mother and wayward and headstrong as it was it never broke the ties of faith that held it to her it was these ties which in the absence of political franchises formed under the old regime the only vital coherence in the population the royal government was transient the church was permanent the english conquest shattered the whole apparatus of civil administration at a blow but it left her untouched governors intendants councils and commandants all were gone the principal seigneurs fled the colony and a people who had never learned to control themselves or help themselves were suddenly left to their own devices confusion if not anarchy would have followed but for the parish priests who in a character of double paternity half spiritual and half temporal became more than ever the guardians of order through canada the english conquest was the grand crisis of canadian history it was the beginning of a new life with england came protestantism and the canadian church grew purer and better in the presence of an adverse faith material growth an increased mental activity an education real though fenced and guarded a warm and genuine patriotism all date from the peace of seventeen sixty three england imposed by the sword on reluctant canada the boon of rational and ordered liberty 
through centuries of striving she had advanced from stage to stage of progress deliberate and calm never breaking with her past but making each fresh gain the base of a new success enlarging popular liberties while bating nothing of that height and force of individual development which is the brain and heart of civilization and now through a hard-earned victory she taught the conquered colony to share the blessings she had won a happier calamity never befell a people than the conquest of canada by the british arms end of chapter twenty four end of the old regime in canada by francis parkman jr